The Knight, The Wizard Knight, Book One, by Jean Wolfe, DB six zero three zero one, copyright two thousand four by Jean Wolfe, read by Michael Scherer. This book contains four hundred thirty pages. Approximate reading time sixteen hours thirty minutes. This book contains markers allowing direct access to the cast of characters and chapters. Library of Congress Annotation An American boy wanders from a forest cabin and is transported to a magical realm where he finds himself in the body of a grown man. Renamed Abel of the High Heart, he undertakes a quest to obtain a dragon's special sword that will help him become a knight. 2004 From the Book Jacket a young man in his teens is transported from our world to a magical realm that contains seven levels of reality. Very quickly transformed by magic into a grown man of heroic proportions, he takes the name Abel and sets out on a quest to find the sword that has been promised to him, a sword he will get from a dragon, the one very special blade that will help him fulfill his life ambition to become a knight and a true hero. Inside, however, Abel remains a boy, and he must grow in every sense to survive the dangers and delights that lie ahead in encounters with giant elves, wizards, and dragons. His adventure will conclude next year in the second volume of The Wizard Knight, The Wizard. Gene Wolfe is one of the most widely praised masters of SF and fantasy. He is the winner of the World Fantasy Award for Life Achievement, the Nebula Award twice, the World Fantasy Award twice, the John W. Campbell Memorial Award, the British Fantasy Award, and France's Pre-Apollo. His popular successes include the four-volume classic The Book of the New Sun. With this new series, Wolfe not only surpasses all the most popular genre writers of the last three decades, he takes on the legends of the past century, in a work that will be favorably compared with the best of J.R.R. Tolkien, E.R. Edison, Mervyn Peake, and T.H. White. This is a book and a series for the ages from perhaps the greatest living writer in or outside the fantasy genre. About the author. Gene Wolfe lives with his wife Rosemary in Barrington, Illinois. Other books by Gene Wolfe. The Book of the Short Sun, On Blue's Waters, In Green's Jungles, Return to the Whorl. The Book of the New Sun. Shadow and Claw, comprising The Shadow of the Torturer and The Claw of the Conciliator, Sword and Citadel, comprising The Sword of the Lictor and The Citadel of the Autarch. The Book of the Long Sun, Litany of the Long Sun, comprising Nightside, The Long Sun, and Lake of the Long Sun, Epiphany of the Long Sun, comprising Calde of the Long Sun and Exodus from the Long Sun. Novels The Fifth Head of Cerberus, The Devil in a Forest, Peace, Free Live Free, The Earth of the New Sun, Latro in the Mist, comprising Soldier of the Mist and Soldier of Arit. There are Doors, Castle View, Pandora by Holly Hollander, Novellas, The Death of Dr. Island. Seven American Knights. Collections. Endangered Species. Stories from the Old Hotel. Castle of Days. The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories. Strange Travelers. Dedicated with the greatest respect to Eve Maynard, author of The Book of Knights. The Riders. Who treads those level lands of gold, the level fields of mist and air, and rolling mountains manifold and towers of twilight over there. No mortal foot upon them strays, no archer in the towers dwells, but feet too airy for our ways go up and down their hills and dells. The people out of old romance and people that have never been, and those that on the border dance between old history and between. Resounding fable as the king who held his court at Camelot. There Guinevere is wandering, and there the knight Sir Lancelot. 
And by yon precipice of white, as steep as Roncesvalles and more, within an inch of fancy's sight, Roland the peerless rides to war. And just the tip of Quixote's spear, the greatest of them all by far, is surely visible from here. But no, it is the evening star. Lord Dunsany. Ben, look at this first. I have been reading through the first part of this letter, and there are an awful lot of names you will not know, so I have listed most of them here. If you come across one and wonder who that is or where it is, you can look here. You would be wasting your time to read this now. It is just to look the names up in. If a name is not here, I missed it, or I do not know either, or I knew you would know already. Here they are. Abel. This is the name I use here. It was also the name of Bold Berthold's brother. Elf. Fifth world people. They do not work much, protect trees and so forth, and see certain things differently. Elfris. The fifth world under Mythgarther. Augur. He was Martyr's Marshal, and I have known worse people. Alvit, one of the shield maidens who ride for the Valfather. Angerborn, the giants who got forced out of Sky. All of them are descended from a famous giantess named Anger, or say they are. Arnthor, the king of Celadon. His picture was on the money. Desiree gave me a message for him. Ottil. One of Thunrolf's servants. Oud, Thunrolf's steward. Baki, a fire elf girl I met at the Tower of Glass. She and Uri said they were my slaves. Baldig, one of the peasants who used to live in Griffinsford. Battlemaid, Ravd's sword. Swords get names like ships. Battlewitch. Garveon's sword. Beaw, one of Garveon's men at arms. He was a good guy, too. Beal, the Baron Arnthor sent to Jotunland. Ben, my brother back in America, who I still miss. Did you read this, Ben? Blackmane, Ravd's charger. Bluestone Castle, Indigan's Castle. Some Austerling pirates wrecked it. Bluestone Island, a high rocky island about a quarter of a mile from the mainland. Bodachon, Earth Elf. They are one of the small clans. Bold Berthold, the peasant from Griffinsford who let me cook my grouse and live with him in his hut. We said we were brothers, and he believed it. Briga. A peasant woman who lived in Glenadam. Bimer, the first Angerborn I ever saw. Casper, the head warder at Shearwall Castle. Celadon, a big country, longer than it is wide, on the west coast of the mainland. Erringsmouth, Forseti, and Kingsdoom are all towns in Celadon. Collins, my old English teacher. Crawl, Beale's Herald. Desira, Seeksneet's Wife. Desiree, the Queen of the Moss Elf. Dollop and Scallop, the inn where we stayed in Forseti. Duns, Un's older brother. East Hall, Wadet's Manor. Eagle, one of the outlaws. Eager, one of Beale's upper servants. Eterni, the mother of swords. Finefield, Garveon's manor. Fire Elf, the clan Cedar took over completely. Forseti, Martyr's Town, a seaport. Free Companies, Outlaw Gangs, this was the polite name. Frost Giants, the Angerborn, especially the Raiders. Garseg, the name Cedar was using when I met him. Garveon, Beale's best knight. 
Gaynor, Arnthor's wife, the queen of Celadon. Gerda, the girl bold Berthold was going to marry. Jerry, the girl you were dating when I lost America. Gilling, the king of the Angerborn. Glenadam, the village where Ulfa and Taug were born. Gorn, the innkeeper at the Dollop and Scallop. Grengarm, the dragon who had Eterni. Griffin, the little river running past Griffinsford and into the Uring. Griffinsford, a village the Angerborn wiped out. Gilf, my dog. The Valfather lost him, and I got to keep him until the Valfather wanted him back. Hymir. Gerda's son, by Hymir, it made him a mouse. Hel. The overkind woman in charge of death. Hela. Gerda's daughter, by Hymir, Hymir's sister. Hermod. One of Martyr's knights. Hob, one of Casper's warders. Hordsvin, the cook on the western trader. Hulta, a woman in Glenadam. Hymir, the angerborn who got Gerda. Hindel, Hymir's angerborn son. Idin, Beale's daughter, pretty small and next to beautiful. Her voice and big dark eyes were what you remembered. Indigan, a duke Osterlings killed, Bluestone Castle was his. Uring, a big river. Uring's mouth. In Diggin's town, where the Uring empties into the sea, Osterlings had burned a lot of it. Chair, the head of an outlaw gang. Jotunland, the Angerborn country north of the mountains. Kelpies, sea elf girls. Curl the first mate on the western trader. King's Doom, the capital of Celadon, a seaport. Cleos, the second world above sky. Kulili, the person responsible for the elf. Lady, the Valfather's youngest daughter, no one is supposed to use her name in ordinary talk, so we say the lady. Lud, one of Martyr's Knights. Lut, the smith who forged battle maid. Mag, bold Berthold's mother. Magnice, the charger martyr gave me. Mani, the big black tomcat who followed Gilf and me. Martyr, the duke of the northernmost duchy in Celadon. Michael, a man from Cleos. Mice, people who are half anger born and half human. Madguda, a serving woman in Shearwall. Moonrider, any knight the lady sends to Mythgarther. Morcane, a princess. Arnthor and Cedar are her brothers. Mori, a smith in Uringsmouth. Moss Elf, Desiree's clan. Moss Maidens, girls of the Moss Elf. Moss matrons, older women of the Moss Elf. Moss men, men of the Moss Elf. Mountain of Fire, a gate to Muspel. Mountains of the Mice, same as the Mountains of the North. Mountains of the North, the mountains between Celadon and Jotunland. Mountains of the Sun, the mountains between Celadon and Osterland. Muspel, the Sixth World, under Aelfris. Mythgarther, the fourth world where Celadon is. Needham, an island south of Celadon, I have never been there. Njors, a sailor on the western trader. Nukara, Un's mother. Nur, the second mate on the western trader. Niter, the night I beat in the tap of the dollop and scallop. Ober, Svan's father, he was a baron. Olaf, the baron who took over the mountain of fire while Thunrolf and I were in Muspel. Org, the ogre I got from Uns. Osar, Desira's baby. 
Osterland, the country east of the mountains of the sun. Osterlings, people who eat other people to become more human. Overkinds, the people of sky, the Valfather's people. Papounce, one of Beale's upper servants. Parka, a woman from Cleos. Falsung, Beale's grandfather, he was king of Celadon. Pauk Bad Eye, a sailor I got to help me. Potash, he taught chemistry and physics. Queen of the Wood, this means desiree. A lot of people are afraid to say her name because they think she might come. It never worked for me. Ravd, the best knight I ever saw. Redhall, Ravd's Manor. River Road, the main road inland from Uring's mouth. It runs along the north bank of the Uring. Room of Lost Love, a room that was like another world when you got inside. Sometimes dead people were alive again in there. Round Tower, the biggest castle at the Mountain of Fire. Sobble, a dead knight. Salamanders, the fire elf. Uri and Baki were salamanders. Scour, a nice fisherman in Uring's mouth. Shieldstar, one of the most important Angerborn. Seeksneet, a man in Glenadam who traded with the outlaws. Sigurd, Thunrolf's castle. Cetar, a dragon with a human father. Shearwall, martyr's castle. Shaw, a fishwife, but she was nice to me. Sky, the third world above Mythgarther. Skiena, a girl that lived in Griffinsford. Spario, my math teacher, she was pretty nice. Cert, Hordsvin's helper. Svan, Rovd's squire. Swert, Beale's valet. Swordbreaker, my mace, sort of like a steel bar. Theazi, Gilling's minister. Thopi, martyr's master at arms. Old Taug, Ulfa's father. Young Taug, Ulfa's brother, my age or a little older. Tung, a master of arms who taught Garveon. Old, a farmer who used to live in Griffinsford. Ulfa, the girl who made clothes for me in Glenadam. Uri, a friend of Baki's, sometimes they said sister. Uns, a handicapped peasant. Utgard, Gilling's castle, also the town around it. Valfather, the king of Sky. Vali, a man old man Taug got to help him kill me. Ve, Vali's little boy. Vidare, one of martyr's knights. Vala, Garveon's dead wife. Warway, the main road north from Celadon into Jotunland. Wieland, the man who forged Eterni. He was from Mythgarther, but he became king of the Fire Elf. Western Trader, the ship I took from Uringsmouth. Wiston, Garveon's squire. Wadet, the biggest knight at Shearwall. Wolfkill, a creek that emptied into the Griffin. White, a sailor on the Western Trader. Yens, a little port between Forseti and King's Doom. Yond, Wadet's squire. There they are, Ben. It has been easy for me to name them. What was hard was making you see them. Remember that the Osterlings had long teeth and starved faces, and the Angerborn stunk. Remember that Desiree was a shape-changer, and all her shapes were beautiful. Chapter 1 Dear Ben, You must have stopped wondering what happened to me a long time ago. I know it has been many years. I have the time to write here, 
and what looks like a good chance to get what I write to where you are, so I'm going to try. If I just told everything on a couple of sheets, you would not believe most of it, hardly any of it, because there are many things that I have trouble with myself. So what I am going to do instead is tell everything. When I have finished, you still may not believe me, but you will know all that I do. In some ways that is a lot, in others practically nothing. When I saw you sitting by our fire, my own brother, there on the battlefield. Never mind, I will get to it. Only I think it may be why I am writing now. Remember the day we drove out to the cabin? Then Jerry phoned. You had to go home and did not need a kid around. So we said there was no reason for me to go too. I could stay out there and you would come back the next day. We said I would fish. That was it. Only I did not. It did not seem like it was going to be much fun with you gone, but the air was crisp and the leaves were turning, so I went on a hike. Maybe it was a mistake. I went a long way, but I was not lost. Pretty soon I picked up a stick and hiked with it, but it was crooked and not very strong. I did not like it much and decided I would cut a good one I could keep out at the cabin and use whenever we were there. I saw a tree that was different from all the others. It was not very big, and it had white bark and shiny leaves. It was a spiny orange tree, Ben, but I had never heard of them. Later, Bold Berthold told me a lot. It was too big for me to cut the whole thing, but I found a branch that was almost straight. I cut off that and trimmed it and so forth. That may have been the main thing, my main mistake. They are not like other trees. The moss men care more about them. I had gone off the path when I saw the spiny orange, and when I got to it I saw it was right at the edge of the woods, and past it were the downs. Some hills were pretty steep, but they were beautiful, smooth, and covered with long grass. So I hiked out there with my new stick and climbed three or four hills. It was really nice. I found a little spring at the top of a hill. I had a drink and sat down. I was pretty tired by then, and carved the stick some, making who knows what, just whittling. After a while I lay down and looked at the clouds. Everybody has seen pictures and clouds, but I saw more that afternoon than I ever have before or since. An old man with a beard that the wind changed into a black dragon, a wonderful horse with a horn on its head, and a beautiful lady who smiled down at me. After that a flying castle, all spiky like a star, because there were towers and turrets coming out of all its sides. I kept telling myself it had to be a cloud, but it did not look like a cloud, Ben. It looked like stone. I got up and chased after it, waiting for the wind to blow it apart, but it never did. Night came. I could not see the castle any longer, and I knew I had to be a long way from our cabin. I started back across the downs, walking fast, but I got to walking down a slope that had no bottom. Somebody grabbed me in the dark, and somebody else caught my ankle when I slapped that hand away. Right then somebody said, Who comes to Aelfris? I still remember that, and for a long, long time after that, that was all I could remember. That and being grabbed by a lot of people. I woke up in a cave by the sea, where an old lady with too many teeth sat spinning, and when I had pulled myself together and found my stick, I asked where we were, trying to be as polite as I could. Can you tell me what place this is, ma'am, and how to get to Griffinsford from here? For some reason I thought Griffinsford was where we lived, Ben, and I still do not remember the real name. Maybe it really is Griffinsford. They are all mixed up. The old lady shook her head. Do you know how I got here? She laughed, and the wind and the sea were in it. She was the spray, and the waves that broke outside her cave. When I talked to her, I was talking to them. That was how I felt. Does it sound crazy? I had been crazy since I was born, and now I was sane, and it felt wonderful. The wind and the waves were sitting in that cave with me twisting thread, 
and nature was not something outside anymore. She was a big part of it, and I was a little part of it, and I had been gone too long. Later, Garseg said the sea had healed me. I went to the mouth of the cave and waited out until the water came up to my waist, but the only things I could see were cliffs hanging over her cave, deep blue water farther out, gulls and jagged black rocks like dragon's teeth. The old woman said, You must wait for the slack of the tide. I came back, sea wet to my armpits. Will it be long? Long enough. After that, I just leaned on my stick and watched her spin, trying to figure out what it was that she was turning into string, and why it made the noise as it did. Sometimes it seemed like there were faces in it and arms and legs coming out of it. You are able of the high heart. That got my attention, and I told her my old name. Up to then, she had never looked away from her spinning. What I say are right, do not you smite, she told me. I said I was sorry. Some loss must be, so this I decree. The lower your lady, the higher your love. She stopped spinning to smile at me. I knew she meant it to be friendly, but her teeth were terrible and looked as sharp as razors. She said, there must be a forfeit for insolence, and since that's how it usually is, that one shouldn't do much harm. That was how I got my name changed. She went back to spinning, but it looked like she was reading her thread. You shall sink before you rise, and rise before you sink. It scared me, and I asked if I could ask her a question. It had best be, since you ask one. What do you want to know, Abel of the High Heart? There was so much I could not get it out. I said, Who are you, instead? Parka. Are you a fortune teller? She smiled again. Some say so. How did I get here? She pointed with the distaff, the thing that held the stuff she was spinning, pointing toward the back of the cave, where it was all black. I don't remember being there, I told her. The recollection has been taken from you. As soon as she said it, I knew it was right. I could remember certain things. I could remember you and the cabin in the clouds, but all that had been a long time ago, and after it, there had been a lot I could not remember at all. The elf carried you to me. Who are the elf? I felt I ought to know. Don't you know, Abel of the High Heart? That was the last thing she said for a long while. I sat down to watch. But sometimes I looked at the back of the cave where she said I had come from. When I looked away from her, she got bigger and bigger, so I knew there was something huge behind me. When I turned and looked back at her again, she was not quite as big as I was. That was one thing. The other one was that I knew that when I was little, I had known all about the elf, and it was all mixed up with somebody else, a little girl who had played with me, and there had been big, big trees, and ferns a lot bigger than we were, and clear springs, and moss, lots of moss, soft green moss like velvet. They have sent you with the tale of their wrongs, Parka said, and their worship. Worship? I was not sure what she meant. Of you. That brought back other things. Not things, really, but feelings. I said, I don't like them, and it was the truth. Plant one seed, she told me. For a long time I waited for her to say something else, waiting because I did not want to ask her questions. She never did. So I said, aren't you going to tell me all those things, the wrongs and the rest of it? No. I let out my breath. I had been afraid of what I might hear. That's good. It is. Some gain there must be, so this I decree. Each time you gain your heart's desire, your heart shall reach for something higher. 
I had the feeling then that if I asked more questions, I was not going to like the answers. The sun stretched out his hands into our cave and blessed us both. Or that was the way it seemed. Then he sank into the sea, and the sea tried to follow him. Pretty soon the place where I had stood when I had waded out was hardly wet at all. Is this the slack of the tide? I asked Parka. Wait, she said, and bit her spinning through, wound a piece of it from her bobbin onto her hand, bit it off, and gave it to me, saying, For your bow. I don't have a bow. She pointed to my stick, Ben, and I saw it was trying to turn into a bow. There was a bend at the middle, except for that it was completely straight, and because I had whittled on the big end, both ends were smaller than the middle. I thanked her and ran out onto what had turned into a rough beach under the cliff. When I waved goodbye, it seemed like the whole cave was full of white birds, flying and fluttering. She waved back. She looked very small then, like the flame of a candle. South of the cave I found a steep path to the top of the cliffs. At the top there were ruined walls and the stump of a tower. The stars were out by the time I got there, and it was cold. I hunted around for a sheltered spot and found one. After that I climbed what was left of the tower. The tower had stood on a rocky island connected to the mainland by a spit of sand and rocks, so low it was nearly under the water even at low tide. I must have stared at the waves breaking over it in the starlight for five minutes before I felt sure it was there. It was, and I knew I ought to get off the island while I still could, and find a place to sleep on shore. I knew it, but I did not do it. For one thing, I was tired already. Not hungry and not particularly thirsty, but so tired that all I really wanted was to lie down somewhere. The other was that I was afraid of what I might find on shore, and what might find me. Besides, I needed to think. There was so much I could not remember, and what I could remember, you, Ben, and the cabin, and the house where we lived, and those pictures you have of Mom and Dad, was a long, long time ago. I wanted to try to remember more, and I wanted to think about what Parka had said and what it might mean. So I went back to the sheltered place I had found among the blue stones, and lay down. I was barefoot, and it seemed to me while I lay there that I should have had hiking boots and stockings. I could not remember what had become of them. I was wearing a grey wool shirt without buttons and grey wool pants with no pockets and that did not seem right either. I had a belt, and a little leather pouch hanging from it by its strings, but the only things in it were Parker's bowstring, three hard black seeds, and a little knife with a wooden handle and a wooden scabbard. The knife fit my hand like it belonged there, but I did not remember it at all. Chapter 2 The Ruined Town the sun woke me. I still remember how warm it felt, and how good it was to be warm like that, and away from the sound of other people's voices, and all the work and worry of other people's lives. The things the string kept telling me about. I must have lain in the sun for an hour before I got up. I was hungry and thirsty when I did. Rainwater, caught by a broken fountain, tasted wonderful. I drank and drank, and when I straightened up, there was a knight watching me, a tall, big-shouldered man in chain-mail. His helm kept me from seeing his face, but there was a black dragon on top of his helm that glared at me, and black dragons on his shield and surcoat. He began to fade as soon as I saw him, and in a couple of seconds the wind blew away what was left. It was a long time before I found out who he was, so I am not going to say anything about that here. But I do want to say something else, and it will go here as well as anywhere. That world is called Mythgarther. I did not learn it till later, but there is no reason you should not know it now. Parka's cave was not completely there, but between Mythgarther and Aelfris. Bluestone Island 
is entirely in Mythgarther, but before I drank the water, I was not. Or, to write down the exact truth, I was not securely there. That is why the night came when he did. He wanted to watch me drinking that water. Good Lord, I said, but there was no one to hear me. He had scared me, not because I thought I might be seeing things, but because I had thought I was alone. I kept looking behind me. It is no bad habit, Ben, but there was nobody there. On the east side of the island, the cliffs were not so steep. I found a few mussels and ate them raw. The sun was overhead when two fishermen came close enough to yell at. I did, and they rowed over. They wanted to know if I would help with the nets if they took me on board. I promised I would, and climbed over the gunwale. How'd you get out there alone? the old one wanted to know. I wanted to know that myself, and how come they talked funny. But I said, how would anybody get out there? And they seemed willing to leave it at that. They split their bread and cheese with me, and a fish we cooked over a fire in a box of sand. I did not know, but that was when I started loving the sea. At sunset, they offered me my choice of the fish we had caught for my help. I told the young one, not a lot older than me, that I would take it and share with his family if his wife would cook it, because I had no place to stay. That was okay, and when our catch had been sold, we carried the best fish and some others that had not sold into a crowded little house maybe twenty steps from the water. After dinner we told stories, and when it was my turn I said, I've never seen a ghost unless what I saw today was one. So I'll tell you about that, even if it won't scare anybody, like the ghost in Scour story, because it's all I've got. Everyone seemed agreeable. I think they had heard each other's stories more than once. Yesterday I found myself on a certain rocky island not far from here, where there used to be a tower. It was Duke and Diggins, said Scour, and his wife Shaw. Bluestone Castle. I spent the night in the garden, I continued, because I had something to do there, a seed I had to plant. You see, somebody important had told me to plant a seed, and I hadn't known what she meant until I found seeds in here. I showed them the pouch. You chopped down a spiny orange, Shaw's grandfather wheezed. He pointed to my bow. You cut a spiny orange, and you got to plant three seeds, young man. If you don't, the moss men'll get you. I said I had not known that. He spat in the fire. Folks don't, not now, and that's why there's not hardly no spiny oranges left. Best wood there is. You rub flax oil on it here. That'll protect it from the weather. He held out his hand for my bow, and I passed it to him. He gave it to Scour. You break her, son. Break her across your knee. Scour tried. He was strong and bent my bow nearly double, but it did not break. See? You can't. Can't be broke. Shaw's grandfather cackled as Scour returned my bow to me. There's not but one fruit on a spiny orange most times, and not but three seeds in it. You chop down the tree and you got to plant them in three places, else the moss men'll come for you. Go on, Abel, Shaw said. Tell us about the ghost. This morning I decided to plant the first seed in the garden of Bluestone Castle, I told them. There was a stone bowl there that held water, and I decided I would plant the seed first and scoop up water for it. When it seemed to me I had watered it enough, I would drink what was left. They nodded. I dug a little hole with my knife, dropped a seed into it, replaced the earth, which was pretty damp already, and carried water for the seed in my hands. When there was standing water in the hole, I drank and drank from the bowl, and when I looked up, I saw a knight standing there watching me. I couldn't see his face, but he had a big green shield with a dragon on it. That wasn't Duke and Diggin, Scow remarked. His badge was the blue boar. Did you speak to him? Shaw wanted to know. What did he say? I didn't. It happened so fast, and I was too surprised. He... 
He turned into a sort of cloud, then he disappeared altogether. Clouds are the breath of the lady, Shaw's grandfather remarked. I asked who that was, but he only shook his head and looked into the fire. Shaw said, Don't you know her name can't be spoken? In the morning I asked the way to Griffinsford, but Scour said there was no town of that name thereabout. Then what's the name of this one? I asked. A ring's mouth, said Scour. I think there's an Erring's Mouth near where I live, I told him. Really, I was not sure, but I thought it was something like that. It's a big city, though. The only really big city I've been to. Well, this is the only Erring's Mouth around here, Scour said. A passerby who heard us said, Griffin's Ferd is on the Griffin, and walked away before I could ask him anything. That's a stream that flows into our river. Scour told me. Go south till you come to the river, and take the river road and you'll find it. So I set out with a few bites of salt fish wrapped in a clean cloth, south along the little street behind the wattle house where Scour and Shaw lived, south some more on the big street it led to, and east on the high road by the river. It went through a gap without a gate in the wrecked city wall, and out into the countryside through woods of young trees where patches of snow were hanging on in the shadows, and square pools of rainwater waited for somebody to come back. After that, the road wound among hills, where two boys, older than I was, said they were going to rob me. One had a staff, and the other one an arrow ready. At the knock is how we say it here. The knock is the cut for the string. I said they could have anything I had except my bow. As I ought to have expected, they tried to take it. I held on and got hit with the staff. After that I fought, taking my bow away from them and beating them with it. Maybe I should have been afraid, but I was not. I was angry with them for thinking they could hit me without being hit back. The one with the staff dropped it and ran, and I beat the other until he fell down, then sat on his chest and told him I was going to cut his throat. He begged for mercy and when I let him up he ran too, leaving his bow and quiver behind. The bow looked nice, but when I bent it over my knee it snapped. I saved the string and slung the quiver on my back. That night I scraped away at my own bow until it needed nothing but a bath and flax oil, and put his string on it. After that I walked with an arrow at the knock myself. I saw rabbits and squirrels and even deer more than once, I shot, but all I did was lose a couple of arrows until the last day. That morning, so hungry I was weak, I shot a grouse and went looking for a fire. I had a long search and almost gave up on finding any that day, and ate it raw. But as evening came, I saw wisps of smoke above the treetops, white as specters against the sky. When the first stars were out, I found a hut half buried in wild violets. It was of sticks covered with hides, and its door was the skin of a deer. Since I could not knock on that, I coughed, and when coughing brought nobody, I knocked on the sticks of the frame. "'Who's there?' rang out in a way that sounded like the man who said it was ready to fight. "'A fat grouse,' I said. A fight was the last thing I wanted. The hide was drawn back, and a stooped and shaking man with a long beard looked out. His hand trembled. So did his head. But there was no tremor in his voice when he boomed, Who are you? Just a traveler who will share his bird for your fire, I said. Nothing here to steal, the bearded man said and held up a cudgel. I haven't come to rob you, only to roast my grouse. I shot and plucked it this morning, but I had no fire to cook it and I'm starved. Come in, then. He stepped out of the doorway. You can cook it if you'll save a piece for me. I'll give you more than that, I told him, and I was as good as my word. I gave him both wings and both thighs. He asked no more questions, but looked at me so closely, staring and turning away, that I told him my name and age, explained that I was a stranger in his state, and asked him how to get to Griffinsford. Ah, the curse of it! That was my village, Stripling, and sometimes I go there still to see it. 
but nobody lives in Griffinsford these days. I felt that could not be true. My brother and me do. The bearded man shook his trembling head. Nobody at all. Nobody's left. I knew then that the name of our town had not been Griffinsford. Perhaps it is Griffin, or Griffinsburg, or something like that. But I cannot remember. They looked up to me, the bearded man muttered. Some wanted to run, but I said no. Stay and fight, I said. If there's too many giants, we'll run, but we got to try their metal first. I had noticed the word giants and wondered what might come next. Shield Star was their leader. I had my father's tall house in those days. Not like this. A big house with a half loft under the high roof and little rooms behind the big one. A big stone fireplace, too, and a table big enough to feed my friends. I nodded, thinking of houses I had seen in Uringsmouth. Shield Star wasn't my friend. But he could have got into my house. Inside, he'd have had to stand like I do now. You fought them? Aye. For my house? My fields and Gerda? Aye. I fought, though half run when they saw them coming down the road. Killed one with my spear and two with my axe. They fall like trees, stripling. For a moment his eyes blazed. A stone. He fingered the side of his head and looked much older. Don't know who struck me or what it was. A stone? Don't know. Put your hand here, stripling. Feel under my hair. His hair was thick, dark, gray hair that was just about black. I felt and jerked my hand away. Tormented after. Water and fire. Know it? It's what they like best. Took us to a pond and built fires all around it. Drove us into the water like cattle. Threw brands at us till we drowned, all but me. What's your name, Stripling? I told him again. Abel. Abel. That was my brother's name. Years and years ago that was. I knew it was not my real name, but Parka had said to use it. I asked his name. Found a water rat's hole, he said. Duck and dig, come up to breathe, and the brands burnin' and hissin'. Lost count of the duckins and the burns, but didn't drown. Got my head up into the water rat's house and breathed in there. Waited till the anger born thought we was all dead and went away. I nodded, feeling like I had seen it. Tried to climb out, but my shadow slipped, fell back into the pond. Still there. The bearded man shook his head. Dreams, not dreams. In that pond still, and the brands whizzing at me, trying to climb out, slippery and, and fire in my face. If I slept here tonight, I suggested, I could wake you if you had a bad dream. Shield star, the bearded man muttered. Tall as a tree, shield star is, skin like snow. Eyes like a owl. Seen him pick up Baldig and rip his arms off. Could show you where. You really going to Griffin's fur table? Yes, I said. I'll go tomorrow if you'll tell me the way. Go too, the bearded man promised. Haven't been this year. Used to go all the time. Used to live there. That'll be great, I said. I'll have somebody to talk to, somebody who knows the way. My brother will have been mad at me, I'm pretty sure, but he'll be over that by now. No, no, the bearded man mumbled. No, no. Bold Bertholds never worried about you, brother. You're no bandit. That was how I started living with Bold Berthold. He was sort of crazy, and sometimes he fell down, but he was as brave as any man I have ever known, and there was not one mean bone in his body. I tried to take care of him and help him, and he tried to take care of me and teach me. I owed him a lot for years, Ben, but in the end I was able to pay him back, and that might have been the best thing I ever did. Sometimes I wonder 
if that was not why Parka told me I was able. All this was on the northern reaches of Celadon. I had to say that somewhere. Chapter 3 Spiny Orange Bold Berthold was ill the next day and begged me not to leave him, so I went hunting instead. I was not much of a hunter then, but more by luck than skill I put two arrows into a stag. Both shafts broke when the stag fell, but I salvaged the iron heads. That night, while we had a feast of roast venison, I brought up the elf, asking Bold Berthold whether he had heard of Aelfris, and whether he knew anything about the people who lived there. He nodded. Aye. I mean the real Aelfris. He said nothing. In Uring's mouth, a woman told a story about a girl who was supposed to get married to an elf king, and she cheated him out of her bed. But it was just a story. Nobody thought it was real. Come here betimes. Bold Berthold muttered. Do they? Real elf? Aye. But as high as the fire there. Like charcoal most are, like soot. And dirty as soot too. All sooty sept teeth and tongue. Eyes yellow fire. They're real? He nodded. Seven worlds there be able. Didn't I never teach you? I waited. Mythgarther this is. Some just say land, but that's wrong. The land you walk on and the rivers you swim in, the sea. Only the sea's in between, seems like. The air you breathe. All Mythgarther in the middle. So three above and three under. Sky's next stop, or you can say sky. Both the same. Sky's where the high-flying birds go sometimes. Not little sparrows and robins or any of that sort. Hawks and eagles and the wild geese. I even seen big herons up there. I recalled the flying castle, and I said, Where the clouds are. Bold Berthold nodded. You've got it. Still want to go to Griffinsford. Feeling better with this good meat in me. Might be better yet in the morning, and I haven't gone over to look at the old place this year. Yes, I do. But what about Aelfris? I'll show you the pond where they threw fire at me in the old graves. I have questions about Sky, too, I told him. I have more questions than I can count. More than I got answers, most likely. Outside a wolf howled. I want to know about the Angerborn and the Austerlings. Some people I stayed with told me the Austerlings tore down Bluestone Castle. Old Berthold nodded. Likely enough. Where did the Angerborn come from? Icelands. He pointed north. Come with the frost and go with the snow. Do they come just to steal? Staring into the fire, he nodded again. Slaves, too. They didn't take us cause we'd fought. Going to kill us instead. Run instead of fight and they take you. Take the women and children. Took Gerda. About Sky. Sleep now, Bold Berthold told me. Going to travel, stripling. Got to get up with the sun. Just one more question, please. After that I'll go to sleep, I promise. He nodded. You must look up into the sky a lot. You said you'd seen eagles up there, and even herons. Sometimes. Have you ever seen a castle there, Bold Berthold? Slowly he shook his head. Because I did. I was lying in the grass, and looking up at the clouds, he caught me by the shoulders, just the way you do sometimes, and looked into my eyes. You saw it? Yes, honest I did. It didn't seem like it could be real, but I got up and ran after it, trying to keep it in sight, and it was real. A six-sided castle of white stone up above the clouds. You saw it. His hands were trembling worse than ever. I nodded. Up among the clouds and moving with them, driven by the same wind. It was white like they were, but the edges were hard and there were colored flags on the towers. The memory took me by the throat. 
It was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Next morning bold Berthold was up before me, and we had left his hide-covered hut far behind before the sun rose over the treetops. He could walk only slowly, leaning on his staff, but he lacked nothing in endurance, and seemed more inclined to talk while walking than he had been the night before. "'Wanted to know about the elf last night,' he said, and I nodded. "'Got to talking about Sky instead.' You must have thought I was cracked. I had reasons, though. It was all right, I told him, because I want to know about that, too. The almost invisible path we had been following had led us to a clearing. Old Berthold halted and pointed skyward with his staff. Birds go up there. You've seen them. I nodded. I see one now. They can't stay. If... One could perch on the castle wall, couldn't it? Don't talk about that. I could not tell whether he was angry or frightened. Not now, and maybe not never. All right, I won't, I promise. Don't want to lose you no more, he drew breath. Birds can't stay. You and me can't go at all. See it, though, understand? I nodded. He began to walk again, hurrying forward, his staff thumping the ground before him. Think a bird could, too? Eagle can see better than you. Ever see a eagle nest? Yes, there was one about five miles from our cabin. Top of a big tree? That's right, a tall pine. Eagle sitting there, sitting eggs, likely. Think it ever looks up, instead of down? I suppose it must. I was trotting behind him. Then it can go, if it's of a mind to. The else the same, one thick blue-veined finger pointed to the earth. They're down there where we can't see, only they can see us. You and me, hear us too, if we talk loud. They can come up if they want to, like birds. Only they can't stay. After that we walked on in silence for half an hour or so, I pursuing almost vanished memories. At last I said, What would happen if an elf tried to stay here? Die, Bold Berthold told me. That's what they say. They told you that? That they couldn't live up here? Aye. Later, when we stopped to drink from a brook, I said, I won't ask how they've been wronged. But do you know? He shrugged. Know what they say. That night we camped beside the griffin, cheered and refreshed by its purling waters. Bold Berthold had brought flint and steel, and I collected dry sticks for him and broke them into splinters so fine that the first shower of yellow sparks set them alight. If there wasn't no winter I could live so all my life, he said and might have been speaking for me. Flat on my back after our meal, I heard the distant hooting of an owl, and the soughing of the wind in the treetops, where the first green leaves had burst forth. You must understand that at that time I believed I would be home soon. I had been kidnapped, I thought, by the elf. They had freed me in some western state, or perhaps in a foreign country. In time, the memories of my captivity would return. Had I been wiser, I would have stayed in Ring's mouth, where I had made friends, and where there might well be a library with maps or an American consul. As it was, there might be some clue in Griffinsford, I was not yet convinced that was not the name of our town, and if there were none, there was nothing to keep me from returning to Ring's mouth. Half destroyed, Ring's mouth remained a seaport of sorts. Maybe I could board a ship to America there. What was there to keep me from doing it? Nothing and nobody, and a ship sounded good. Ooh, said the owl. Its voice, soft and dark as the spring night, conveyed apprehension as well as curiosity. I, too, sensed the footsteps by which someone or something made its way through the forest although one single drop of dew falling from a high limb would have made more noise than any of them. 
who comes. You would get married, and I would be in the way all the time until I was old enough to live on my own. The best plan might be for me to stay out at the cabin, or the first year anyway. It might be better still for me not to come home too quickly, home to the bungalow that had been mom and dad's, home to the cabin, where we had gone to hunt and fish before snow ended all that. Yet it was spring. Surely this was spring. The stag I had killed had dropped his antlers. The grass in the forlorn little garden of Bluestone Castle had been downy and short. What had become of winter? A lovely, pointed face, lit by great lustrous eyes like harvest moons, peered down into mine, then vanished. I sat up. There was no one there except bold Berthold, and he was fast asleep. The owl had fallen silent, but the night wind murmured secrets to the trees. Lying down again, I did my best to recall the face I had glimpsed. A green face? Surely, I thought. Surely it had looked green. The old trees had given way to young ones, bushes, and spindly alders when bold Berthold said, Here we are. There was no town, no town at all. Right here, he waved his staff. Right there is where the street run. Houses on this side, back to the water. On that other, back to the fields. This right here was Old's house, and across from it, Baldig's. He took me by the hand. Recollect Baldig? I do not remember what I said, and he was not listening anyway. Old had six fingers, and so did his daughter Skiena. Old Berthold released my shoulder. Pick up my stick for me, will you, Stripling? I'll show where we met him. It was some distance away, through bushes and saplings. At last he stopped to point. That was our house, yours and mine. Only it used to be Paws. Recollect him? No, you don't recollect her. Ma got took for you as ever weaned. Mag, her name was. Well, sleep there tonight. Sleep where the house stood. For the old time's sake. I had not the heart to tell him I was not really his brother. There, he led me north another hundred yards or so. Here's the spot where I first seen Shieldstar. I'd boys like you to shoot arrows and throw stones, but they run all of them. Some shot her through first, most just run soon as the anger born showed their faces. He had stayed and fought and fallen. Conscious of that, I said, I wouldn't have run. He thrust his big bearded face into mine. You'd have run, too. No. You'd have run, he repeated, and flourished his staff as if to strike me. I said, I won't fight you, but if you try to hit me with that, I'm going to take it away from you and break it. You wouldn't have? He was trying not to smile. Having convinced myself, I shook my head. Not if they had been as tall as that tree. He lowered his staff and leaned on it. Wasn't. After that first big limb, maybe. How you know you wouldn't run? You didn't, I said. Aren't we the same? Long before sundown, we had cleared a space to sleep in where the old house had stood and built a new fire on the old hearth. Old Berthold talked for hours about the family and about Griffinsford. I listened, mostly out of politeness at first. As the shadows lengthened, I became interested in spite of myself. There had been no school, no doctor, and no police. At long intervals, travelers had crossed the Griffin here, wading through cold mountain water that scarcely reached their knees. When the villagers were lucky, they had sold them food and lodging. When they had been unlucky, they had to fight them to protect their homes and herds. If the Angerborn had been giants, the Austerlings, who sometimes came in summer, had been devils, gorging on human flesh to restore the humanity they had lost. The elf had come like fog in all seasons and had vanished like smoke. Moss men and salamanders mostly, bold Berthold confided. 
or else little Vodachan. They'd help sometimes, find lost stock, and beg blood for it. He bared his arm. I'd stick a thorn in and give a drop or two. They ain't but mud, that kind. I nodded to show I understood, although I did not. You was here with me then, only you didn't talk so high. Pa raised me, and I raised you. You got to feeling like you was in the way, I'd say, cause of me running after Gerda, prettiest girl ever seen. And we had it all planned out. I did not have to ask what happened. You went off, and I thought you'd be back in a year or two when we got settled. Only you'd never come till now. How'd you like it where you was? I tried to recall, but all that I could think of was that the best times in my life had come when I had been able to get out under the sky, out on a boat or among trees. Nothing to say? Yes, I showed him the arrowheads I had saved. Since we'll have a few more hours of daylight, I'd like to fit new shafts to them. Old ones broke? I nodded. When the stag fell. I was thinking that if I could find more wood of the same kind as my bow, my new shafts wouldn't break. You'd cut one, or a couple arrows? I shook my head. I'd cut a limb or two, that's all. And if I could find one of last year's fruits, I'd plant the seeds. Laboriously he climbed to his feet. Show you one, and it ain't gone. He led me into the brush and, kneeling, felt through the grass until he discovered a small stump. Spiny orange, he said. You planted it for you went away. It was on my land, and I wouldn't let nobody cut it. Only somebody done. When I wasn't looking, I said nothing. Thought it might have put up shoots, he rose again with the help of his staff. They do, sometimes. I knelt took one of the two remaining seeds from my pouch and planted it near where the earlier stump had grown. When I rose again, his face was streaked with tears. Once more he led me away, then stopped to wave his staff at the wilderness of saplings and bushes that stretched before us. Here was my barley field. See the big tree way in back. Come on. Halfway there he pointed out a speck of shining green. There it is. Spiny orange don't drop its leaves like most do. Green all winter like a pine. Together we went to it, and it was a fine young tree about twenty-five feet high. I hugged him. It seems to me that I should say more about the spiny orange here, but the truth is that I know little. Many of the trees we have in America are found in Mythgarther too, oaks and pines and maples and so on, but the spiny orange is the only tree I know that grows in Aelfris, too. The sky of Aelfris is not really strange until you look closely at it and see the people in it and, sometimes, hear their voices on the wind. Time moves very slowly here, but we are not conscious of it. Only the trees and the people are strange at first sight. I think the spiny orange belongs here, not in Mythgarther and... Not in America. Chapter 4 Sir Ravd Lad, the knight called from the back of his tall grey, and again, Come here, lad, we would speak to you. His squire added, Well, do you no hurt? I approached warily. If I had learned one thing in my time in those woods with bold Berthold, it was to be chary of strangers. Besides, I recalled the knight of the dragon, who had vanished before my eyes. "'You know the forest hereabout, lad?' I nodded, giving more attention to his horse and arms than to what he said. "'We need a guide, a guide for the rest of this day and perhaps for tomorrow as well,' the knight was smiling. "'For your help we're prepared to pay a uh, sealed each day.' When I said nothing, he added, "'Show him the coins, Fawn.' From a burse at his belt, the squire extracted a broad silver piece. Behind him, the great, bared charger he led, stirred and stamped with impatience, snorting and blowing through its lips. "'We'll feed you, too,' the knight promised. 
or if you feed us with that big bow, we'll pay you for the food. I'll share without payment, I told him, if you'll share with me. Nobly spoken. But how can I know you won't send me off empty-handed at the end of the day with a cuff on the ear? Svan shut his fist around the seal. How do we know you won't lead us into an ambush, Alf? As for the cuff at sunset, the knight said, I can give you my word. As I do, though you've no reason to trust it. On the matter of payment, however, I can set your mind at rest right now. A big forefinger tapped Svan's fist. When Svan surrendered the coin, the knight tossed it to me. There's your pay for this day until sunset, nor will we take it from you. Will you guide us? I was looking at the coin, which bore the head of a stern young king on one side and a shield on the other. The shield displayed the image of a monster compounded of woman, horse, and fish. I asked the knight where he wanted me to take him. To the nearest village. What is it? Glenadam, I said. I had been there with bold Berthold. The knight glanced at Svan, who shook his head. Turning back to me, the knight asked, How many people? There had been nine houses, unmarried people living with their parents and old people living with their married children. At a guess, three adults for each house. I asked whether I should include children. If you wish, but no dogs. This, I think, may have been overheard by some Bodachon. Then I'll say fifty-three. That's counting Seeksneet's wife's new baby, but I don't know its name, or hers either. Good people? I had not thought so. I shook my head. Ah, the knight's smile held a grim joy. Take us to Glenadam, then, without delay. We can introduce ourselves on the road. I am Abel of the High Heart. Svan laughed. The knight touched the rim of his steel coif. I am robbed of Red Hall, Abel of the High Heart. My squire is Svan. Now let us go. If we get there today at all, I warned Ravd, it will be very late. The more reason to hurry. We camped that night beside a creek called Wolfkill, Svan and I putting up a red and gold tent of striped sailcloth for Ravd to sleep in. I built a fire, for I carried flint and steel now to start one, and we ate hard bread, salt meat, and onions. Your family may worry about you, Ravd said. Have you a wife? I shook my head and added that bold Berthold had said I was not old enough yet. Ravd nodded, his face serious. And what do you say? I thought of school, how I might want to go to college, if I ever got back home. A few more years, Svan sneered. Two rats to starve in the same hole. I hope not. Oh, really? How would you support a family? I grinned at him. She'll tell me how. That's how I'll know when I've found her. She will? Well, what if she can't? He looked to Ravd for support, but got none. I said, Then would she be worth marrying? Ravd chuckled. Svan leveled a forefinger at me. Some day I'll teach. You must learn yourself before the day for teaching comes, Ravd told him. Meanwhile, Abel here might teach us both, I think. Who is Berthold, Abel? My brother. That was what we told people, Ben, and I knew bold Berthold believed it. Older than yourself, since he advises you. I nodded. Yes, sir. Where are your father and mother? Our father died years ago, I told Ravd, and my mother left soon after I was born. It was true where you are and here as well. I'm sorry to hear it. Sisters? No, none, I said. Our father raised my brother, and my brother raised me. Svan laughed again. I was confused already, memories of home mingling with stories bold Berthold had told me of the family here that had been his and was supposed to be mine. It was all in the past, and although America is very far from here in the present, the past is only memories and records nobody reads, and records nobody can read. 
This place and that place are mixed together like the books in the school library. So many things on the wrong shelf that nobody knows what is right for it anymore. Ravd said, You and your brother don't live in Glenadam, from what you said. You'd know the name of Sikhsanit's wife, and the name of her new child, too, since there are only about fifty people in the village. What village do you live in? We don't live in any of them, I explained. We live by ourselves, and keep to ourselves mostly. Outlaws, Svan whispered. They may be. Rav's shoulders rose and fell by the thickness of a blade of grass. Would you guide me to your house if I asked you, Abel? It's bold Berthold's, not mine, sir. I was glaring at Svan. To your brother's, then. Would you take us there? Gladly. But it's no grand place, just a hut. It's not much bigger than your tent. I thought Svan was going to say something. He did not, so I said, I ought to become a bandit, like Svan says. Then we'd have a nice house with thick walls and doors and enough to eat. There are outlaws in this forest stable, Robd told me. They call themselves the Free Companies. Do they have those things? I suppose they do, sir. Have you seen them for yourself? I shook my head. When we met, Svan feared you would lead us into an ambush. Do you think the Free Companies might ambush us, in sober fact, with three to fight? Two to fight, I told him. Svan would run. I would not! You'll run from me before the Alhoots, I spat into the fire. From two lame cats and a girl you'd run like a rabbit. His hand went to his hilt. I knew I had to stop him before he drew. I jumped the fire and knocked him down. He let go of the hilt when he fell, and I drew his sword and threw it into the bushes. We fought on the ground, the way you and I did sometimes, he trying to get at his dagger while I tried to stop him. We got too close to the fire, and he broke loose. I thought he was going to draw it and stab me, but he jumped up and ran instead. I tried to clean myself off a little and told Ravd, You can have your sealed back if you want it. May. He had never stirred. May governs permissions, gifts, and things of that sort. You speak too well, Abel, to make such an elementary mistake. I nodded. I had not figured him out, and I was not sure I ever would. Sit down and keep my sealed. When Svan returns, I'll have him give you another for tomorrow. I thought you'd be mad at me. Robd shook his head. Svan must become a knight soon. His family expects it, and so does he. So do his grace and I, for that matter. Thus he will. Before he receives the accolade, he has a great deal to learn. I have been teaching him, to the best of my ability. And me, I told him. About can and may, and other things, too. Thank you. For a while after that, we sat with our thoughts. Before long I said, Could I become a knight? That was the only time I saw Ravd look surprised, and it was no more than his eyes opening a little wider. We can't take you with us, if that's what you mean. I shook my head. I have to stay and take care of Bold Berthold, but sometime, if I stay here? You're very nearly a knight now, I believe. What makes a knight, Abel? I'd like your ideas on the matter. He reminded me of Ms. Spario, and I grinned. And set them right. Ravd smiled back. If they need to be set right, yes. So tell me, how is a knight different from any other man? Male like yours? Ravd shook his head. A big horse like Blackmane, then? No. Money? No, indeed. I mentioned the accolade when we were talking about my squire. Did you understand me? I shook my head. The accolade is the ceremony by which one authorized to perform it confers knighthood. Let me ask again, what makes a man a knight, Abel? What makes him different enough that we have to give him a name differing from that of an ordinary fighting man? The accolade, sir. The accolade makes him a knight before the law, but it is a mere legality, formal recognition of something that has already occurred. The accolade says that we find this man to be a knight. I thought about that and about Ravd, who was a knight himself. Strength and wisdom. 
not either one by itself, but the two together. You're closer now. Perhaps you are close enough. It is honorable. A knight is a man who lives honorably and dies honorably because he cares more for his honor than for his life. If his honor requires him to fight, he fights. He doesn't count his foes or measure their strength because those things don't matter. They don't affect his decision. The trees and the wind were so still then that I felt like the whole world was listening to him. In the same way he acts honorably toward others, even when they do not act honorably toward him. His word is good no matter to whom he gives it. I was still trying to get my mind around it. I know a man who stood his ground and fought the Angerborn with just a spear and an axe. He didn't have a shield or armor, a horse, or anything like that. The men with him wanted to run, and some did. He didn't. Was he a knight? This wasn't me. What was he fighting for, Abel? It was almost a whisper. For Gerda and his house? For the crops he had in his fields and his cattle? Then he is not a knight, though he is someone I would like very much to count among my followers. I asked if he had many, because he had come into that forest alone except for Svan. More than I wish, but not many who are as brave as this man you know. I'd thank every overkind in sky for a hundred more, if they were like that. He's a good man. I was picturing bold Berthold to myself, and thinking about all that we would be able to buy with two seals. I believe you. Lie down now and get some rest. We'll need you well rested tomorrow. I want to ask a favor first. I felt like a little kid again, and that made it hard to talk. I don't mean anything bad by it. Ravd smiled. I'm sure you don't. I mean, I'm not going to try to steal it, or hurt you with it either, or anybody. But could I look at your sword, please, just for a minute? He drew it. I'm surprised you didn't ask when we had sunlight, when you could have seen it better. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer to wait? Now, please, I'd like to see it now. I promise I'll never ask again. He handed it to me hilt first, and it seemed like a warm, living thing. Its long, straight blade was chased with gold and double-edged. Its hilt of bronze and black horsehide was topped with a gold lion's head. I studied it and gripped the sword to flourish it, and found with a sort of shock that I had stood up without meaning to. After a minute or two of waving it around, I positioned the blade so that the firelight fell on the flat, just ahead of the guard. There's writing here. What does it say? Locked. You can't read, can you? I knew I could. I said, Well, I can't read this. Lot is the man who made it. Rav held out his hand, and I returned his sword. He wiped the blade with a cloth. My sword is battle-made. Lot is a famous bladesmith of Forseti, the town of my liege, Duke Martyr. Your own duke, Duke Indigen, is dead. Did you know? I thought he must be. We're attempting to assimilate his lands, and finding them a bit too much to chew, I'm afraid. Rob's smile was touched with irony. Was that Duke Martyr on the seal you gave me? Rob shook his head. That's our king, King Arnthor. What was that on his shield? A Nyker. Lie down and go to sleep, Abel. You can save the rest of your questions for tomorrow. Is it real? Sleep. When Ravd sounded like that, you did not argue. I lay down, turned my back to the fire, and fell asleep as soon as I shut my eyes. Chapter 5 Terrible Eyes Something that sounded like a scuffle woke me up. I heard Svan's voice and Ravd's, and I decided that if I did not want to start another fight, the best thing might be for me to lie there and listen. I stumbled. That was Svan. Ravd said, No one pushed you. I said I stumbled. I know you did. I wish to discover whether you will verify it. It appeared to me that you had been pushed from behind. Was I wrong? Yes. I see. You have your sword again. I found it in the bushes. Do you think I'd come back here without it? I don't see why not. Ravd sounded as though the question interested him. 
If you mean you might need it to deal with our guide, it wasn't of great use to you an hour ago. We might be attacked. By the outlaws? Yes, I suppose we might. Are you going to sleep in your armor? Certainly. It's one of the things the knight must learn to do. Ravd sighed. Many years before either of us was born, a wise man said that there were only three things a knight had to learn. I believe I told you a week ago, though it may have been more. Can you tell me what they are now? To ride, Svan sounded as if it were being dragged out of him. To use the sword, very good, and to speak the truth. Indeed, Raft murmured. Indeed. Shall we begin again, or would you prefer to omit that part? If Svan said anything, I could not hear it. I've been sitting here awake since you ran away, you see, talking to our guide at first and talking to myself after he went to sleep, thinking, in other words, one of the things I thought about was the way he threw your sword. I saw it. Perhaps you did as well. I don't want to talk about it. Then you need not. But I will have to talk about it more, because you won't. When a man throws a heavy object, such as a sword or spear, for distance, he uses his whole body, his legs and torso as well as his arm. Abel did not do that. He simply flung your sword away as a man might discard an apple core. I think. Who cares what you think? Why, I do. Rob's voice was as smooth as polished steel and sounded a good deal more dangerous. And you must, Svan. Sir Sabal beat me twice, once with his hands and once with the flat of his sword. I was Sir Sabal's squire for ten years and two. No doubt I've told you. Maybe Svan nodded. I could not see. With the flat of his sword because I attacked him. He would have been entirely justified in killing me. But he was a good and a merciful knight, a better knight than I will ever be. With his hands for something I had said to him, or something I had failed to say, I never did find out exactly what it was. He was drunk at the time. But then we all get drunk now and then, don't we? You don't. Because he was, I found it less humiliating than I would have otherwise. Perhaps I said that I cared nothing for his thoughts. That seems likely enough. Abel flung your sword as a man flings dung, or any such object. I believe I said that. He merely cast it from him, in other words, making no effort toward great distance or force. If you were to cast a hurl-bat so, I would chastise you, with my tongue, I mean. Svan spoke then, but I could not hear what he said. It may be so. My point is that your sword cannot have been thrown far. Three or four strides, I would think, five at most. Yet I didn't hear you searching for it in the dark, and I expected to. I was listening for it. I stepped on it, Svan said. I didn't have to look for it at all. One resolves not to lie, but one always resolves to begin one's new truthfulness at a later time. Not now. Ravd sounded tired. I'm not lying. Of course you are. You stepped upon your sword four strides southeast of where I sit. You uttered no grunt of astonishment, no exclamation. You bent in silence and picked it up. You would have had to grope for the hilt, I believe, since you would not wish to lay hands on a sharp blade in the dark. You then returned it to its scabbard, a scabbard of wood covered with leather without a sound. After that you returned to our camp from the west, tripping over something with such violence that you almost fell into the fire. Svan moaned like one in pain, but spoke no word. You must have been running to trip as hard as that and come near to falling. Were you running through a strange forest in the dark? Something caught me. Ah, now we're come to it. At least I hope so. What was it? I don't know. Svan drew breath. I ran away. Was your churl chasing me? No, Ravd said. Well, I thought he was, and I ran right into somebody— only I don't think it was really a person, a... a ghost or something. Interesting. There were several. Svan seemed to have taken heart. I can't say how many, four or five. Go on. I could not tell whether Ravd believed him. They gave me back my sword and brought me here, and they pushed me at our fire hard, just like you said. Saying nothing to you? No. Did you thank them for returning your sword? 
No. Perhaps they gave you a charm or a letter, something of that kind. No. Did they take our horses? I don't think so. Go now and see to them, please, Svan. See that they're well tied and haven't been ridden. I don't. Sir Ravd. Go. Svan cried, and right then I wanted to sit up and say something, anything that might make him feel better. I was going to say that I would go, but that would just have made him feel worse. When he stopped crying, Ravd said, They frightened you very badly, whoever they were. They are more afraid of them than you are of me or our guide. Are they listening to us? I don't know. I think so. And you're afraid that if you confide in me they'll punish you for it? Yes. I doubt it. If they are indeed listening, they must have heard that you didn't confide in me. Abel, you are awake. Sit up, please, and look at me. I did. How much have you heard? Everything, or nearly. How did you know I was awake? When you were truly asleep, you stirred in your sleep half a dozen times, and twice seemed almost to speak. Once you snored a little. When you feigned sleep, you moved not a muscle and uttered not a sound, though we were talking in ordinary tones within two strides of you. So you were awake or dead. I didn't want Svan to feel worse than he did already. Admirable. I said, I'm sorry I threw your sword, Svan. Who caught Svan and returned him to us, do you know? I had no idea. I shook my head. Svan wiped his nose. They gave me a message for you, Abel. You are to be sure that your playmate is looking out for you. I suppose I gawked. Robbed said, Who are these friends of yours, Abel? I think... The outlaws? I shook my head. I don't think so. Couldn't it be the elf? Robbed looked thoughtful. Svan, did you intend Abel's death? Yes, I did. There were no tears now. He drew his dagger and handed it to me. I was going to kill you with this. You may keep it if you want to. I turned it over in my hands. The tip was angled down to meet a long straight edge. It's a sax, Svan sounded as if we were sharing food and passing the time. It's like the knives the frost giants carry. Of course, theirs are much bigger. I said, You were going to kill me with this? And he nodded. Ravd asked, Why are you telling us this now, Svan? Because I was told to give their message to him as soon as he woke up, and I think they're listening. So you said. I was hoping you'd go to sleep. Then I could have awakened him and whispered it. That was what I wanted. You'd never have had to tell me what happened. Svan nodded. I don't want it, I said. I gave him his dagger back. I have a knife of my own, and I like mine better. You may as well tell us everything, Ravd said, and Svan did. I didn't run into them like I said. I ran into a tree and hit it hard enough that I fell down. When I could, I got up again and circled around your fire, keeping it only just in sight. When I was on the side where Abel was, I got as close as I dared, and that was pretty close. You said you would have heard me if I had found my sword. I don't think so, because you didn't hear that. I was waiting for you to go to sleep. When I was sure you were sleeping, I was going to kill him as quietly as I could and carry his body away and hide it. I wouldn't come back until tomorrow afternoon, and you'd think he had simply run away. They grabbed me from behind, making less noise than I had. They had swords and bows. They took me to a clearing where I could see them a little in the moonlight, and they told me that if I hurt Abel, I'd belong to them. I'd have to slave for them for the rest of my life. Robbed stroked his chin. They gave me that message and made me say it seven times and swear on my sword that I do everything exactly the way they said. They had your sword? Right. The kind of sarcasm I was going to get to know a lot better crept into Svan's voice. I don't know how they got it without your hearing, but they had it. Recalling things Bold Berthold had told me, I asked whether they were black. No. I don't know what color they were, but it wasn't black. They looked pale in the moonlight. Robd said, Abel thinks they might be Elf. So do I. I take it they didn't identify themselves. No, but it could be right. I know they weren't people like us. I've never seen them. Have you, Abel? I said, Not that I remember, but Bold Berthold has. 
He said the ones who bothered him were like ashes or charcoal. Ravd turned back to Svan. You must tell me everything you remember about them just as truthfully as you can. Or did they caution you not to? Svan shook his head. They said to give Abel their message when he woke and never to hurt him, that was all. Why is Abel precious to them? They wouldn't tell. Abel, do you know? No. I wished then that Ravd had not seen I was awake. They want me to do something, but I don't know what it is. Svan said, Then how do you know they do? I did not answer. Our king was born in Aelfris, Ravd told me, as was his sister Princess Morcaine. Since you didn't recognize his face on a seal, I doubt that you knew it. I didn't, I said. I don't believe my squire credits it. Or at least, I believe he did not, until now, though he may have changed his opinion. Svan told me, People talk as if Aelfris were a foreign country like Austerland. Sir Ravd says it's really another world. If it is, I don't see how people can come here from there, or go there, either. Ravd shrugged. And I, who have never done it, cannot tell you. I can tell you, however, that it's not wise to deny everything you can't understand. How were your captors dressed? Could you see? They weren't, as far as I could see. They were as naked as poor children. They were tall, though, taller than I am, and thin. His breath caught in his throat. They had terrible eyes. Terrible in what way? I can't explain it. They held the moonlight and made it burn. It hurt to look at them. Ravd sat in silence for a minute or two after that, his hand stroking his chin. One more question, Svan, then we must sleep, all of us. It's late already, and we should be up early. You said that there were four or five of them. Was that the truth? About that many? I couldn't be sure. Abel, put a little more wood on the fire, since you're up. How many could you be sure of, Svan? Four. Three were men. Males, or whatever you call them. But I think there may have been more. The fourth was female, I take it. Did she speak? No. How many males did? Three. Ravd yawned, which may have been play-acting. Lie down, Svan. Sleep if you can. Svan spread a blanket for himself and lay down on it. Ravd said, I believe you will be safe, Abel. From Svan, at least. I suppose I nodded. But I was thinking how another world might seem like it was just another country, and about yellow eyes that burned with moonlight like a cat's. Chapter 6 Seeing Something We reached Glenadam about mid-morning, and Ravd called the people together, all the men and all the women, and some children too. He began by driving Battle Maid into a log Svan and I fetched for him. You are invited to swear fealty to our liege, Duke Martyr, he told them. I won't make you swear. You're free to refuse if you wish to refuse, but you should know that I will report those who do not swear to him. After that, they swore, all of them, putting their hands on the lion's head and repeating the oath after Ravd. Now I would like to speak with some of you one at a time, he said, and chose six men and six women, and had Svan and me watch the rest while he talked to the first one in the front room of the biggest house in the village. An hour went by while he was talking to that first one, and the ones who were waiting got restless. But Svan put his hand to his sword and shouted until they quieted down. The first man came out at last, sweating and unable to meet the eyes of the waiting eleven, and Ravd called for the first woman. She went inside, trembling, and the minutes ticked by. A shiny blue fly, big with carrion, buzzed around me until I chased it, then around Svan, and at last around a little black-bearded man the rest called Taug, who seemed much too despondent to chase anything. The woman appeared in the doorway, her face streaked with tears. Abel? Which one is Abel? He wants you. I went in, and the woman sat down on a little milking stool in front of Ravd. He, seated on a short bench with a back, said, Abel, this is Briga. Because she is a woman, I permit her to sit. The men stand. Briga tells me there is a man called Seeksneed who is well acquainted with the outlaws and entertains them at times. 
Do you understand why I asked you to come in? I said, Yes, sir, only I don't think I can help much. If we learn nothing from you, you may learn something from us, Robd spoke to the woman. Now, Briga, I want to explain how things are for you. In fact, I must explain that, because I doubt that you understand it. Briga, thin and no longer young, snuffled and wiped her eyes with a corner of her apron. You are afraid that Abel here will tell others what you've told me about Seek's Neat, isn't that so? She nodded. He won't, but your danger is much greater than that. Do you two know each other, by the way? She shook her head. I said, No, sir. You have told me about Seeksneet, and of course I will try to find him and talk to him. Those people outside will know you've talked to me, and the longer we are together, the more they will think you've told me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Y uh, yes Have you yourself or your husband ever been robbed? They knocked me down. The tears burst forth and flowed for some minutes. Do you know the name of the outlaw who knocked you down? She shook her head. But if you knew it, you would tell me, wouldn't you? It would make no sense for you to keep it from me when you have told me as much as you have. You see that, don't you? It was Eagle. Thank you, Briga. You've taken an oath, the most solemn oath a woman can take. You've acknowledged Duke Martyr as your liege, and sworn to obey him in all things. If you break that oath... Hell will condemn your spirit to Muspel, the circle of fire. The sacrifices you've offered the elf can't save you. I take it you know all that. She nodded. I am here because Duke Martyr appointed me. If it were not for that, I would be sitting at my own table in Red Hall, or seeing to my horses there. I speak for Duke Martyr just as if he were here in person. I am his knight. She sniffled. I know. Furthermore, the outlaws will avenge themselves upon you and your whole village, if they are left free to do so. Eagle, who knocked you down, will do worse. This is your chance to avenge yourself with words worth more than swords to Duke Martyr and me. Do you know of anyone else here who is on good terms with the outlaws? Anyone at all? She shook her head. Only seek Sneet. What is his wife's name? Desira. Really? Ravd pursed his lips. That's perilously near a queen's name some men conjure with. Do you know that name? No. I don't say it. Does she? I will not use her name. The woman we are speaking of. Seeks Neat's wife. Has she alluded to that queen in your hearing? No. Riga repeated. Ravd sighed. Abel, would you know Seek's need if you saw him? Think before you speak. I said, I'm sure I would, sir. Describe him, please, Briga. The woman only stared. Is he tall? Taller than I am. She held her hands a foot apart to indicate the amount. A dark beard. Red. One eye, crooked nose, club foot. She shook her head to all of them. What else can you tell us about him? He's fat, she said thoughtfully. And he walks like this. She stood up and demonstrated her toes turned in. I see. Abel, does this square with your recollection? Fat, the red beard, the walk? It did. When we spoke earlier, you did not name Seeksneet's wife. Was that because you didn't know her name or because you were too prudent to voice it? Because I didn't know it, sir. I'm not afraid to say Desira. Then it would be wise for you not to say it too often. Do you know what she looks like? I nodded. She's small with black hair and her skin's very white. I didn't think her especially pretty woman when Seek Sneet was cheating bold Berthold and me, but I've seen worse. Briga, does he know her? I think he does. The woman who had been wiping her eyes wiped them again. Very well. Pay attention, Abel. If you will not listen to me about that woman's name, listen to this at least. I want you to search the village for these people. When you find either or both, bring them to me if you can. If you can't, come back and tell me where they are. 
Briga will be gone by then, but I'll be talking to others as likely as not. Don't hesitate to interrupt. Yes, sir. I want Seeksneet, of course, but I want his wife almost as much. She probably knows less, but she may tell us more. Since she has a new child, it's quite possible she's still here. Now go. At the outskirts of Glenadam, I halted to search its sprouting fields with my eyes. I had looked into every room of every one of the village's houses, and into every barn and shed as well, all without seeing either Seek's neat or his wife. Ravd had said I was to interrupt him if I found them, but I did not think he would like being interrupted to hear that I had not. And Ravd had been right, I told myself. A woman with a newborn would not willingly travel far. There was every chance that when she heard a knight had come to Glenadam, she had fled no farther than the nearest trees, where she could sit in the shade to nurse her baby. If I left the village to look there, trying to settle the matter in my own mind, I called softly, Desira? Desira? At once it seemed to me that I glimpsed her face among the crowding leaves where the forest began. On one level I felt sure it had been some green joke of sunlight and shadow. On another I knew that I had seen her, or at least that I had seen something. I took a few steps, stopped a minute, still unsure, and hurried forward. Chapter 7 Desiree Help! It was not so much a cry as a moan like that of the wind and like a moaning wind it seemed to fill the forest. I pushed through the brush that crowded the forest's edge, trotted among close-set saplings, then sprinted among mature trees that grew larger and larger and more and more widely spaced as I advanced. Please help me. Please. I paused to catch my breath, cupped my hands around my mouth, and called, I'm coming, as loudly as I could. Even as I did it, I wondered how she had known there was anyone to hear her while I was still walking down the rows of sprouting grain. Possibly she had not. Possibly she had been calling like that at intervals for hours. I trotted again, then ran, up a steep ridge crowned with dreary hemlocks and along the ridge line until it dipped and swerved in oaks. Always it seemed to me that the woman who called could not be more than a hundred strides away. The woman, I felt perfectly certain, had to be Seek's Neat's wife, Desira. Soon I reached a little river that must surely have been the Griffin. I forded it by the simple expedient of wading in where I was. I had to hold my bow, my quiver, and the little bag I tied to my belt over my head before I was done. But I got through and scrambled up the long sloping bank of rounded stones on the other side. There, mighty beaches, robed with moss, lifted proud heads into that fair world called Sky. And there the woman who called to me sounded nearer still, no more, I thought, than a few strides off. In a dark dell full of mushrooms and last year's leaves I felt certain I would find her. She was only on the other side of the beaver meadow, beyond all question, and after that, up on the rocky outcrop, I glimpsed beyond it. Except that when I got there, I could hear her calling still, calling in the distance. I shouted then, gasping for breath between the repetitions of her name. Desira? 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 Here, here at the blasted tree. The seconds passed like sighs. Then I saw it down the shallow valley on the farther side of the outcrop the shattered trunk, the broken limbs, and the rattled leaves that clung to them not quite concealing something green as spring. It fell, she told me when I reached her. I wanted to see if I could move it just a little, and it fell on my foot. I cannot get my foot out. I put my bow under the fallen trunk and pried. I never felt it move, but she was able to work her foot free. By the time she got it out, I had noticed something so strange that I was certain I could not really be seeing it, and so hard to describe that I may never make it clear. 
The afternoon sun shone brightly just then, and the leaves of the fallen tree, which I think must have been hit by lightning, and those of the trees all around it, cast a dappled shade. Mostly we were in the shade, but there were a few splashes of brilliant sunshine here and there. I should have seen her most clearly when one fell on her. But it was the other way. I could see her very clearly in the shade, but when the sun shone on her face, her legs, her shoulders, or her arms, it almost seemed that she was not there at all. At school, Mr. Potash showed us a hologram. He pulled the blinds and explained that the darker it was in the room, the more real the hologram would look. So when we had all looked at it, I moved one of the blinds to let in light, and he was right. It got dim, but it was stronger again as soon as I let the blind fall back. I don't think I should walk on this. She was rubbing her foot. It does not feel right. There is a cave a few steps that way. Do you think you could carry me there? I did not, but I was not going to say so until I tried. I picked her up. I have held little kids who weighed more than she did, but she felt warm and real in my arms, and she kissed me. In there we will be out of the rain, she told me. She kept her eyes down as if she were shy, but I knew she was not really shy. I started off hoping I was going toward the cave she knew about, and I said that it was not going to rain. Yes, it is. Haven't you noticed how cool the air has gotten? Listen to the birds. To your left a trifle, and look behind the big stump. It was a nice little cave, just high enough for me to stand up in, and there was a sort of bed made of deer skins and furs, with a green velvet blanket on top. Put me on that, she said. Please. When I did, she kissed me again, and when she let me go, I sat down on the smooth, sandy floor of the cave to get my breath. She laughed at me, but she did not say anything. For quite a while, I did not say anything either. I was thinking a lot, but I had no control of the things I thought, and I was so excited about her that I thought something was going to happen any minute that I would be ashamed of for the rest of my life. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life. She still is. And I had to shut my eyes, which made her laugh again. Her laugh was like nothing on earth. It was as if there were golden bells hanging among the flowers through a forest of the loveliest trees that could ever be. And a wind sighing there was ringing all the bells. When I could open my eyes again, I whispered, Who are you? Really? She, you called. She smiled, not trying to hide her eyes any more. Maybe a leopard would have eyes like those, but I kind of doubt it. I called Sikhsneet's wife Desira. You aren't her. I am Desiree, the moss maiden, and I have kissed you. I could still feel her kiss, and her hair smelled of new-turned earth and sweet smoke. Men I have kissed cannot leave until I send them away. I wanted to stand up then, but I knew I could never leave her. I said, I'm not a man, Desiree, just a kid. You are. You are. Let me have one drop of blood, and I will show you. By morning the rain had stopped. She and I swam side by side in the river, and lay together like two snakes on a big shady rock, only an inch above the water. I knew I was all different, but I did not know how different. I think it was the way a caterpillar feels after it has turned into a butterfly and is still drying its wings. Tell me, I said, if another man came, would he see you like I see you now? No other man will come. Did not your brother teach you about me? I did not know whether she meant you or bold Berthold Ben, but I shook my head. He knows me. Have you kissed him? She laughed and shook her head. Bold Berthold told me the elf looked like ashes. We are the moss elf, Abel, and we are of the wood, 
and not the ash. She was still smiling. You call us dryads, scogsfru, tree brides, and other names. You may make a name for us yourself. What would you like to call us? Angels, I whispered, but she pressed a finger to my lips. I blinked and looked away when she did that, and it seemed to me when I glimpsed her from the corner of my eye that she looked different from the girl I had been swimming with and all the girls I had just made love with. Shall I show you? I nodded, and felt muscles in my neck slithering like pythons. Good Lord, I said, and heard a new voice, wild and deep. It was terribly strange. I knew I had changed, but I did not know how much, and for a long time after I thought I was going to change back. You need to remember that. You won't hate me, Abel? I could never hate you, I told her. It was the truth. We are loathsome in the eyes of those who do not worship us. I chuckled at that. The deep reverberations in my chest surprised me, too. My eyes are mine, I said, and they do what I tell them. I'll close them before I kiss you if we need more privacy. She sat up, dangling her legs in the clear cold water. Not in this light. Her kick dashed water through a sunbeam and showered us with silver drops. You love the sunlight, I said. I sensed it. She nodded. Because it is yours, your realm. The sun gave me you, and I love you. My kind love the night, and so I love them both. I shook my head. I don't understand. How can you? Loving me, couldn't you love some human woman? No, I said. I never could. I meant it. She laughed, and this time it was a laugh that made fun of me. Show me, she said. She kicked again. The slender little foot that rose from the shimmering water was as green as new leaves. Her face was sharper, green too, three-cornered, bold and sly. Berry lips pressed mine and when we parted I found myself looking straight into eyes of yellow fire. Her hair floated above her head. I embraced her, lifting and holding her, and kissed her again. Chapter 8 Ulfa and Taug When she had gone, I tried to find her cave again. It was not there, only my bow, my quiver, and my clothes lying on the grass. The spiny orange bow that had seemed very large to me was suddenly small, almost a toy, and I would have torn my shirt and pants if I had managed to put them on. Throwing them aside, I drew my bow, pulling the string to my ear as I always had. The spiny orange did not break, although I bent it double, but the bowstring did. I flung it away and got out the string Parka had bitten off for me from her spinning the string whose murmuring voices and myriad strange lives had disturbed my dreams for so many nights. I tied loops in its ends and put it on my bow, and it sang there when I drew it to my ear, and sang again, a mighty chorus far away, when I sent an arrow flying up the slope. I could not draw that arrow to my ear, it was too short by two spans, yet it sped flat as a bullet and buried half its shaft in the bowl of an oak. Naked, I returned to Glenadam at twilight, and struck the little black-bearded man because he laughed at me, and laid him flat. When he could stand and speak again, he told me Ravd and Svan had left that morning. Then I can hope for no help from them, I said. I must have clothes just the same, and since you are here and they aren't, you must provide them. How will you do it? We we have c cloth. His teeth were chattering, so I was patient with him. M my w wife will s s sew for you. We went to his house. He fetched out his daughter, and I promised not to harm her. Her name was Olfa. A knight was here yesterday, she told me when her father had gone a real knight in iron armor, with huge horses, and two boys to wait on him. 
That's interesting, I said. I wanted to hear what she would say next. He'd a big helm hanging from his saddle, you know how they do, with plumes and a lion on it, and a lion on his big shield too, a gold lion with blood on its claws where they raked the shield like. That was Sir Ravd, I told her. Yes, that's what they do say. We had to stand and wait his pleasure, and go in one by one when the boy said only I didn't. Papa was feared his pleasure might be his pleasure, she giggled. If you know what I mean, and I still a maid, so he hid me in the barn and pitched straw over me. Only I got out and watched, and talked to some of them that had been in. Some of the women, I mean, for there was men too, only I don't think he would with them. Hold still while I pin. Her pin was a long black thorn. They said he asked about the free companies, only they didn't tell nothing. None of them did, even if they all had to swear. Are you sure you don't want some mush? We've lard to fry in from the barrows pa slaughtered last fall. I'll kill a deer for you, I promised her, in payment for these clothes. That'll be nice, the black thorn was back between her teeth. I drew my bow reflecting that it had been all I could do to bring an arrow near my ear the day before. Talking to myself, I said, A short arrow at that. Hmm? Ulfa looked up from her work. In my quiver, two arrows I made for myself from spiny orange, and two I took from a boy I fought. One of the boys with him had splendid clothes, she confided. I got as close as I could to look. Red pants, I swear, by Garseg's gullet. That was Svan. What about the other boy? Him? Oh, he was ordinary enough, Ulfa said. About like my brother, but might be good-looking in a year or two. Didn't he have a bow like mine? Bigger than yours, sir. She had finished cutting her cloth and begun to sew, making long stitches with a big bone needle. Too big for him was the look of it. Brother had one too, only it's broke. Pa says when a bow's not strung, it ought to be no bigger than the man that carries it, and most is smaller of what I've seen, like yours is, sir. I need longer arrows, I told her. Does your pa have a rule for arrows, too? Still plying her needle, she shook her head. In that case, I'll give you one I just made. An arrow ought to reach from the end of the owner's left forefinger to his right ear. Mine are far shy of that. You'll have to find new ones. I'll have to make new ones, and I will. What if I were to tell you I was the boy with the big bow? The needle stopped in mid-stab, and Ulfa looked up at me. You, sir? I nodded. She laughed. That boy that was here yesterday? I could have shut my hand round his arm almost. I doubt I could get both round yours, sir. Pushing the trousers she had been making for me to one side, she rose. Can I try? May I try? Yes, you may. Both her hands could not encircle my arm, but they could caress it. You should be a knight yourself, sir. I am. My declaration surprised me, I think, much more than it surprised her, yet I recalled what Ravd had said. We find this man to be a knight and it carried an inner certainty. I am Sir Abel, I added. Hidden by her shift, her nipples brushed my elbow. Then you ought to have a sword. Others have swords, too, I told her. But you're right just the same. I'll get one. Go back to your sewing, Ulfa. When the trousers were finished and she had begun the shirt, I said, your father was afraid Sir Ravd would rape you, so you said. Ravish me, she nodded. Only not because of his name. I don't think he knew it then. Neither do I. Isn't your father afraid I'll ravish you myself? I don't know, Sir Abel. A man intent on rape could do much worse. Have you no mother, Ulfa? Oh, yes. By Garseg's grace, she's still among us. But being blind or crippled in her hands, she can no longer sew? Alpha bit her thread, waking a memory. She can, Sir Abel, I swear to you. She sews better than I, and taught me. Only skillful sewing takes sunlight. I see. 
Who's in this house, Ulfa? Name them all. You and me? Ma, Pa, and Brother Taug? Really? They're uncommonly quiet. I haven't heard a voice or a step other than yours and mine. Where is your mother, do you think? Ulfa said nothing, but I followed the direction of her eyes and opened the door of a wretched little room that appeared to be a sort of pantry. A woman, Briga's age, was huddled in its farthest corner, her eyes wide with fright. I said, Don't worry, Ma. However this falls out, I'll do you and your daughter no hurt. She nodded and compelled her lips to smile, and the pain of her effort made me turn away. Ulfa joined us, eager to distract me. Try it on now. I have to be sure it's not too small. I did, and she ticked like a beetle in the wall, saying I had the shoulders of a barn door. I laughed and said I had not known barn doors boasted shoulders. You think you're ordinary, I suppose, and the rest of us dwarfs. I saw myself in the water, I told her. I had been with a woman called Desiree, and... Desira? No. Desiree, the moss maiden, who I imagine must have given Desira her dangerous name. She wanted to lie in the shade, but she left when the sun was high. I happened to stand in the sunlight, and I saw my reflection. I was... I was held back once, Ulfa, not allowed to grow with the years. She said something about that, and she undid that holding back. It hurt, but I added, I would guess for her own pleasure. Ulfa's mouth formed a small circle. She said nothing. Anyway, I am as I am, and I have to make myself longer arrows. Hesitantly, Ulfa said, We try to stay on good terms with the hidden folk. Do you succeed? Oh, a bit. They heal our sick sometimes and watch the forest cattle. As long as you speak well of them and put food out for them? She nodded, but would not meet my eye. Bold Berthold and I leave them a bowl of broth and a bite of ash cake now and then. We sing songs they like, too, and and do things, you know, in places we can't ever talk about. Ulfa's needle was fairly flying. Songs that can't be sung for strangers, and things you can't speak of even among yourselves? Bold Berthold told me something about it. After a long pause, she said, Yes. Things I can't talk about. Then talk about this. Is desire great among the elf? Oh, yes, Ulfa rose, holding up the shirt for me to admire. A great lady? Worse. I tried to imagine desire worse. Perhaps she punishes bandits and the like. Liars. Anybody that offends her, sir? I sighed. I love her, Ulfa. What am I do? Ulfa put her mouth to my ear. I don't know about love yet, Sir Abel. And I won't teach you, or at least not much. Give me my shirt. I promise to try not to get my blood on it. I pulled it over my head and flexed my shoulders. It was as loose-fitting as I could have wished. Didn't Pa tell you to make it tight so as to bind me? Ulfa shook her head. He hadn't time to think of that, perhaps, or perhaps he thought I would not be wearing it. I suppose it must be easy to kill a man between a woman's legs. I... I wouldn't have a thing to do with... you know, with nothing like that, Sir Abel. Queen Desiree, my witness! Her small, strong hands caressed shoulders that, thanks to her, were no longer bare. I believe you, I told her, and kissed her. A wolf howled in the distance and in a strangled voice she said, A Norn hound. It's a bad omen. If... if you was to stay with me tonight, I would stay awake to warn you. I smiled. I won't. But you're right, the hunt is on. Warn me of what? Your father and your brother? Wordlessly she nodded. I thought they might burst in when I kissed you. Hoped they would, because it would be better to fight where I've got light. Let's try again. I kissed again and held her longer. When we separated, I said, So that's the taste of human women. I didn't know. She stared, but did not speak. 
I went to the window and looked out into the street. It was too dark to see anything. I know a little something about love now, Sir Abel. She was rubbing herself against me, reminding me of Grandma's cat. There's something down here that's hot as the steam from the kettle. Your father and brother didn't rush in. You must have noticed. Your servant girl didn't notice the thing right then, Sir Abel, except for you? So it will be outside in the dark. But this house has a rear door. I saw it when we looked in on Ma. I opened the door to the pantry, nodded to the cowering woman, and threw open the door in the opposite wall. Outside were a boy with a spear and two men with brown bills. The men poked at me as if I were a burning log, but I cut a bill in each hand, snatched them from their owners, though I had to kick the larger, and broke the shafts over my knee. The boy dropped his spear and fled. He did not get far. I snatched up my bow and ran after him, and caught him in a little meadow near the forest. Are you Taug? Perhaps he nodded. If so, I could not see him, and if he spoke it was so softly I could not hear him. I pinned his arm behind his back and wrapped his ear with my bow when he screamed. You have to answer my questions, I told him, and answer honestly, promptly too and politely. Is this forest safe by night? No, sir, he muttered. I didn't think so. We need each other, you see. While I'm with you, you get my protection, a needed safeguard at least till the sun's back. I, on the other hand, need you to warn me of danger. Suppose I got annoyed and killed you. He trembled, shaming me. He was only a little kid. I wouldn't get your warning then, and things might be bad for me. We've got to be careful, and look out for each other. Your name's the same as your dad's? Uh-huh. That was his house? Uh-huh. You've got to speak clearly and call me Sir Abel. I don't want you to duck my questions with uh-huh and uh-uh either, not any more, or even yes and no. You talk about every answer you give. I wanted to say like in school, but I changed it quick to, or else you'll get a broken arm. I'll try, Taug swallowed audibly. Sir Abel? Good. You were ready to kill me with that spear when I opened the door, but I'll forget it if you let me. There were two men with bills with you. Who were they? Volley and my pa, Sir Abel. I see. I knocked your father down for laughing at me. I guess he resented it. His name is... He's Taug, too. We were crossing a moonlit glade, and Taug eyed its shadows as if he expected a lion in every one of them. You told the truth. That's good. I stopped, making him stop, too. And who's Volley? A neighbor, Taug muttered. I shook him. Is that how you talk to a knight? Our neighbor, Sir Abel, right next door. I expected you in the street. That was why I went out the back. How did you outguess me? Pa did, Sir Abel. He said he thought you'd sneak out the back. Sneak. Well, that'll be a lesson to me. Suppose your father had been wrong. Ma'd have told us, and we'd have gone round both sides of the house, so one got behind. And put his bill into me. Taug nodded, and I shook him until he managed to say, That's it, Sir Abel. Or if we wasn't in time, we'd waited where the path goes through the alders. What about the other men in your village? There must be twenty or more. Wouldn't they help? Uh-uh, Sir Abel. They... they was afraid the night had come back. The other night. Go on. Only Volley and... and... and somebody else. I let my voice drop to a whisper. Who was it. When Taug did not speak, I lifted his pinned arms. Vey, Sir Abel. He's a little un, Sir Abel, younger than me. Is he Volley's son? He sounds like it. Uh-huh, Sir Abel. Volley and Hulta only got the one, Sir Abel, and he's not old enough to plow. He had to help his pa told him to. Then I won't be hard on him if he comes my way, and I won't be hard on you because you were worried about him. I was younger than you are yesterday. That may be why it doesn't feel like bullying to do this, but maybe it is. You, you're twice as big as Pa, Sir Abel. I didn't see a little kid with you when I opened the door, Taug. Where was he? 
You run off into the woods, Sir Abel. When I opened the back door, you were scared and ran yourself, but I saw you. Why didn't I see Vay? He run for I did, Sir Abel. I let go of his arms and caught him by the neck. Have you ever been hit with a bow, Taug? Uh-huh, Sir Abel. I... I had this bow myself, and... and... Your dad beat you with it. No, because you wouldn't mind telling me that. Your sister did it. Ulfa. I felt Taug nod and shook him. That's the truth. Ulfa beat me with it. You deserved it, that's for sure. She beat you black and blue, I hope. Oh, yes, Sir Abel, real bad. So bad you couldn't stand afterward? Ah, uh, no, Sir Abel. Not as bad as that. You're nearly as big as she is. You must have gotten even some way. What did you do? N nothing Pa wouldn't let me. We're going to walk again, I told him, and I'm going to turn you loose. You keep in front of me so I can see you if you try to clear out. I'll catch you if you do, and when I catch you, I'll beat you with this bow till you can't stand up. I let him go and gave him a push, and when he stopped walking, I pushed him again. What are you so afraid of, bears? They'll eat you first, and maybe you'll fill them up so they won't eat me. What do you think? N nothing I know. But you think you do, and that's sad. Taug, you'd better tell the truth, or I'll beat you this minute. Beat you till you crawl. So tell the truth, or get ready. You're afraid of something up ahead. What is it? The free company, Sir Abel. The outlaws? Go on. He... They run to fetch him. His paw made him, Sir Abel. Only... only... Yes? Only what? We wanted to tell Ulfa not to sew so fast, so they'd come for you left. Only we couldn't. She knew what you planned? Taug said nothing, and I rapped his ear. Out with it. I don't know, Sir Abel. Really, I don't. She knew something was up, but she sewed very fast and kept this shirt in my trousers as simple as she could. I thought it was because she was afraid of me. Maybe she was afraid for me. I hope so. But you've got nothing to be afraid of up there, Taug. If the outlaws were hiding in those shadows, we'd be full of arrows by this time. They could see us in this moonlight. They got spears and axes, mostly, Taug muttered. I hardly heard him, because I was listening so hard to something else. Chapter 9 A Wizard Night where are we? Taug stared about him as he spoke, seeing, as I did, ancient trees, thicker through than his father's house, and lofty as clouds, and a forest floor decked with flowers and ferns, and laced with crystal rills. The soft gray light by which we grasped the nobility and heart-rending beauty of all these seemed to proceed from the air itself. I said, In the world underneath, I think, in Aelfris, where the elf come from. Now keep your voice down. It must have been your talk that betrayed us. This is Aelfris? I think I said that. I was not sure, but tried to sound sure, and angry too. It isn't real. I put my finger to my lips. I'm sorry, Sir Abel. Taug was near to choking on his curiosity. Do you think they followed us? I doubt it, but they might have. Besides, if you make noise here, you might wake something worse. Such as I, Abel. The voice was desires, filled with mirth, mockery, and music, sourceless as the light. I knew it at once. Desiree, I... Would fawn upon me, if I allowed it. Y yes I fell to my knees, somehow feeling it might keep me from stammering. I would, beautiful queen, have pity and show yourself. She stepped from behind a tree, no taller than Taug, slender as the naked sword she held, and green. He knelt too, I suppose because I had. Is this your slave, Abel? Tell him to get up. I made an urgent gesture, and Taug rose. I let you pay me homage, as a very great favor. It extends no further than yourself. I said, Thank you. Thanks very much. I understand. Now you ought to stand, too. 
In the future you are to send him away when you wish to adore me. It is not fitting that my consort kneels while his slave lounges. Taug retreated. Desiree, could we— I was still on my knees. Take ourselves to some private place. I think not. Your slave might get into mischief. Then may I kill him? Taug gasped. Sir Abel! Desiree laughed. Look at him. He thinks you mean it. I do, I said. He wants to talk. See how his mouth moves. Delighted, Desiree pointed with the slender blade she bore. Speak, boy. I will not let him strangle you, at least not yet. My sister— What of her? Taug drew breath. I got this sister, Queen Desiree. Her name's Ulfa. Desiree shot a glance at me. I ought to have watched you more closely, dear messenger. She loves him. Loves Sir Abel. Or that's what I think. I adjusted the position of the too short arrow I had brought to park a string. You can't know that. Or if you do, you have to know I don't love her. I was listening under the window. My pa said to. I heard how she talked. How she sounded. Taug paused to clear his throat. I want to say if you kill me, Sir Abel, you'll be killed in the brother of a girl that loves you. You want to do that? I spoke to Desiree. I'll kill him if you want me to. She looked at me curiously. Would not it trouble you afterward? Maybe. But if you want him dead, I'll kill him for you and find out. You mortals, Desiree told Taug, are often tender about such things. It is supposed to be a good example for us, and sometimes it is. Wide-eyed, Taug nodded. Desiree turned to me, seeming to forget him. When was it we were together last April? A year ago? Something like that? Yesterday morning, Queen Desiree. In so brief a time you have become a knight, and learned that I am a queen. Who told you that, and who gave you the coli? I did not want to say Ulfa had told me. A knight with no sword, I said instead, and I just made myself a knight. I was hoping it would make me somebody you could love. She laughed. Taug cringed. By the same measure, I am a goddess. I've worshipped you since I carried you to the cave, Queen Desiree. Your goddess, she told Taug, but I do not dare ascend to the third world just the same. Did you know that, little boy? He shook his head, and seeing my eyes on him said, No, Queen Desiree, we don't know nothing about things like that in Glenadam. Your overkinds would destroy me as a matter of course, nor is the second much safer. She turned back to me. It is an awful place, dragons like cedar roaring and fighting. Would you follow me there? I said, and meant, that I would follow her anywhere. I can climb to your world, too, as you've seen. I nodded. Could I get to the third world the same way? I've been wondering. I have no idea. She paused, studying me. You're a knight, Abel. You say so, and so does this boy. You also say you have no sword. A knight requires one. If you say so, Queen Desiree. I do. She smiled. And I do have an idea about that. A great knight, fit to be a queen's consort, should bear no common sword but a fabled brand imbued with all sorts of magical authority and mystical significance. Eterni, Sword of Grengarm. Do not contradict me. I know I am right. I wouldn't think of it, not ever. Her voice fell. Such swords were forged in the Elder Time. The Overkinds visited Mithgarther more often then and taught your smiths that you might defend your world from the Angerborn. No doubt you know all that. I shook my head. It is so. The first pair of tongs was cast down to fall at the feet of Wieland, 
and with them a mass of white-hot steel. Six brands Wieland made, and six broke. The seventh eternity he could not break. Nor can the strength of the Angerborn bend that blade, nor the fire of Grengarm draw its temper. It is haunted, and commands the ghosts who bore it. She stopped to look into my eyes. I have done an ill thing, perhaps, by telling you. I'll get it, I told her, if you'll let me go after it. Slowly, she nodded. Just the thought of it had grabbed me the way nothing else ever has except Desiree herself, and I said, Then I'll get it or die trying. I know. You will try to wrest it from the dragon. Suppose I were to beg you not to. Then I wouldn't. Is that true? She bent over me. As true as I can make it? Just so, she sighed. You would be a lesser man after that, and your love would mean little to me. I looked up, crazy with hope. Does it mean a lot now? More than you can know, Abel. Seek eternity. But never forget me wholly. I couldn't. So men say, yet many have forsaken me. When the wind moans in the chimney, O oh my lover, go into the wood. There you will find me crying for the lovers I have lost. Trembling, the boy Taug came forward. Don't send him after that sword, elf queen, Desiree laughed. You fear he will make you go too? Taug shook his head. I'm afraid he won't let me come. Listen to that. Will you, Abel? No, I said. When we get out of here, I'm going to send him back to his mother. See? Taug reached toward Desiree, though he did not dare touch her. More than both of you together, she straightened up. Will you obey, Abel? In anything, I swear. In that case, I have things to say to this boy, though he will have nothing to say to me. You need not fear he will return a man. There will be no such transformation. She raised her sword and struck my shoulders with the flat of its blade. Surprising me. Arise, Sir Abel, my own true knight. A step or two, and she had vanished among tall ferns as green as she. Like a dog too fearful to disobey, Tau hurried after her and vanished too. I waited, not at all sure either would come back. The time passed slowly, and I found out that my new big body was tired enough to die. I sat walked up and down, and sat again. For a while I tried to find two trees of the same kind. All were large, and all were very old, for Aelfris, as I know now, is not a place in which trees are fouled. Each had its own manner of growth, and leaves of its own color and shape. I found one with pink bark, and another whose bark was purple. White bark, both smooth and rough, was common among them. Leaves were red and yellow, a hundred shades of green, and one tree was leafless, having green bark in place of leaves, bark that hung loose in folds and drapes, so that it got more exposure to the light. Since that time alone in a forest of Aelfris, it has always seemed to me that the spiny orange must have come from there, as I said earlier, its seed carried by an elf, or, more probably, by some other human being as forlorn as I was, returning to his own world. However that may be, I took the last of my seeds from the pouch at my belt and planted it in a glade I found, a place of silence and surpassing beauty. Whether it sprouted and took root, I cannot say. In that glade I paused at my planting to look up and saw the comings and goings of men, women, children, and many animals. Not each step each took, but the greater movements of their days. A man ploughed a field while I blinked, and returned home tired, and chancing to look in through his own window, saw the love his wife gave another. Too exhausted to be angry, he feigned not to have seen, and sat by her fire, and when his wife hurried out, looking like a dirty bed and full of lies, he asked for his supper and kept quiet. 
As I finished planting the seed, I thought about that, and it seemed to me that the things I had seen in the sky of Alfris were like the things my bowstring showed in dreams. I had unstrung my bow, the way you do, but I strung it again and held it up so I could study my string against that sky. But Parka's little string vanished into the great gray sky, so that I could not make out its line. I did not understand that then, and do not understand it now, but it is what I saw. When I had tamped earth over the seed, I would have gone back to the spot where Desiree had left me if I could. Unable to find it, I wandered in circles, or at least in what I hoped were circles, looking for it. Soon it seemed to me that the air got darker with every step I took. I found a sheltered spot, lay down to rest, and slept. I woke from terrible dreams of death to the music of wolves. Bow in hand, I made my way among the trees, then paused to shout, Desiree! At once an answering voice called, Here, here. I hurried toward it, feeling my way with my bow, entered a starlit clearing, and was embraced with one arm by a woman who clasped an infant in the other, a little woman who rushed to me weeping. Volley? Aren't you Volley? And then, I'm so sorry, did Seeksneet send you? It was a moment before I understood. When I did, I said, A gallant knight sent me to find you, Desira. His name is Sir Ravd, and he was concerned for you. So am I, if you are out here alone. All alone except for Osar, she told me, and held her baby up so I could see him. Seek's neat told you to hide in this forest? She nodded and cried. Did he say why? She shook her head violently. Only to hide. So I hid and hid all day and all night. There was nothing to eat, and after the first day I wanted to go back, but... I understand. I took her elbow as gently as I could and led her forward although I had no idea where we were or where we might be going. You tried to find your way back to Glenadam and got lost. Ye yes a wolf howled as she spoke, and she shuddered. You don't have to be afraid of them. They're after fawns and the new calves of the forest cattle. They won't dare attack as long as I'm with you. I'm a knight, too. I'm Sir Abel. She huddled closer. At dawn we found a path and in the first long beams of the rising sun I recognized it. We're not far from Bold Berthold's hut, I told Desira. We'll go there, and even if Bold Berthold has nothing for us, you and Osar can sit by his fire while I hunt. Looking down at Osar, I saw he was at her breast, and asked if she had milk. Yes, but I don't know if it will last. I'm awfully thirsty and I haven't eaten. Just some gooseberries. We both drank deep at the crossing of the griffin, and I shot a deer not a hundred strides after it, and merrily we came to bold Berthold's hut. He welcomed us and said he had thought, because of the wound that he had gotten from the Angerborn, that I was much too young to be his brother. Now he was glad to see I was as old as I ought to be, and bigger than I ought to be too. I was much larger than he was, and felt sure he was getting well at last. There was mead and venison, that some people would call tough, although we did not, and the last hoarded nuts to crack. Bold Berthold played with little Osar and talked about how life had been when his brother was no bigger than Osar, and he himself, as he put it, only a stripling. In the morning Desira begged to stay one more day. She was exhausted, her feet still hurt, and I, knowing how long our return to Glenadam was likely to be, said it would be all right. I made myself new arrows that day, four for which I already had steel heads, and four more that I hoped to get heads for from the smith in her village. We slept under deerskins at Bold Berthold's, and she crept under mine that night when Osar and Bold Berthold were asleep. I did not betray Desiree although I know Desira expected me to. But I put my arms around her and kissed her once or twice. That was what she wanted mostly, to be loved by somebody strong who would not hurt her. 
Next day we stayed too because I wanted to try my new arrows and hoped to get something bold Berthold could eat when we were gone. The day after that we did not go because it rained. As we sat around the fire, singing all the songs we knew and talking when we felt like it, I said something about your mother and mine, Ben, and bold Berthold hugged me and cried. I had already started to wonder if America had ever been real and not trust the life I remembered there with you, school and the cabin, my Mac and all that, and this made it worse. I lay down, and to tell the truth I pretended I was asleep, wondering if I was not really bold Berthold's brother Abel. I was almost asleep when I heard Desira say, I was all alone out there, and he came from nowhere calling me. He'd been with the Queen of the Wood. That's what he said. Bold Berthold muttered, I? He calls himself a knight, but his bowstring talks to him in the dark, and he talks while he's sleeping. He's really a wizard, isn't he? A mighty wizard. I see it every time I look into his face. He's a man like I was once, Bold Berthold said, and better than I was, and my brother. Go to sleep. So we slept, all four of us, until I woke up thinking that Desiree had called me. I got up as quietly as I could, slipped out, and wandered through the rain and the mist calling for her. I saw strange faces peer up at me from the swirling waters of the griffin, and from a dozen ring-marked forest pools. More peeped from behind bushes, or looked down from the leaves of trees, faces that might have come in a flying saucer green, brown, black, or fiery. Glass faces, too, and faces whiter than snow. Once I nearly shot a brown doe that got all smoky and turned into a long-legged girl, and many times I heard the howls of wolves, and once the nearer baying of something that was never a wolf. But Desiree, the green woman I love, I never found. Chapter 10. Frost Days had passed while Taug and I had knelt in Aelfris. Now weeks slipped by, while Desira, her baby, and I remained with bold Berthold. I hunted and he trapped, for he was clever at making snares. Desira swept and cleaned, skinned the game we got, stretched and tanned the hides, cooked and played with Osar. We were not husband and wife, but I might have had her, I think, at any time, and no passerby, had there been any, would have guessed that we were not. Seek's neat had treated her badly, and had beaten her more than once while she was carrying their child, so that she had been in terror of a miscarriage. Moreover, he had been in league with the outlaws, just as Ravd had been told, and the longer she was separated from him, the less eager she was to go back to him. I learned a whole lot about them just by listening to her, for she knew much more than she believed she knew. I hoped for an opportunity to tell Ravd all that I had learned, though I never saw him and had no way of knowing whether he and Svan were nearby or back in his beloved manor of Red Hall. There came a morning, fine and sunny, on which the air was touched with something new. As I prowled the wood, a leaf, a single leaf, the broad leaf of a maple fell at my feet. I picked it up, I still remember this very clearly, and examined it, and though largely green, it was touched with red and gold. Summer was over, fall had come, and it would have been foolish not to plan for it. First came the need to store food, and, if we could, to buy more. We could take our hides to Uringsmouth this time. The trip would be longer, but we might get a better price, and might not be cheated. We could buy flour, salt, and hard bread, cheese, and dried beans there, but we would need more meat to smoke, and more hides to sell. The nuts would ripen soon, beech nuts, chestnuts, and walnuts. Bold Berthold had taught me that we could even eat acorns if they were properly prepared, and it would be smart to lay in as many nuts of all kinds as we could manage. Second, Desira. If she wanted to go back to Glenadam at all, 
She would have to do it now. Traveling with a baby would be hard enough. Traveling with one in winter. I began to hunt in the direction of Glenadam, something I did not do very often, telling myself it would serve two purposes. If I got game, well and good, but even if I did not, I would refresh my memory on the paths and turnings. I was near the Uring when I saw a head with a face that looked almost human above some little trees. Its glaring eyes swept over me, leaving me paralyzed, too frightened to run and too frightened to hide. In half a minute, the whole monster came into view. I am going to have to talk about the Angerborn a lot, so let me describe this one to stand for his whole tribe. Imagine the most heavily built man you can, a man with big feet and thick ankles, massive legs and broad hips, a great swag belly, a barrel chest, and enormous shoulders. Idden perched on King Gilling's shoulder the way she might have sat on a bench. Of course, Idden was a bit under average size. Top the shoulders with a head too big for them. Close set eyes too big for the sweating face. Eyes so light colored they seem to have no color at all, with pupils so tiny I could not see them. A big splayed nose with nostrils you could have shoved both your fists in, a ragged beard that had never been trimmed or even washed, and a mouth from ear to ear. Stained tusks too big and crooked for the thin black lips to cover. When you have imagined a man like that and fixed his appearance in your mind, take away his humanity. Crocodiles are not any less human than the Angerborn. They are never loved, neither by us, nor by their own kind, nor by any animal. Desiree probably knows what it is in people, in elf, in dogs and horses, and even houses, manors, and castles, that makes it possible for somebody to love them. But whatever it is, it is not in the Angerborn, and they know it. I think that was why Theazi built the room I will tell you about later. Now that you have stripped all humanity away from the figure you thought of as a man, replacing it with nothing at all, imagine it far larger than the biggest man you have ever seen, so big that a tall man riding a large horse comes no higher than its waist. Think about the stink of him, and the great, slow, thudding steps, steps that shake the ground and eat up whole miles the way yours take you from our door to the corner. When you have thought of all that, you ought to have a picture of the Angerborn that will do for the rest of the things I have to tell you. But remember that it is not quite true that the Angerborn have claws instead of fingernails and ears too big for their heads, that their hands and arms, backs, chests, and legs are covered with hair the color of new rope, and that in the flesh they are worse than any picture could show. As soon as I could... I ran. I ought to have put a couple arrows in its eyes. I know that now, but I did not know it then, and seeing it the way I had, with no warning, was a jolt. I do not think I ever really believed Bold Berthold the way I should have. No matter what he said about them, I kept thinking of them as about eight feet tall. But Gila was as big as that, and her brother was a head taller than she was. They were half-breeds, and real Angerborn call people like that mice. Gila was not all that bad-looking, either, once I got used to her size. I smelled the smoke before I ever saw the place where bold Berthold's hut had been. It was the smell of burned leather, a lot different from wood smoke. As soon as I got wind of it, I knew I was too late. I had come to tell him that there were Angerborn around, and I was going to try to get him to hide, and going to hide Desira and her baby in a place I knew where there were big thorn bushes all around. But when I smelled burning leather, I thought the Angerborn had been there already. After that I found some footprints, and knew it had not been Angerborn after all. They were human-sized, made by feet in boots, feet turned in for one pair. After that I heard Osar crying, I looked for him and found his mother, dead. 
she was still holding him. I never found out why Seeksneet had not killed him too. He had hit Desire in the head with a war axe, and left his little son there to die. But he had not killed him. I suppose he lacked the courage. People can be funny like that. I had to pry Asar out of her hands, and I kept saying, You have to let him go now, Desira. I knew it did no good, but I kept saying it just the same. I can be funny too, I guess. You have to let him go. I tried to keep my eyes on her hands and not look at her face. Right after that, Asar and I found the place where bold Bertold's hut had been. They had taken what they wanted and burned the rest, a circle of smoking ash in the wild violets that had stopped blooming while it was still spring. I took off Asar's diaper and cleaned him up as well as I could with river water and wrapped him in a deer skin that had only burned at one edge. I looked everywhere for bold Berthold's body, but I never found it. I wanted to bury Desira, but there was nothing to dig with. Eventually I cut a big stick and whittled it flat at the wide end. There was a stub I could put my foot on, and I dug a shallow little grave down by the griffin with that, and covered her up and piled stones from the river on her. I made a little cross by tying two sticks together to mark the grave. It is probably the only grave marked with a cross in Mythgarther. It was pretty late by then, but I started for Glenadam anyway. I had nothing but water to give little Osar, and I knew I had to get him to somebody who had cow's milk or goat's milk in a hurry. Besides, I thought I might find bold Berthold in Glenadam. I wanted to find Seeksneet, too, and kill him. That night, when it was so dark we had to stop, I heard something that was not a wolf howling at the moon. I knew it wasn't a wolf, and I knew it was big, but I had no idea then what it was. Here is something I cannot explain. I am tempted to leave it out altogether, but if I leave out everything I cannot explain, I will be leaving out so much you will get no idea of what it is like here or what my life has been like since I came here. One was the doe. I saw a doe and a fawn the next day, and I was hungry, and I knew I had better get some meat and cook it. For me, because I was getting weak, and so I could chew some up good and give it to little Osar before he starved to death. He had not had anything but water since his father killed his mother. So when I saw the doe, I knew that I ought to shoot her or the fawn, but I remembered the brown girl, and somehow I knew this was her again, and I could not do it. I found blackberries instead and mashed them and gave them to Asar, but he spit them up. I had been hoping to get to Glenadam before night. We did not, and I think I knew we would not. Glenadam was an easy two days from where bold Berthold's hut had been, but I had not had two days, only three or four hours the first day, and a day after that, and Asar had slowed me down. So we camped again, and I could see he was getting weak. I was too a little, and although I had eaten all the blackberries I could find, I was hungry enough to eat bark. I wanted to go out looking for something to eat, but I knew it was a waste of time in the dark, and the best thing for us to do was sleep if we could, and hope no bear or wolf found us and get to Glenadam as fast as we could in the morning. Chapter 11 Gilf Sir Abel? I sat up, suddenly wide awake, shivered, and rubbed my eyes. A north wind was in the treetops, and there was a full moon that seemed almost as bright as the sun, with no warmth at all in it. I stared up at it, the way you do sometimes and I thought I saw a castle floating in front of it, a castle with walls and towers sticking up out of all six sides, merland walls and pointed towers with long dark pennants streaming from them. This is something else I cannot explain, although I did it myself. Desire was dead, Asar was likely to die, and bold Berthold was gone, and all that hit me then, harder than it ever had before. I did not know who owned that castle that had brought me here, or why I ought to ask for anything from him. 
But I raised my arms and shouted for justice, not just once, but maybe twenty times. And when I finally stopped and put some more wood on our little fire, I heard somebody say, Sir Abel? There was nobody there but Osar, and Osar was too young to talk, starved and worn out and sound asleep. I picked him up and told him we were leaving, night or not. With the moon as bright as it was, I knew I could follow the path, and maybe three or four more hours would get us to Glenadam. Just as we started out, a little voice right behind me said, Sir Abel? I turned as fast as I could. Getting big as suddenly as I had made me clumsy, and I still was not entirely over that. I was pretty fast just the same, and there was nobody. There is a lamb. This time I did not look. There's a lamb, repeated the little voice. It sounded as if he were right in back of me. Please, I said. If you're afraid of me, I won't hurt you. If you want to hurt me, just don't hurt the baby. Upstream? A wolf dropped it, and we thought... We hope... I was trotting upstream already with my bow in one hand and Osar in the other. I found the wolf first, just about tripping over it in spite of the moonlight. If there was an arrow in it, I couldn't see it. I laid Osar down and felt around. No arrow, but its throat was torn. Hoping that the person who had told me about it had come with me, I said, We could eat this, but the lamb would be better. Where is it? There was no reply. I picked up Osar, stood up, and started looking for it. It was only a dozen steps away, just harder to see than the wolf because it was smaller. I put it behind my neck the way I did when I killed a deer and carried it back to our fire. That had almost gone out, and by the time I had built it back up and skinned the lamb, the sky was getting light. There is something we have to give you. Without looking around, I said, You've already given me a lot. He is rather large, the speaker coughed. But not valuable. I do not mean valuable. Well, he is, but not like gold or jewels, nothing like that. I repeated that he did not have to give me anything. Not only me, all of us, our whole clan. I am our spokesman. A new voice said, And I am our spokeswoman. Nobody appointed you, the first protested. I did. We want to make it plain that it is not only the woodwives, just as it is not only the woodwives in the wood. We are in this too along with them, and we are not powerless. Well said. Thank you. Not powerless no matter what anybody says. We do not have to hide either. Be careful. He has seen me twice, and he did not shoot either time, so what are we frightened of? Suppose he does not like it. He is too polite to give it back. Well, it is of the best breeding, a whelp from the Valfather's own pack. I froze. What can you tell me about him? Nothing. That was the male voice I had first heard. Nothing at all, really. This was the female voice. You know much more about him than we do. A lot of you think him the Most High God. Thus they know less. We cannot remain after sunrise, you know. I said... Bold Berthold says he's master of the flying castle, and it's in Sky. Really? We have never seen it, the male speaker cleared his throat. Besides, we wish not to talk about it. Here, Gilf. Here, boy. What do you want to do, hide behind him? If necessary, yes. Sit. Good boy. I said, may I look around? I won't hurt anyone. Did I not say you could? She was tall. So slender, she seemed like a collection of flexible sticks about the color of milk chocolate. He was a lot shorter, brown, too, with an enormous nose and beady eyes. But at first I did not see him all because of the dog. It was the biggest dog I ever saw, very dark brown, with a white blaze on its big chest, and smiling. You know how dogs smile? It had soft ears that hung down, a head as big as a bull's. I can take care of myself eyes, and a mouth I could have put my whole head in. This is Gilf, 
For a minute I thought the dog was talking, but it was the male voice coming from behind him. The brown woman said, He is a puppy, really. But he can, you know. Would you like us to take care of the baby? We will have time on our hands now, you know. The owner of the male voice peeped cautiously around Gilf as he spoke. He was terribly ugly. It is not as if we have never raised your children before. I will do the work, the brown woman said, and he will take the credit. The sun will be up any moment. I said, you'll feed him and, and educate him, the brown woman said firmly. You shall see. Only not soon. He will be an Alfris. Well, so will he. I wish I could say why his saying that made me decide, but it did. Partly I was thinking that if I left Osar and Glenadan, Seeksneet might kill him when I was gone. Partly I was thinking of something I could not remember, something I knew even if I could not remember it. Take him, I said. She did, cradling him in her arms and crooning to him. Immediately both Eilf began backing away. Instead of sloping up, the river bank was sloping down, and they went down that slope into a mist. Have no fear, the brown woman called. I will teach him all about you. About Gilf, the owner of the male voice said. It happens all the time. After a storm, someone finds such whelps. As we did, the brown woman added. But they are his. We are to take care of them until he whistles, which we have. They were gone, and little Osar with them, and the river bank sloped up normally again. I was looking at the dog, I suppose because there was nothing else left to look at. Those were Bodachan, weren't they? Earth Aelf? He seemed to nod, and I grinned at him. Well, I'm an Earth man. See how brown my arms are? It shouldn't be too much of a change for you. He nodded again, this time unmistakably, and I said, You're a real smart dog, aren't you? He nodded and smiled. Were you really the Valfathers? I think that's what they said. He nodded the same way he had before. I see. Somebody's trained you to nod when you hear a question. Is there any question that wouldn't make you nod? As I expected, he nodded to that too. He also looked inquiringly at the lamb I had skinned, and then back at me, cocking his head. You're right, I ought to cook that. I'll give you some meat and all the bones, okay? Of course he nodded. In a few minutes more, I had a whole leg of lamb roasting on a pointed stick. It was not until I smelled it that I found out how hungry I was. My mouth watered, and it seemed to me I had never smelled anything as good as it was going to be. The dog came closer, lying down next to me. I said, Gilf, is that your name? He nodded as if he had understood every word. You're a hunting dog, or that's what it sounded like. What do you hunt? He nuzzled me as if to say, you. What? Me? Really? He nodded. You're putting me on. Eyeing the sizzling meat, he licked his lips. His tongue was day-glow pink in the firelight, and about as wide as my hand. I'll give you some, but we'll both have to wait before we eat any. It'll be very hot. I took it from the fire while I was talking to him. You can cook meat more if it needs it, but if you cook it too much, you cannot cook it less. When it was clear of the fire, I petted the big dog that had become mine so fast. His flat brown coat was soft and thicker than it looked. You'll be nice to sleep with on cold nights, I told him. He nodded and licked my knee. Big as it was and rough as it was, his tongue was warm and friendly. When we're through eating, we'll go to Glenadam. I want to find Seeksneed and kill him if I can. Besides, Taug may be back home by now. I hope so. We'll see about that. If you stay with me, you're my dog till the Valfather comes for you. If you don't, you're not but I wish you luck just the same. I touched the meat and licked my fingers, then waved it around on its stick to cool it. Are you as hungry as I am? He nodded, and I noticed he was drooling quite a bit. You know, I've 
been wondering what killed that wolf. That was dumb of me, with the answer lying right next to me. It was you. You don't have to nod, Gilf, I know it was. He nodded anyway. Then you left the lamb for me instead of eating it yourself. Maybe the brown girl had something to do with it, but it was nice of you anyhow. I tore the lower part of the lamb's leg from the upper and gave it to him. He held it down with his forepaws, the way dogs do, and tore it with teeth that would have surprised me in a lion's mouth. Seeing them, I wondered why the wolf had not dropped the lamb and run. Well, how is it? I asked him. And he grunted, Good. Chapter 12 Old Man Taug Glenadam looked just about the same. There was a kid in the street who tried to beat it when he saw Gilf and me, but Gilf headed him off, and I caught him. Is your name Vay? He looked scared and shook his head. He was quite a bit younger than I used to be, if you know what I mean. You know him, though? He nodded, although I could see he did not want to. Don't gape at me. You've seen strangers before. Not nobody big as you. My name's Sir Abel, I told him. And you and me will get along much better if you use it. Say, yes, Sir Abel. Yes, Sir Abel. Thanks. I want you to find Vay for me. Tell him I'll be at Taug's house, and I've got to talk to him. Gilf sniffed the kid's face, and he shook like jello. Tell him I'm no enemy. I'm not going to hurt him, and neither is my dog here. I let him go. Now go find him, and tell him what I told you. I, um... Ah, uh, the kid said, then he managed to add something more that might have been Sir Abel. Out with it if it's important. If it isn't, find Vay and tell him. The kid touched his chest with a grimy finger and bobbed his head. You are Vay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I made him come with me, saying I wanted to talk to him and Ulfa together. The house was right down the street. I rapped the door with my bow and grabbed the father by the front of his dirty shirt when he answered it, shook him as I pushed him in, and ducked under the lintel. Where's your daughter? She must have heard me because she looked in from one of the little rooms in back. I wished her good morning. Get your mother, please, and both of you sit down. Her father's hand was flirting with the hilt of a big knife. I saw it and shook him hard. If you pull that, I'll kill you. He scowled, and I was tempted to knock him down again. I shoved him down on a bench in front of the fire instead. I made Vay sit with him, and got Ulfa and her mother on a couple of stools. Now then, I sat on the table. Ulfa, I took your brother with me the last time I was here. Maybe your father told you. She nodded, looking scared. I don't have him anymore. Desiree took him. I doubt that she's going to hurt him, but I have no idea how long she'll keep him. She didn't say what she wanted with him. You may see him again today. You may never see him again. And I have no way of telling which way it might go. If I see her, I'll ask about him. That's all I can do. I waited for one of them to talk, stroking Gilf's head but keeping my eyes on them. After a minute or two, I said, I'm sure all of you have questions. Probably I can't answer them, but I'll listen and answer if I can. Ulfa? Her chin went up. How long was he with you? Less than a day. We were in Aelfris for part of it, and it's not easy to tell how long things take there, but a little less than a day should be about right. Did you hurt him? I twisted his arms enough to make him squeal once when he wouldn't obey, but I did no permanent damage, neither did anybody else while we were together. I took a long look at Ulfa's mother and decided she was not the kind to speak to a scary stranger. Her husband said, He's in Elfris? I don't know where he is. That's where he was the last time I saw him. He may have come back here, to this world, or planet, or whatever you call it. I don't know. As you can see, I was thinking then that Mythgarther was probably not just some other country. For one thing, nobody called the country Mythgarther. The country was Celadon. Another thing was that I was pretty sure that other countries on Earth did not have Elf. I felt like I would have heard about them. But there was a lot against that idea, too. One was that the moon in Mythgarther looked exactly like ours, and if the stars were different, I could not tell it. 
the Big Dipper was still there, and the North Star and some other things I was really sure of. About then Ulfa said, You let Desiree take him. It was not a question. I wouldn't have stopped her if I could, I told Ulfa. And I couldn't if I'd wanted to. Yeah, I let her take him. Will you try to get him back? He's my brother. If I can, sure. Now I've got questions of my own for all of you. Is Seeks Neat here? By here I mean in this village or near it right now. Ulfa's father shook his head. Out looking for his wife. He found her. That's why I'm here. Ulfa said, What happened? Very softly. I think she guessed. I'll tell you in a minute. First I want to tell you about Osar. I want to tell you, that's Ulfa and Ve, particularly. Osar's in Aelfris, too, and I put him there, or I pretty much did. I left him with the Bodichon, the little brown elf. My brother, that was what I said, used to help them sometimes, and they used to help him. He said they were nice and pretty harmless unless you got them mad. Anyway, they wanted Osar and said they'd take care of him, and I had no milk to give him and no food he'd keep down. So I gave him to them. Nobody said anything. Time goes slower in Alfris, so he might show up again in twenty years, still a little kid. It could happen. If it does, I want you to remember that he's Desira's son just the same, and look after him. I made all four of them promise they would. Then I said, Seeksneet killed Osar's mother, and I'm going to kill Seeksneet for it if I can. But maybe I can't, and maybe he'll be here when Osar comes back. Tell him Osar's been nursed by the elf, and they're likely to get even for anything Seeksneet does to him. That may help. I hope so. Ulfa's mother spoke. I think it was the only time she did. By the queen who took my son? She wanted to know. By desire I shook my head. One of the Badachan. I never learned her name. They, your dad sent you to get the outlaws the night I took Taug. It can't have taken you very long, since they were after us the same night. Where did you go? You mean my father? I... I'm not supposed to say, Sir Abel. Ulfa's father rasped. Tell him. I said... I can get it out of your father if I have to, Vey, but I might have to hurt him. It'll save a whole lot of trouble for you both if you tell me now. Vey gulped. He's not here, Sir Abel. Is he off looking for Seek's Neat's wife, too? I d don't know, Sir Abel. But you know where he told you to go to find the outlaws. You'd better tell me. Gilf growled, and Ulfa's father got Vey's arm. Your father's away he told Vey, and I'm here in his place. I say to tell him. It's on my head, not yours. To the cave the big cave. I nodded. I see. Do they stay there often? S some do, Sir Abel. One of the free companies. Where is it? The that way, Vey pointed. You t take the path to the little pond and go round it through the b beaches. Only turn at the big stump. Ulfa's father said, I'll show you. It took me by surprise. You'd make the boy do it and maybe get him killed. With me there'll be two men, if they're there. Gilf growled again louder this time. Dog thinks I might turn on you, Ulfa's father said. Maybe he will, but I won't. I thought about that. You sent Vey for the outlaws when I was here before. He shook his head. Volley did, not me. I wanted to kill you myself. He paused to stare at the floor, then looked up to meet my eyes. If I'd have believed you was a real knight, it'd have been different. Only I didn't, and thought me and my boy could do for you. And with Volley we could do it sure. Only he wanted to fetch Jer's free company and sent his boy, and I didn't stop him. You don't like them? Ulfa's father shook his head. Ulfa started to speak, but I raised a hand to silence her. What's your name? Taug, same as my boy. That's right, I remember now. What is it, Ulfa? She said, They make a lot of trouble and take anything they want. Sometimes they trade with us and sometimes they give us things, but it's mostly Seek's neat. 
the trading and the giving too. Old man Taug added, Valid like to be him. I see. I was still studying him and wishing I could see under that black beard. How many outlaws will there be in the cave, assuming they're still there? He shrugged. Five, could be. Could be ten. I asked they how many there had been when he went to fetch them. S seven, Sir Abel. Will you run to warn them as soon as we leave? You look fast, and you know the way. You may get there before we do. No, S Sir Abel. Not unless you say t to. I can't risk it. Ulfa, you and your mother will have to hold him here. Two hours should be enough. Will you do it? Ulfa's mother nodded. Ulfa herself said, I'll do it for your sake, Sir Abel, as well as my father's. He stood up. We can be there in a hour, or not much over. You broke my bill. I nodded. I still got my spear, though, and my knife, all right, if I take them. I said yes, and he went into one of the back rooms and returned with the spear his son Taug had dropped when he ran from the fight. Ulfa said, Tell us what happened to Desira. Don't matter, old man Taug muttered. Dead now. Well, Pa, I'd like to know when Sir Abel said he'd tell us. I nodded. Your brother and I went to Aelfris, as I said earlier. Desiree took him, and I returned alone. I wanted to find Desiree again, and called her name. Desira answered, thinking I had been sent to search for her. She and Asar had been hiding in the woods, probably for the second time, and maybe more than that. She was hungry and worn out, scared and lost. I should have taken her back here, but I didn't. For one thing, bold Bertholds was closer, and I thought I could get her something to eat there. For another, the outlaws had been after Taug and me. It seemed to me that there was more risk of their finding me here than at bold Bertholds' hut. I stroked Gilf's head and waited for one of them to speak until Ulfa said, I understand. Go on. She and Asar stayed there with bold Berthold and me. She was afraid of Seeksneet. He had treated her badly, and I believe she thought he might hurt Asar when they came home. A couple of days ago, I went out to hunt and saw one of the Angerborn. Old man Taug said, Where? By the river, quite away upstream. I thought I ought to warn bold Berthold and Desira, so I went back to the hut. It had been burned, and at first I thought the Angerborn had done it. I found footprints made by men our size, though. One had walked with his toes turned in. I thought that was Seek's neat, and I still do. I heard Osar crying, and found Desira's body. She'd been hit with an axe. That's easy to say. Easy for me to talk about in here, where I don't have to see her, but it was pretty horrible. I didn't like to look at it, and I don't like to think about it. They whispered something to Ulfa. She nodded and said, He's afraid to ask you, but he'd like to know why you took Desire to a hut if you're a knight. Aren't you supposed to have a big house? Because I'm not a wealthy one, I told Bay. Not yet, anyhow. But I'm a slow one sometimes, and way too fond of talking, which isn't the way a true knight ought to be. I put my hand on old man Taug's shoulder. Not so long ago you wanted to kill me. He nodded reluctantly. I broke your bill, and could have killed you with the head of it. I didn't. I appreciate that. You say you want to be my follower. I'll be loyal to you as long as you're loyal to me, but no longer. He nodded. I got it. We left after that, I motioning for him to come with us. Chapter 13 Sisura. Side by side we went down the village street, through fields and into the forest, and Gilf trotted ahead of us exploring every thicket and clump of brush before we reached it. Soon the path narrowed, and I went before old man Taug with an arrow at the knock, but even then Gilf ranged ahead of me. Near Glenadam the trees were small and mean, the better ones having been cut for lumber and firewood. Farther on they were bigger and older, though there were still stumps where men had felled them for timber. Beyond those lay the true forest, the mighty wood that stretches for hundreds of miles between the mountains of the sun and the sea, and between the mountains of the north and the southern plowlands. 
trees that had been old when no man had walked among them, trees thicker through than the biggest house in Uringsmouth, trees that push their pleasant green heads into sky and nod politely to the overkinds. Springs well from their roots, for in their quest for water those roots crack rocks deeper than the deepest well. Wild flowers, small ones so delicate you cannot see them without loving them, grow around the springs. The north sides of the trunks are covered with shining green moss thicker than bear fur. Every time I saw it, I thought of Desiree and wished she was with us. But my wishing did not bring her, not there or any place else, ever. To tell the truth, I was afraid I was going to choke up, so I said, now I see how it is that the air in Aelfris seems full of light. This air looks full of light, too. Ah, said old man Taug, this what Aelfris is like. No, I said. Aelfris is much more wonderful. The trees are bigger and of incredible kinds, strange, dangerous, or welcoming. The air doesn't just seem to shine. It really does. My boy can tell me about it, maybe, if I get him back. I asked whether he had given his son his name because he wanted his son to be like him, or because he wanted to be a boy again, and now I cannot help wondering what he thought of the young knight who came back to him wounded, and what each said to the other. Not long after that a white stag, already an antler, darted across the path. Gilf did not bay on its track, nor did I loose an arrow. We both felt, I would say, that it was not a stag to be hunted. Cloudbuck, said old man Taug. What do you mean by that? What they call him, said old man Taug, and nothing more. The land rose and fell, gently at first, as it does in the downs, then more abruptly, making hills like those among which I found desiree. The trees sank their roots in such stone as a dog, a boy, and a man might walk upon. At last we climbed a hill higher than any we had seen before, and its crest was bald except for wisps of grass. From its top I could make out to the north peaks white with snow. Not far now, old man Taug told me. Gilf whined and looked back at me. I knew he wanted to talk, but would not talk as long as old man Taug was with me. So I told old man Taug to go forward until he could no longer see us, then wait until we caught up with him. Naturally, he wanted to know why, but I told him to do it or return to his wife and daughter, and he did it. They know, Gilf cautioned me. The outlaws? He nodded. How do you know that? I asked him. Smell it. Thinking about what he said, I remembered your telling me dogs could smell fear. I asked Gilf if they were afraid, and he nodded again. How did they find out we were coming? He did not answer. As I got to know him better, I came to understand that it was the way he generally reacted when he did not know the answer to a question, or thought the question foolish. Probably they had lookouts. I would have, if I had been their captain. Thought you wouldn't catch up, old man Taug said when we overtook him. I told him we had wanted to see whether he would tell the outlaws about us. You and the dog did, I nodded. Kill it straight off, they will. I suppose you're right, if he finds them before we do. I seen a knight once that had one of them shirts of iron rings for his dog, even. I'll try to get one for Gilf if he wants one, I said, but from here on I want you to stay back with him and make him stay back with you. I'll go first. You only got eight arrows. I counted them. I asked how many he had and ordered him to stay well in back of me. After that I told Gilf to keep back and to keep old man Taug with him. Until now I have been recounting what I did and what others did and reconstructing what we said. Now I think I had better call a halt to that and explain how I felt then and later, and why I did what I did. I have been a general, sort of, and I can tell you that good generals march hard, but they do not march night and day. 
There was a time for marching, but also a time for halting and making camp. I went forward alone, as I told you, with my bow strung and an arrow already on the string, listening to the murmur of the many, many lives that made up that string, to the noise of the people, if I can say it like that, to life. Those men, women, and children who made up Parker's string knew nothing about me, nothing about my spiny orange bow, nothing about the arrow they would send whistling at some outlaw, but they sensed all of it. I think, sensing that their lives had been drawn tight and the battle was about to start, there was fear and excitement in their voices. They sat at their fires, or did the work they did each day, but they sensed that there was going to be a battle, and how it came out would depend on them. It was not much different for me. I knew that I would probably have to fight half a dozen men, and that they would have bows, too, with plenty of arrows, and swords, axes, and spears. If I turned right or left, I would save my life, and Gilf and the man with him would know nothing about it unless they turned, too, because they would both die when they got to the outlaws. If I turned back, they would know, but I would save their lives as well as mine. Saving the lives of the people with you is supposed to be the big thing, and killing the people who are trying to kill you and them does not really count. I went forward anyway. If you ever read this, you are going to say it was because of what Sir Ravd had said. You'll be mostly right. That was a lot of it. I wanted to be a knight. I wanted to be a knight more than I ever wanted to make the team or make the honor roll. I do not mean that I only wanted to call myself a knight the way I had been doing, or make other people call me one. I wanted to be the real thing. There were a couple of people on our team who were there because we could not find anybody good. There was a person on the honor roll who was there because his whole idea was to be there. He took gut courses, and if he did not get an A, he went to the teacher and argued and begged and maybe threatened a little until she raised his grade. The rest of us knew it, and I did not want to be a knight like that. This was the big test. This was one behind in the ninth, two out, and a man on second. It was not the way I would have chosen if I could have chosen, but you never get to choose. That was only the smallest part of it, though. Let me tell you the truth right here. I thought Bold Berthold was dead. I thought his body was some place around where his hut had been, and I just had not been able to find it. I might not have found Desiras if it had not been for Osar, and there would not have been anything like that to tell me where Bold Berthold was. If I had been there, I might have run away when the outlaws came, and I might have tried to get Bold Berthold to run away too, but I knew Bold Berthold pretty well by that time, and he would not have done it. The Angerborn had hurt him so much, it seemed like he should be dead. He could not stand up straight. His hands shook, and sometimes it was so bad he could hardly feed himself. He could be kind of crazy, forgetting things that had happened a little while ago, or remembering things that had never happened. He had been so sure I really was his brother Abel, that I had to answer to his name, and sometimes he had almost made me think it was true. And he thought I was still Abel when I came back older looking and bigger than he was. All that was true and there was more. But you could not scare him. The outlaws could have killed him, and I thought probably they had, but they would have to. They would not have scared him, and he would have protected Desira and Osar until he died. So bold Berthold was dead. He had taken me in when I had no place to go. He had loved me like his brother, and taught me everything he knew, how to farm, how to handle cattle and horses and sheep, how to hunt, and how to set snares, how you fought with a spear if a spear was all you had, and how you fought with a club if a club was all you had. He had not known a lot about shooting a bow, but he had taught me what he knew about that too, and he had understood when I practiced and practiced, and helped me every way he could. When you have to hit what you are aiming at if you want to eat, you get to be a pretty good shot pretty quickly. When you have got to hit it, or somebody who loves you will not eat either, you learn all the other stuff. How to get in a little closer, how to miss that branch without missing the deer, and how to follow a wounded deer even when it seems like it is hardly bleeding at all because sometimes they bleed inside. 
How to guess where it will go before it decides itself? Once I had a wounded deer go to a hiding place where I was hiding already, and get so close I could grab it and throw it down. I had learned all that fast, like I said, and I owed it to bold Berthold, every bit of it. The guys who killed him were going to have to deal with me, and I was not old or sick. There was Desira, too. I had never been in love with her. I loved Queen Desiree, always, and nobody else. And if you do not understand that, you will never understand all the things I am going to tell you at all, because that was always the main thing. Just about everything else changed as time went on. I made new friends and lost old ones. Sir Garvayan taught me how to use a sword, and Garseg showed me how I could be stronger and quicker than I had ever known. Quiet sometimes, or so fierce and wild that brave men who saw me ran. But that never changed. I loved Desiree, and nobody else but Desiree, and there was never a minute in the whole time when I would not have died for her. There was one other thing, and I'm going to talk about it too. I knew I was just a kid inside. Taug always did think that I was a man, even when I told him I was not. His father thought I was a man too, and so did Ulfa, younger than he was, but a man, and I was a lot bigger. I knew it was not true. It was just something Desiree had done, and I was really a kid. There were a lot of times when I wanted to cry. That time when I was coming up on those outlaws and looking for men hiding behind rocks or up in the trees like Elf with every step I took, that was one of them. There was another one when I really did cry, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. When you are a kid and you're in a tight place like I was, you cannot ever admit it because if you ever once admit it, everything is going to come loose. So I did not. I just kept going toward the big cave, one slow step at a time, and thinking, well, if they kill me, they kill me, and it will all be over. But the main thing was still desiree. That is how it has always been with me, all through going to Jotunland, and the river battle, and everything that happened. I loved her, and I wanted her so bad it tore me up. If you do not understand about desiree, it will not matter what you understand, because you will not understand a thing. The outlaws were between me and her, and anything that came between us was going to get shoved out of the way and stamped into the mud, and that was the way it always was, the whole time. Chapter 14 The Broken Sword I had told Gilf to keep way behind me, and I had told old man Taug to stay back too, but neither of them were very good at it. The first thing I knew old man Taug was right beside me, and scaring me so much I just about put an arrow through him, trying to whisper something. And when I turned around to see what it was, Gilf sneaked past me, not making hardly any noise, but going fast. See the black rock? Old man Taug pointed with his spear. When we get there... They'll see us, if they're there, and we'll see them. I pointed behind us. You see that round rock off to one side? He nodded. You go back there and wait, or I'll take away your spear and stick it up your nose. Get going. He did, and I stood there and watched until he was all the way to it. About then, Gilf came back. He did not say anything, but I knew from the way he looked and the way he had come back so fast that the outlaws were right up ahead. I made him get behind me, but he would not go back to the round rock. As soon as I started going forward again, he was right behind me. Pretty soon something happened that I had not figured on at all. One of them stood up on a big rock, maybe fifty paces ahead, and asked who I was and did I want peace or a fight. I pulled the arrow back to my ear and let it go so fast he had no time to duck down. It got him in the chest and went right through, and he fell off his big rock. I still had not seen the rest of them, but they had seen him, and I heard them yell. I ran to the black rock, because it looked like I could climb it, and went right up it like a squirrel, scared half to death the whole time, and thinking I was going to get an arrow in my back. When I got up on top, I lay down flat, sort of hugging the rock. They came around it. And it was not six or seven, like we had been talking about, it was more like twenty. They saw old man Taug standing back there where I had told him to wait, and they went for him, shouting and waving spears and swords. 
He dropped his spear and ran like two hares, and I got up fast, shot the last one, and got two in front of him, all in a lot less time than it takes me to write the words. The last had a bow and a quiver, and when I saw the quiver, I jumped. It was a long jump. When I think back, I am surprised I did not break a leg, but I did not, just landed with my feet together and fell down. I got his arrows and put them in my own quiver with the ones that did not have heads, and I pulled my arrow out of the dirt and rocks and put the knock to the string. That arrow had blood on it, and the feathers did not look as nice as I would have liked, but the point had not bent, and I knew it would still work. I took back my other arrows, too. One of the men was still alive, but I did not kill him. I could see he was going to die anyway, and pretty quickly, and I left him where he lay. The first had not been Sikh's neat, and neither of these were either. After that I followed the ones chasing old man Taug. I could still hear them yelling, so it was not hard. Pretty soon I found a man almost as big as I was with his head torn off. It was dead, but the fear was still on his face. He had been so scared when he died that I felt sorry for him, although I would have killed him myself. Maybe I ought to talk about that. Where you are, people kill people all the time, just like they do here. Then they talk like it was the worst thing in the world. Here, it is murder that is bad, and fighting is just fighting. Our way, people do not feel bad about doing what they had to do. Sir Waddett killed so many Austerlings once that it made him sick for a long time, but killing Austerlings never did bother me. How can you feel bad about killing somebody who would cook and eat you? Killing outlaws never bothered me either. When Gilf and I found old man Taug, they had hung him upside down and were throwing their knives at him. I told Gilf to get around on the other side where he could get them if they ran. When he did, I started shooting. They rushed me, and I ran back almost to where the round rock was, and got up on another rock. I stood up straight then and waited for them to catch up feeling Parka's string with my fingers. It seemed like it was no thicker than a thread, so thin it almost cut me, but it whispered beneath my fingers with a thousand tongues, and I knew that no matter what happened, it would never break. An outlaw came out of the woods that had a bow too. I let him shoot, and his arrow hit the rock right where I was standing. A couple more outlaws had come out of the trees by that time. I held my bow over my head and shouted, I am Sir Abel of the High Heart, because that was what Parka had said. Give up, swear you'll be loyal, and I promise not to hurt you. The one with the bow had another arrow out, but so did I. I shot him as he was pulling back the bowstring, and my arrow cut his string, went through him, and split a sapling behind him, and it scared the others halfway to Muspel. I was proud of that shot, and I still am. I have made others just about as good as that since, but I have never made a better one. Don't have to stay with me, old man Taug whispered when I had cut him down and freed his hands and feet. I told him I was going to anyway, and I cut up the shirt his daughter had made for me for bandages. They kill the dog? No, I said. Didn't you see him? He tried to smile. Guess I wasn't looking. Something troubling you? My dog. Afraid he won't come back? I was afraid he would, but I built a fire for us there. I could have carried old man Taug back to Glenadam, but it was getting dark, and I would have had to put him down fast if we had been jumped. It seemed to me that if he could rest overnight, he might be able to walk in the morning. That would be a big help. When the fire was burning pretty well, I brought him water, carrying it in his hat, and when he had drunk it, he said, you ought to go to their cave. Might be treasure in there. I doubted it, because it seemed to me that the outlaws had probably spent whatever they got as soon as they got it, but I promised we would go in the morning. Gilf came with two rabbits, fading away into the night as soon as he laid them down. I skinned them and rigged a spit of green shoots the way bold Bertold had showed me. When I had them cooking, old man Taug said, Your dog looked different. Firelight, maybe. No, I said. Still your dog? I nodded. One time you asked if I wanted my boy to grow up like me, 
or did I want to be a boy again myself? I wanted him to be like me, only now I'd sooner be like him. He sighed. I told him I had been a boy myself not very long ago. Know what you mean? When I found out I'd been turned into a man, I was scared, but after that I was so happy I jumped all around, yelling. Tonight I'd go back if I could. That's it. I told you how your son and I went to Elfris. We met Desiree there, and she took him. When I was a boy, I spent years in Elfris, but when I had gone, I couldn't remember what had happened there, and I looked the same way I had when I got there. All those years hadn't changed me at all. Happens, old man Taug muttered. But when I was there alone, when I was waiting around for Desiree to return with your son, some of it began to come back. I can't remember exactly what it was now, but I can remember remembering it. Do you know what I mean? And it was happy. I had been really, really happy there. You ought to have stayed and remembered more. I didn't mean to leave. But I think you may be wrong. Terrible things have been nibbling at the edges of my mind. Maybe that's why I went looking for Desiree. I wanted her to reassure me. To tell me everything was all right after all. A new voice said, I can't do that, but I can help nurse my father. I looked around. It was Ulfa. Old man Taug said, Followed us, didn't you? Thought you might. Ma couldn't keep you. I left while she was busy with Vey, Pa. I didn't even ask her. Ulfa turned to me. You frightened poor Vey half to death. I said I had not meant to. I had just wanted to scare Vey enough to make him do what I told him because I did not have any money, and I could not think of any other way to keep him from warning the outlaws. Kindness might have done it. I suppose. I do not think old man Taug had been listening, or at least not paying much attention, because right about then he said, Gold, Ulfa. Real gold. There's treasure in the cave, you'll see. Will Sir Abel let you share in it? I said, Yes, if there's any to share. Old man Taug said, I killed two out of Jer's company, Ulfa. Two! Believe that? She sighed and shook her head. I've been stumbling over bodies for... I don't know, Pa. It seems like half the night. If you only killed two, Sir Abel must have killed two score. I told her that Gilf had killed more than both of us. His dog, old man Taug explained. I killed and run and killed and run, and then they put an arrow in my leg, hung me on a tree. He cut me down, cut me loose, got water for me and everything. Tears spilled from the corners of old man Taug's eyes, soaking the matted hair that barred them from his ears. I said, you go off, you get that gold. He wouldn't go, stayed here with me. I turned the rabbits one last time and took them off the fire, waving them to help them cool. Neither Ulfa nor old man Taug spoke, but I saw the way they looked at them, and as soon as I could I tore off a hind leg and gave it to old man Taug, cautioning him that it was still hot. What about you, Ulfa? You must be hungry. She nodded, and I gave her the other hind leg. We were eating when she said, Don't you need money? I wiped my mouth on the back of my arm. Sure. I need it more than you or your father do. I have plenty of arrows now, and a really good bow. The knife I used to skin these rabbits and my dog. But I need everything else a knight ought to have. A charger to fight on, a good saddle horse to get from place to place, and a pack horse to carry all the stuff I haven't got. I tried to grin to show her it was not getting me down. Even a horse like that, a horse a knight wouldn't even get on, would cost a good deal, and I haven't got anything. Alpha nodded. I see. You remember Svan. You told me how well-dressed he was. He said one time that a charger like Blackmane costs as much as a good field. Svan didn't always tell the truth, but I don't think he was lying about that. And besides the three horses, I ought to have mail, a good shield, and five or six lances. Alpha nodded again. A manor for your lady. My lady has her own kingdom, but you're right. I don't own enough land to grow a turnip. 
It was not hard to smile that time, because I was thinking how nice it was to have two friends to talk to and something to eat, after all that had happened that day. A dagger like the one's nightswear would be nice, and maybe a battle-axe. That brought back Desira, with her hair full of blood. No, a club. A club with spikes would be good. But as for a manor or anything like that, I can't even think about it. If you were to sew me a new shirt, that would be more than enough to make me happy. I'll try. What about a sword? When I made your other shirt, that was what you said you needed. I shook my head. Someone's seeing to that. I don't think it would be smart for us to talk about it. When we had finished the second rabbit, we lay down to sleep. Alpha and old man Taug were soon snoring, but I was still awake when Gilf returned with a hind in his jaws, and I lay awake another hour listening to him breaking the bones. Dawn came. The light woke me, and I sat up rubbing my eyes. The gilf who lay beside me seemed an ordinary dark brown dog, just bigger than any other dog I had ever seen. We went to the outlaw's cave, walking very slowly because old man Taug could only limp along leaning on the shaft of his spear. Ravens had already been at the bodies of the dead outlaws we found, but Ulfa had brought a leather burse, and she dropped such silver and gold as she could get from them into it. It was not a very large burse, but by the time we reached the cave it was heavy. I suppose I could have done that if I had to, but I would not have liked it. I did not even like to look at them. I see now why people turn outlaw, I told her when she showed me how much she had. But if people can get that much by stealing from the kind of people you see around here, how much could a knight get from a good war? She smiled. A manor house, Sir Abel, and twenty farms. The elder Taug snorted. Pike head through the gut. At the mouth of the cave you could see the ashes of a lot of fires, bones, spoiled food, and empty wineskins were scattered all around. Farther in we found some heavy winter coats wrapped up in oiled parchment, and some other clothes that had just been thrown down and walked on. There were blankets, too, mostly rough forest wool, but thick and tight. Beyond those, there was a big jumble of silver platters and tumblers, some really good saddles and saddle blankets, harnesses of the best leather with copper or silver bosses, daggers, I took one, forty or fifty pairs of embroidered gloves, a hunting horn with a green velvet strap, and last of all, very hard to see because it was so dark back there, and it had fallen between a couple of stones, a broken sword. It was Ulfa who found that, but I was the one who carried it out of the cave to look at in the light. There was a gold lion's head on the pommel, and up against the guard the blade was stamped, Lot. When I saw that, I cried. Chapter 15 Pauk I need to get to Forseti, I told a sailor. Do you know if any of these ships are going there? I had already gone to Scour's house, but he was out on the boat, and Shaw had not recognized me and was afraid to talk to me. The sailor looked at me for a minute, then touched his cap. You try the western trader, sir. When he looked at me like that, I saw he was blind in one eye. The eyeball was still there, if you know what I mean, but it looked like the white part of a fried egg. What was more important, I liked the other one and how it looked. He was not scared of me, but he did not want to fight me or cheat me. I do not think anybody had looked at me like that since I had left the forest. I said, you're sure it's going to Forseti, to the town where Duke Martyr is? I don't know, sir, but it's the only un in port now it might. Depends on what they find here, and you'd be part of that, sir. I thought about that, and finally I said, I need your advice. If I give you a sealed for it, will you give me the best advice you can? He touched his cap again. And carry your bags aboard, sir. What do you want to know? How much I ought to pay to get this ship to take me to Forseti? He scratched his head. Depends, sir. Think I could see the color of that seal? I got out a seal and showed it to him. Going to sleep on deck, sir? 
I had slept outside a lot since I got to Mythgarther, sometimes with a fire and sometimes without, and I would have two blankets from the cave, so that would not have bothered me if I had not been carrying so much money. But Ulfa and Old Man Taug and I had sold things from the cave and split what they brought among us. My share was a lot. So I said I would have to have a room of my own, with a door that locked. If you was, I'd say three of them like you showed me would do it, sir, if you bargained em hard. Since you ain't, you got to find a officer what might share his cabin, sir, and take a look at it. I asked if they really had cabins on the ships, because I was thinking of our cabin back in America. Then I thought I saw one and pointed it out to him. There's a deckhouse, sir. Cabins is what you'd call rooms ashore, sir. Officers has em. Only sometimes there's two or three sleeps in one. Depends on the vessel, sir. I see. If I could find an officer who had a cabin by himself, he might share it? Aye, sir, if the price was right. How much, would you say? He looked thoughtful. For a good un, a couple of scepters would do it, most like, sir. For a bad un, maybe eight, ten seals, depending. Between em, he shrugged. A bit more, maybe a scepter. Going to bring your own rations, ain't you, sir? Should I? I had. Even if they say they'll feed you right, sir, it's good to have a bit over, ain't it? And you can always eat it after if there's any left. I saw the wisdom in that. Maybe you could tell me what I ought to take. Go with you and help you pick it out, sir. Carry for you, too, like I said. You a fight man, sir? You look it. I'm a knight, I said. I always said that because I knew I could never get people to believe me unless I believed it myself. I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart. He touched his cap. Pauk bad eye, sir, at your service. We joined hands, the way they do here, not shaking them, but just squeezing. His hand was as hard as wood, but mine was bigger and stronger. A fightin' man can get a better price, sir, cause of his help and protect the vessel, Pauk explained. Only I'd get a sword first, sir, if it was me. Thinking of desire, I shook my head. Gotten all ready back where you're staying, sir? No, I said. I'm not going to get one here, either. An axe, maybe. You know what I thought of as soon as I had said that, so I said, or something like that. I knew how dumb it sounded. There ain't none but Maury that's a good armorer in Nuring's mouth these days, sir, I can show you. Then let's go. I'll need food, too. Dried stuff, sir, and smoked. Apples is good, and we should be able to get them this time of year. Small beer to drink. That don't spile in the cask-like water, sir. Wine? Cruel snafflet, sir, unless you watch it day and night. Putting his thumb to his mouth, Puck pretended to drink. I said, you'd know all about that, I bet. Do it myself, you mean, sir, not I. As well as I could judge, his denial was entirely serious. Can I ask why you're bound for Forsetti, sir? Not that it's on my watch, just friendly like, sir. To take service with Duke Martyr if I can. He'll need another night and if he doesn't want me, he may be able to suggest somebody who might. Right there's Maury's, sir. Pauk pointed to a long dark shed from whose several chimneys smoke issued. You could get a good sword there. No. Or a axe, sir, or whatever you fancy. Did you see something, sir? I shook my head, not knowing whether I had or not. You jerked around like. I pretended I had not heard that and went into Maury's front room. It was big and dim, full of tables upon which weapons and armor were displayed. More covered every wall, swords, daggers, and knives of every kind, war axes and half axes, war hammers, morning stars, and studded flails, helms that covered the entire head, and helmets that left the face bare, hauberks, gauntlets, and other mail, buff coats of wild ox leather, burnies of brass-studded leather, gambesons of quilted canvas, and much more, far too much for me to name even if I knew all the names. Bundles of lances, pikes, spears, bills, and halberts stood in corners. Through a wide door at the other end of the room I could see two brawny men in leather aprons working at a forge, one holding a glowing brand with tongs while the other hammered it. 
After a time, an old man who had been watching them noticed us. A knight, I see. We are honored, sir. Abel of the High Heart, may I ask how you knew me for a knight, sir, by my clothes? The old man shook his head. By your bearing, Sir Abel, by the set of your shoulders particularly. I confess there are some called knights these days I wouldn't have known. He sighed. Knights used to guard the fords in my time. They'd help poor travelers and fight any other knight who wanted to cross. I said, I don't believe I've heard of that. It went out, oh, thirty years ago, but twas a fine custom while it lasted, for it weeded out the fakers. A good custom for me, because they'd bring me the swords and armor. Pauk chuckled. Claimed the salvage, did they, sir? Indeed they did, sailor, as is still done in nightly combat. The winner leaves the loser his clothes and a nag to ride home on. But he takes the arms and armor. The charger, if it lives as it generally does, he takes its tack as well, its saddle, its bridle, and the rest, a ransom to in many cases. Now if you want to buy something, I'll have my clerk take care of you. I'm with Sir Abel, his serving man like. Thing is, Master Maury, I want him to get a sword. He don't have none, and says he don't want none, so I steered him to you. I explained that I was expecting a sword from another source, and needed another weapon I could use until I got it. It ain't the same. The skipper of the western trader won't never believe you're a knight without you got a sword, sir. Maury said, Not all my swords are costly, Sir Abel. I can show you a fine arming sword with a good plain grip. I raised my hand to cut him off. Let's say I've sworn not to carry a sword. The next was hard to get out, but I managed it. An axe might be more useful on a ship anyway, isn't that right? Maury looked thoughtful. Does this oath preclude the use of a falchion? I've a very fine one just now. There isn't any oath. I made it up. I just wanted to make you and Pauk here understand how I feel. I... If I take a sword now, I won't ever get the one I'm hoping to get, and if I don't get that one, I won't see the person who might get it for me. So no swords, not any kind. Can't you show me some axes? What about that double-bitted one with the yellow tassel? There ain't no axe that's a sword, Pauk insisted. Maury's eyes gleamed under his shaggy brows. What about this? It had a long handle and a narrow blade. I picked it up and swung it over my head. A cutting edge on one side and a hammer on the other, so it's an axe and a mace too. If I say you're a knight and the skipper sees you with that, he'll laugh us both ashore. Maury laid his hand on my shoulder. Will you listen with patience, Sir Abel, to what an older man has to say? I am no knight, but I've had years of experience in these matters. I said that I would be glad to hear him, but that I did not want a sword. Nor will I ask you to take one. Hear me out, and I'll tell you of another weapon which, though not a sword, is as good in some respects and in others better. I nodded. Go on. Let me first address the utility of swords and axes. The axe is like the mace, in that it finds its best employment against heavy armor. It will split a shield, sometimes, in the hands of a man as strong as you are. But let a man in light armor, or a man in no armor, fight an axeman, and he will kill him inside a minute or two, if he has a good sword and knows the use of it. As for that war hammer, it would be valuable indeed on horseback against another rider. But for a man afoot, a man aboard a ship, for example, well, you might be better off with an oar or a handspike. Pauk grunted with satisfaction. Socially, too, your man is quite correct. The sword is preeminently the weapon of a man of gentle birth. A man who bears one, who meets another similarly armed, whom he thinks no gentleman, may challenge him, and so on. I tried to nod as if I had known it. May I introduce a hypothetical? Say for the sake of argument only that your man and I conspired to introduce a sword among your baggage, a sword so cleverly concealed that neither you nor anybody else could see it. What good would it be to you, do you think, 
when you boarded your ship? Not any. When I found it, I'd drop it in the water. Pauk groaned under his breath. Maury said patiently, Before you found it, Sir Abel. If I didn't know I had it, it couldn't be of use. Would not captain and crew acknowledge you a knight? I shrugged. They will, but not because of a sword they never saw. Now we come to it. It is the seeing of the sword, the perception of it, that matters, not the sword itself. Look here. Maury limped across the room, and from the table farthest from the door, picked up a richly trimmed scabbard of white ray skin, holding a weapon with a hilt of hammered steel. What have I here, Sir Abel? I knew there was some trick, but I was clueless about what it was. I said, it looks like a sword. It's on the short side, I'd say, and from the way you picked it up, it can't be very heavy. The blade's probably narrow. I waited for him to say something, and when he did not, I asked, How are you fooling me? Maury chuckled. As to its weight, I'm not as feeble as I may look to a man your age, and I've spent many a busy day forging blades. Pauk had gone to check it out. You're saying it ain't a sword at all. It is not. Maury carried the weapon, still sheathed, back to me. It's a mace, a mace of the Lotherings, who live where the sun sets. I doubt that there is another on this side of the sea. Will you draw it, Sir Abel? I did. The heavy steel blade was four-sided, only slightly wider than it was thick. Its edges had never been sharpened. When it came into my hands, Maury said, I thought it the strangest thing I'd ever seen. But I dug out an old great helm, one that was dented and had lost its clasp, but was still good and strong. I set that helm on the end of a post and tried the mace you're holding on it, and came away a believer. Two scepters weight in gold, if you want it. Seeing my expression, he amended his price. Or a scepter and ten seals, if you'll promise to come back and let me know how it served you. We'll take it, Pauk declared. Chapter 16 The Western Traitor This here's Sir Abel of the High Heart, Pauk explained to the mate of the Western Trader. Him and me's wanton passage to Forseti. The mate touched his forelock to me. You'd be wanting to share a cabin, sir? I said I would have to see the cabin first. The cold squall that had come into the harbor to announce autumn had made me pull up the hood of my new cloak already. Now a gust of rain wet it, and the western trader jerked at her cable, rolling and shuddering to let us know exactly how she felt. Follow me, sir. The mate turned away, starting down a steep little stair. I told Pout to go first, because I knew that if I left the open air I was going to be sick. For a minute or two I looked around the ship the reeling castles of brightly painted wood at the front and back, the deckhouse, the swaying masts, with long slanted poles to spread the sails that were bunched around them now, and the rest of it. My face felt hot, and I was glad the wind was cold. I knew I might throw up any minute, and I swore that I would make Pauk clean it up if I did, and kill him if he would not do it. Sir, it was him, naturally, looking up from the stairs. Trying to keep my bow dry, I said. I fiddled with the oiled leather bow case we had gotten for it. The cabin's a mite small, Pauk said. It was. With the mate, Pauk, and me in it, there was hardly room to turn around. This here's my bunk, sir. The mate seated himself on it, giving us a little more space. Up there'd be yours. The upper bunk looked dirty and emitted a sour smell over and above the reek that seemed to be everywhere under the main deck. Captain's cabin's right up there, the mate announced proudly. Except for that, this here's the best berth on the ship. Pauk had his back to the mate. He waggled one finger and winked. I said, somebody's been sleeping up here already. Who is it? Our second, sir. Nurse his name. If I'm going to be taking his bed, I ought to make my bargain with him. Pauk grinned approval. I've the say, sir, the mate sounded angry. As for bargaining, there won't be none. Two. I had made up my mind, and I cut him off. You're right, we're not making any kind of deal. 
I wouldn't sleep in here if you locked me in. Show me the captain's cabin. He'd have to do it himself, the mate sounded angrier than ever. Then let's go see him. There was an awkward silence until I realized that I would have to go out before Pauk and the mate could. I did, bumping my head on the top of the tiny doorway and turning sidewise to get my shoulders through it. The whole affair was awkward enough, and painful enough, that I forgot to be sick for a minute or two. Back on deck, the mate rapped, timidly I thought, on the captain's door while I took long breaths of cold salt air. Captain? There was no answer. I decided the gale had gotten worse, if anything. Cold rain slammed my face, and was very welcome there. Captain, sir, the mate rapped again a trifle louder. Be a long ton of money, Pauk whispered. The stern castle door opened. I glimpsed a middle-aged man's dirty face and bleary eyes before it closed again. You got her come back, the mate announced with great satisfaction. Come back tomorrow. I pushed him to one side and pounded on the door. When the captain opened it, his face red with rage, I shoved him backward and went in. After the mate's cabin, this one looked spacious indeed, a good four paces long and three wide, with a ceiling almost high enough and big windows on three sides. I pointed to one and said, Open that. The captain, who was naked, only stared. Pauk hastened to obey. I said, I see only one bed. Where will you sleep? You're a knight. The captain took trousers from the back of a chair screwed to the floor. Right. Sir Abel of the High Heart. I doubt it. The captain sat down on the cabin's one bed. I've never heard of you. You'd be smart to act as if you had, I told him. By that time I was really beginning to catch on to the way these people talk. You want to travel in my cabin, he snorted. That's what Magister Curl said. Right again, to Forsetti. If I permitted it, the captain seemed to weigh each word, it would cost you seven gold scepters. Good gold, too, paid in advance and not a copper farthing shy of the full seven. You'd sling your hammock over there, and by wind, rain, and sea, you'd have it out of my way each morning before breakfast. Curl had come in behind me by that time. He chuckled. The captain rose and buckled his belt. Otherwise I'd teach you, Sir Abel of the Shy Fart, how the authority of a captain is to be obeyed. As it is, I won't let you have it at any price. I give you as much time as it takes to make sail to clear my ship. From under his mattress he pulled a curved sword of Osterling make. Or we'll throw you in the bay. I grabbed his wrist with my left hand and got hold of the pommel with my right. Before I could wrench the sword away, a punch from Curl spun me half around. The sword came free. I ducked another punch and hit him in the chest. I still remember the sound of it, like a mallet pounding a tent stake. It gave me a moment to throw the captain's sword out the window. As soon as it was gone, he was on me, bellowing like a bull. That stopped the first time I hit him. He fell down, and I picked him up and shoved him head first out the window, catching hold of an ankle as it crossed the sill. Sir Abel, Sir Abel, I was looking down at the captain. A jokester whitecap had just washed his head. You wouldn't do this if you were me, Pauk. I'm helping him out. He was knocked cold, and the water will bring him back and make him feel better. I got his knife, Sir Abel. Mates, I mean. Had it in his belt, he did. Likely you didn't notice, sir. Sure I did. I took the knife and glanced at it. Give it back to him. It's his. Pauk looked dubious. Into the drink might be better, sir. He's having trouble getting his breath, sir. Only it won't last. He didn't try to stab me with it, I told Pauk, so I'll let him keep it. Put it in your back, sir, like as not. Curl gasped. N no We've got his word, Pauk. I took another look at the captain, who had started waving his arms and sputtering. A high-speed roll cracked his head against the side. His word is good enough for us. I looked around at the mate. Magister Curl! Still gasping, Curl contrived to say, Aye, sir. My baggage is out there where Pauk unloaded it. 
The boatman's there, too, waiting for his money. Pay him, and help Pauk carry it in here. Sir? Aye, aye, sir. Pauk was already out the cabin door. Curl struggled to his feet and followed him. When it had shut behind them, I pulled in the captain. Get up, I told him. I might have to hit you again. He tried and fell down. I picked him up and plumped him down on the table. Can you talk? I'm all right, just dizzy. It'll pass off. We'd better settle this before those two come back, I told him. I'm going to sleep in here alone until we get to Duke Martyr's city. He muttered, Aye, sir. That's another thing. Don't say sir to me. I've let Pauk do it, and just now your mate did it too. But you're going to say, Yes, Sir Abel. Every now and then you'd better say, Yes, Sir Abel of the high heart. When you do it, I'm going to listen really hard to the last two words. He did not answer, so I said, Make it plain you understand me, or you're going out that window again. Aye, aye, Sir Abel of the high heart. The captain straightened up. I understand you perfectly, Sir Abel of the high heart. Swell. I'll pay you three scepters for this room when we get to Forsetti. That's if I get the best food you've got, and you and your men treat me the way a knight ought to be treated. Make it clear you understand all that, too. Aye, Sir Abel of the high heart. Still shaky, he got up, holding on to the little table with both hands. It was screwed to the floor, like just about everything else. I understand you perfectly, Sir Abel of the high heart. If the food's not good, or you and your crew call me names behind my back, I'm going to start knocking money off those three scepters. I'll decide how much, and there was a tap on the door. Just a minute. I turned back to the captain. Do you understand what I've been telling you, about my deductions? Make it clear. I do, Sir Abel of the High Heart. You can count on me, Sir Abel. We'll see. I was feeling sicker than ever, and felt like I was sure to chuck. I'm going to move you out of here right now. Get all your stuff together. That means your clothes and personal things. Leave those blankets. Once you're out, there won't be anything to stop you from getting your crew together and giving out every kind of knife and stick you can find. He looked scared, and I was glad to see it. Only remember this. It won't be enough to tell them to jump me. You'll have to get out in front. I opened the door. Now beat it. When Pauk and Curl had brought my baggage, I chased them out too, pushing Pauk, he wanted to talk, right out the door and sliding the square iron bolt into the socket. After that, I was sick out the window, but when it was over and I had cleaned up, I felt better than I had since I got into the big rowboat that had ferried us out to the western trader. Before I go on, I ought to tell you a lot about boats and ships, which are different from boats, although I did not understand that then, and the coasting trade, and the high sea trade. But the truth is that I do not know a lot about those things. The western trader was a big ship to them. Only the biggest had three masts. In the summer, it went west, just like its name said, and traded among the islands there. But in winter, it just traded along the coast of Celadon, so it could duck into a port whenever the weather got too bad, and it tried to trade south. The Austerlings were to our east, but they followed the coast southwest and north, murdering and stealing. Duke and Diggin had tried to stop them, but they had killed him, and pulled down his castle. With him gone, they had looted and burned most of Erringsmouth. Chapter 17 At Anchor Next morning the ship rolled and pitched in pretty much the same way it had all night and the day before, but once I had hopped out of bed, there was a dream I wanted to get away from, I felt fine and was hungry enough to eat an old shoe. Looking out the windows, I could see we were still in the harbor, and the noises that had made me wake up showed that something heavy was being brought on board and was making a lot of trouble. There were bumps and rumbles and rattles, and bare feet running here and there, and a good deal of yelling. There was a squeaking noise, too, that I thought might be some kind of bird. What was better was the sunshine, and the way the wind blew, one of those warm fall winds that make you want to throw a football. 
I pretended I was, and I knew that with the arms and legs and shoulders I had now I could play for the Vikings. After that I got dressed and buckled on the foreign mace we had bought from Mori. It hung from a belt like a sword belt. I checked on my bow and quiver. They looked fine, but I decided I'd leave them in the cabin for now along with my boat cloak. When I had bad dreams, and I did just about every night, it was generally because of Parka's bowstring. It was in the bow case, and I had put that on the far side of the cabin, but I thought it might not have been far enough. Out on deck, crates and barrels and boxes were being unloaded from a square-prowed barge with forty men leaning on the oars. There was a slanted pole on the biggest mast for it, with a wheel at the end and a rope run through the wheel. When you had a good load on it, that wheel made more noise than a flock of gulls, squeaking and squealing. They pulled the things up that way, one at a time, swung them over the hatch, and let them down. Curl came running, touching his cap. Pauk was right in back of him, and when I saw him, I remembered I still owed him a seal. I hope the noise didn't bother you, Sir Abel, sir. Curl touched his cap all over again. We figured you was probably roused, sir, only we didn't mean to bother you. Would you be wanting breakfast, sir? I was still looking around, but I nodded. In your cabin, that'd be, sir? That meant I did not have to eat in there, the way I saw it. So I thought about it and said, I don't know much about boats like this, Magister Curl. He nodded, looking scared. You've got these wooden castles, one in front, and this one in the back that's really my room. That's right, sir, Sir Abel. To fight off of, sir, if we got to fight... That ends the forecastle, and this ends the stern castle, sir. Are the roofs flat? They look it. It seemed like I might have a pretty good view of the ship and the harbor from up there, and wind and sunshine, too. Aye, sir, Curl bobbed his head. It's where the ship steered from, sir, where the wheel is. Pauk added, That's where you ought to be, too, sir, and not down here. I nodded. Lead the way. I want to see it. Pauk led with Curl right in back of him. Some narrow steps they call the companionway led up to a solid deck with wooden walls, with square notches cut out of the walls to shoot arrows through or throw spears. That is what is called a battlement, and the broken wall I saw at Uring's mouth had them too, only that wall was stone. The steering wheel was on the stack. So was the lodestone, on a stand in front of the wheel. And so was the captain, drinking small beer and eating eggs and bacon, fresh bread and a salad made of radishes and shoots. He got up politely as soon as he saw me and said, A good morrow to you, Sir Abel of the High Heart. I said good morrow too. May I join you, captain? I haven't had breakfast. When he said yes, I told Pauk, I need to talk to you after I eat. Have they fed you? He touched his cap. Aye, sir, I ate. Then get me a chair and have a word with the cook. Right away the captain put in, Take mine, Sir Abel, a pleasure. So I did. Pauk said, I'll fetch another for the captain, if it's all right, sir. Only mate's got to tell cook, sir, and I judge he's gone off to already. Not very sure of himself, the captain said, If you're hungry, Sir Abel of the high heart, you might want to sample some of this. I was saving my greens for last, Sir Abel, and these two slices haven't been touched. I said I could wait. If you'd prefer to be alone, Sir Abel of the High Heart? I said no. I've got a lot of questions, and I want to ask them while I eat my breakfast and you finish yours. The crew doesn't need you for what they're doing now? Stowing cargo? The captain shook his head. Magister Curl can see to it as well as I could. But you've got a nicer cabin, or you did. The captain did not answer. You give the orders, and Curl does whatever you tell him to. What can you do that he can't? In all honesty, Sir Abel of the High Heart, he could make a stab at everything I do, and he might succeed with a good deal of it. I'm the better navigator, but Curl can navigate a bit. I flatter myself that I'm better at getting us goods to trade, and a better trader. I don't think Curl could show as good a profit, but he's a good seaman. I had asked that because of the dream. In the dream, I had been way down under the main deck. It had been pitch dark, 
but I had known somehow that our mother was not really dead at all. She was down there, tied up and gagged, so she could not make any noise, and if I could find her I could cut her loose and bring her up on deck. Only the captain was down there too, and he had a rope he wanted to choke me with. He was moving around very quietly, trying to come up behind me and get it around my neck. I was trying to be quiet too, so he could not find me, only pretty often I would stumble over something or knock something over. So I was thinking, suppose I just killed him, like we had the outlaws. He was being so nice this morning that I think he must have guessed what I was thinking. But underneath, he hated my guts and wanted his cabin back, and I knew it. Curl would not be half as much trouble, and he could take me to Forsetti just as well. There had been somebody else down there with us in my dream, somebody that never moved at all or made any noise, but I did not know who it was. Pauk came back with a chair for the captain. I'll see you to the bed and tidy up your cabin if you don't need me right now, sir. I nodded, and he said, Just sing out, sir, if you need anything. I'll be directly below. The captain sat down. A good servant? I did not know, but I said, He's been useful anyhow. He spent most of his life on one ship or another, from what he says. When are we going to get going? With the tide tomorrow night, Sir Abel of the High Heart, if that's satisfactory to you. Why not today? We must load our cargo. I mean, if you permit it, Sir Abel. Today and tomorrow for that, if the loading goes well. Once it's secure below, we'll put out as quickly as we can. He had not started to eat again, waiting for my food to get there. I said I had been wondering about that. Could he go right now without waiting for the tide? He lifted his shoulders and let them drop. It would depend on the wind, Sir Abel. If Ran favored us, we could do it. But I can't always predict the wind. I know when the tide will run, however, and I know it will bear us out to see if we let it. He waited for me, but I was thinking. If you'd prefer, I try earlier, I will, Sir Abel of the High Heart. The risk of running aground will be greater, I warn you. You wouldn't ordinarily do that? The captain shook his head. Then don't do it tomorrow. We can wait for the tide like you say. How long will it take to get to Forsetti? That will depend on the wind again. Just about then, the cook and his helper brought up my breakfast. I did not know much about ship's food back then, but I knew enough from Pauk to see they had fixed some of everything they could lay hands on. When the dishes had been crowded onto the little table and the cook and his helper had gone back to the galley, the captain said, With fair winds we'll tie up in for Seti within a fortnight, Sir Abel of the High Heart. With foul, well, anything you care to name, a month, two months, never. A fortnight is two weeks, or half the moon, but I did not know that then. I said a fortnight seemed awfully fast, and waited to hear what he would say to that. We can sail night and day, he explained, and with a fair wind we can travel as fast as a well-mounted rider. When that rider would be eating and sleeping and resting his horse, we can sail on as if the sun were up. I was eating. Then, too, it will depend on how we go, Sir Abel. Is it your wish to stay in sight of land the whole time? I swallowed and said, It's my wish to get there as quick as I can without taking any silly chances. Landsmen usually want to keep sight of land, the captain explained, because they don't see how we can find our way at sea, he chuckled. Sometimes neither do we. But we do it mostly, and out at sea's quicker and safer too. Austerlings and storms are dangerous everywhere, but inshore's the worst for both. I nodded, and said I had seen Bluestone Castle. Exactly. They generally creep up the coast, landing here and there. Just where depends on how many men they have and how confident they are. They want flesh, but they want gold too, and sometimes they want one more than the other. If they see a ship, they'll take it if they can overtake it. But there's always more flesh and more gold ashore than at sea. Storms are equally likely in either place, but they blow a ship about mostly. When they wreck one, it's generally by driving it onto rocks. I said, 
I doubt that I'll be much use in a storm, but I'll lead your men in a fight, if they'll follow me. I did not think it would really happen. You've got weapons for them? He nodded. Pikes, mostly, boarding axes. That explained Pauk's objection to a battle axe. The captain cleared his throat. Speaking of weapons leads me to something I've got to ask you, Sir Abel of the High Heart. You don't trust me, I know, and I don't blame you, but you can. I'll let bygones be bygones, if you know what I mean. I said that was nice. We'll be sailing tomorrow night. May I go ashore and get myself another sword? I may need it. Well, I wanted to say no, but I knew that he could get one of those boarding axes or something else like that, so I said all right. Chapter 18 Alone When I had seen everything, I went back to the captain's cabin. Pauk had made the bed and swept and mopped the floor and was unpacking things we had bought ashore and stowing them in chests and cupboards. I got out the seal I had promised him and put another one with it, saying that he had earned that much and more, which was the truth. Thank ye, sir Abel, thank ye, sir, he bowed, touching his cap at the same time, something I was going to see a lot of, although I did not know it then. You don't have to give no more than the unsir. Only I'll take him if you want to give him to me. Only I'll give him back if you need him for yourself, sir. I shook my head. They're yours. You earned them, like I said. You might be able to hitch a ride back to shore on that boat the sailors are unloading. But you'd better hurry. It's about empty now. Pauk shook his head. I'm staying on, sir, with your leave. I was looking out sharp for a berth when you spied me on the wharf. I've dropped my hook, if you take my meaning. You're planning to sail on this ship? I sat down on my bed. Aye, sir, as your man, sir. Seeing the way I looked, he added, You need somebody what will look out for you, sir. You're as good a man as ever I seen, and smart, and I'm sure you know lots out of books. Only sometimes you're a green hand, sir. I seen it when we was fitting up, sir. They'd a cheated you twenty times over. So you need somebody bad, somebody that knows the ways. That made me mad. Not mad at Pauk. It was pretty hard to be mad at Pauk, usually. But mad at people. Mad at a world where so many were out to cheat everybody. Maybe it was because of the time in Aelfris. I do not know. I was a boy not long ago, I told Pauk. It hasn't been long at all, and in lots of ways, I still am. Car, sir. So that's me, sir. I ain't bad as they come, but I'm plenty bad enough. Try me and you'll see. As for books, I looked into some in Uring's mouth, and the writing was just black marks on the paper. I can no more read than you can, Pauk. You know what's in em, sir, that's what matters. I doubt it. I took a deep breath. I do know this, though. I know I don't need a servant, and I can't afford to pay one, certainly not a seal a day. There you are, sir, a sealed. That's wages for a month for a sailor or a stable man or just about anybody. I said no, and I made it as firm as I knew how. So I'm set for a couple of months, and after that, I'd let it ride a couple more. Only I don't want no pay, sir, he laid his two seals on the table. Just let me stay on, and I'll look out for myself. Why, I mixed my sea bag in with your bag, sir, and you didn't pay no mind. I was worried about my gold gold in the burst that hung from my belt and more in my old bag, which was hanging from my neck under my clothes. I told him he could not sleep in the cabin with me, and that was final. He grinned, seeing he had won. Why, I don't want to, sir. I'll sleep in front of the door, sir, like I done last night. That way can't nobody get in without waking me up. On that wooden floor. I had slept on skins and dead leaves a lot by then, but I could not imagine Pauk or anybody sleeping on bare boards. The deck, sir, sure thing, sir. I've slept out on deck many and many a time. Knights sleep in their armor sometimes, I told him. What you do, what sailors do, must be worse. What will you do when it rains? There's a bit of set in to your door, sir. Maybe you didn't notice, but there is. That's what it's for and I've a bit of canvas to wrap myself in. I made a last try. You'll serve me for nothing. I warn you, Pauk, 
That's what I'll pay you. Aye, sir. See them sealed, sir. You take them. You won't hear a word out of me. I said I wouldn't pay you, not that I'd rob you. I paid them to you. They're yours now. Then I thought about the outlaws I had killed, Bold Berthold's hut, and some other things, and I said, It seems to me, Pauk, that a true knight has to respect other people's things, if they came by them honestly. If somebody came to rob me, I'd fight him, and I might kill him. But how could I do it if I'd stolen myself? I judge you're right, sir. You always are, mostly. So put them away. If you leave them on the table, I'll take them, I swear. He hesitated, then nodded, and picked them up. They tried to get me into the search party, sir. Second did, sir. Nurse's his name. What search party? Search in the ship, sir. I don't know if they found anything. I thought I knew what they had been looking for, but I asked just the same. A dog, sir. Seeing my face, Pauk backed away. Just a big dog, sir. Look out, seen it swim out to the ship, sir, and climb aboard. Last night it was, sir. But you don't know if they found it? No, sir, like I said, sir. Second was after me to help look, only I was moving Captain's things out so I could put yours in, sir. Food's in that, and sir, and beer's in the corner there, and... I held up my hand. Just a minute. Aye, aye, sir. Only I want to say, sir, that's another reason you need me, sir. Crew'll come in and pinch it, sir, when you're not in here, sir, food particular. Only I'll be here and they can't, sir. And you won't? I tried to smile. Pauk looked shocked. Course I will. Only feedin' one's not like feedin' twenty. I suppose not. And you may find that you can steal less than you think. They haven't found the dog, Pauk, I know that. But I want you to ask about him just the same. Find Medister Nur, or whatever he's called, and tell him I want to know. Aye, aye, sir. Only I was wondering, sir. When we was ashore and you seen that big dog, sir, you... Forget that. I felt tired and I wanted to be alone, even if it was just for a minute or two. Go ask Medister Nur, like I told you, and tell me what he says. When Pauk had gone, I took out the foreign mace I had bought in Uring's mouth and looked it over carefully. The four corners of the blade were as sharp as broken glass. The end was cut off square, a diamond shape that somebody had painted red. I thought I would file it sharp like a spike, and went out and found a sailor. He said the carpenter might have a file, so I sent him to borrow it. He did, but when I tried to reshape the end of the blade the file would scarcely scratch it. So I told myself that if it were sharp the whole thing would be too much like a sword anyway. Desiree was going to bring me a sword, I thought, because I did not have one, and when she did, I would see her again, so I gave the idea up. After that I barred the door, took out my gold, and stacked the coins on the table, all while wondering what I had stopped Pauk from saying, that the brave knight Sir Abel had turned pale when he saw a half-bred mastiff, that he had started as if he had seen a ghost. That big black shape I had seen when Gilf killed the outlaws, a dog as big as horse, with dripping jaws and fangs half as long as my arm, had been the Volfather's dog. One of the Volfather's dogs, and he had a whole pack of them, nine or ten, fifty or a hundred. For a minute I wondered about the Volfather. What was he like? What could he be like if he had dogs like that? I still wanted to get to his castle in the sky in sky. It was crazy, but I did. I wanted to go there and take Desiree with me. I still do. After that I looked at all the coins, counting them and really looking at them, comparing one to another. They were gold scepters, and when I had finished I still thought they were all the real thing. When we divided up the money, I had given Ulfa and her father the copper and brass and all the silver. All the foreign coins, too, there had been a good many of those, and a lot had been gold. I had kept only the gold scepters for my share, and I was not sorry I had, either. Some were a little worn, but a lot were new, or nearly new. I took one of the new ones to a window where I could see it clearly in the sunlight. There was a big mace on one side, not like mine, but a fancy club with a crown. 
On the other was the king with his face turned sidewise, just like that man on the quarter. There was writing underneath his picture, probably his name, but I could not read it. It was just a bunch of marks to me. I looked at the king and tried to think what he might be like, because I knew that even if I worked for Duke Martyr, Duke Martyr worked for him. He was young and handsome, but he looked tough and maybe a something out past tough. Like he would do whatever he wanted, and if you did not like it, you better get out of his way and keep your mouth shut. After that, Pauk knocked on the door, and I put my gold away and let him in. He said they had not found the dog, and second, said it had probably jumped off the ship again, or else the lookout had been seeing things. Pauk said, It's your dog, ain't it, sir? I said no, it was a dog I had been keeping for somebody else. That felt wrong as soon as I said it, and I did not feel right about it until I called Pauk back and said, You were right, Pauk. He's really my dog, and I'm pretty sure he's still on the ship. I won't tell you to look for him. If they didn't find him, you won't either. But I want you to put a bucket of fresh water down in the hold, where it will be a while before anybody finds it. He said he would, and went off to do it. And that is all about that day, except that I stayed on the ship because I was pretty sure the captain would sail it away if I got off. That day and the next day I learned quite a bit about ships and the work sailors do, mostly by watching and asking Pauk and Curl questions. On the second day, a couple of hours after it got dark, we put out like the captain had said we would. Sitting in my cabin, I watched the lights of Ring's mouth fade out behind us until there was nothing but dark, greasy-looking sea. Pretty soon I was going to understand it a lot better than I have ever understood people. But I did not know about that then. Then it was only something I loved, something beautiful and dangerous and tricky, like desiree. After that I just sat in my cabin. Maybe I got out Swordbreaker again, I do not remember. I could not have seen it very well, because I kept the cabin dark, waiting for what I thought would be coming. Finally, I thought, well, there is no Mac, and no TV, and no books or magazines to read, but there are feather pens in the desk, and paper and ink. I could write myself notes, or make lists or something. So I lit one of the lamps, and got the stuff out of the drawer, and started writing down the most important things that had happened to me like finding a spiny orange tree in the woods, parka, and seeing the night that blew away in that wrecked castle. I wrote up to Desiree leaving, and me finding Desira and Osar. Then I decided to give it up. Only there was one other thing. When I picked up the list I had been writing, meaning to wad it up and toss it out the window, I looked at it. And all of a sudden... I saw it was not the way we wrote at school at all. It was elf writing. I had not known I could do it, but I had done it, and I could read it. Chapter 19 The Cable Tear Here is where I am going to make you mad. I know I am going to do it, and I do not like it, but I am. I am not going to tell you about the fight with the Austerling pirates. It still hurts, and it would hurt a lot worse if I had to write all about it. So I will not. That it happened is the main thing, and you already know that. We were only three days out of port. The other main thing was that I got stabbed. I had bought a mail shirt and a helmet in Erring's mouth, and I was wearing them. The shirt was not a real hauberk like a knight would wear. It had short sleeves and came down a little bit below my waist, but I was proud of it, and while our crew was putting up the net, I pulled it on and put on my helmet. When I got stabbed, I thought the blade had come up under it, only it had not. It had gone right through. I saw that later. One night, down in the cable tier, when they thought I was going to die, I dreamed the whole thing over again and kept looking around for a machine gun I had lost, and the truth is I remember that dream a lot better than the real thing, and maybe some parts are mixed up. I do not know. We were sailing as fast as we could go, with sticks tied on the yards and extra sails on them and the ship heeling way over and turning a streak of sea to cream, if you know what I mean. But the Austerlings were rowing hard and sailing too, 
and their ship was really narrow and had four masts, with the one in front raked way forward, and they must have had two hundred men at the oars. In a gale we might have outsailed them, I know that now, but it was pretty calm, just a good breeze, and we did not stand a chance. I asked Curl what they wanted, and he said, They want to cook you and eat you. That was just in my dream, I am pretty sure, but it is the truth anyway. They wanted all of us. That is the way it works here. What you eat makes you more like it, and the closer it is to you, the more it moves you that way, if you know what I mean. You take Scour and Shaw. They ate a lot of fish, but it did not make them very much like fish, just quick and graceful, and knowing a lot about the sea. They never said their hands were cold either, or tried to warm them in front of the fire, but when they touched you their hands were as cold as seawater. Deer are closer, and if you eat a lot you smell things more, and your ears get sharper, and you can run faster. That is how it works, and sometimes I think it must be mostly in the blood, because when I drank Baki's blood it healed me a lot in just a day or so, and in certain ways I was more like one of the elf. I guess I still am. That had not happened yet. At the time I am telling about, it was the Austerlings that mattered. They are people, only they are not much like regular people, especially lower down. The Khan and the Princes, and so on, are pretty human, I guess because they can get whatever they want. But the more ordinary Austerlings have faces like skulls and horrible eyes that look like they are burning holes in you. Here I am going to say something that maybe I should not say. They are thin, too. You can count their ribs and see where all the bones are underneath their skin. In America, we liked people to be really thin, and all the girls I knew were always trying to lose weight. West of the mountains it is not like that, and I think it is because of the Austerlings. Men are supposed to have muscles and wide shoulders and big thick arms and legs, sort of like football players. We are not supposed to have thick heads, too, but pretty often that is the case. Women are supposed to have big round breasts like grapefruits, two balloon hips, and lots of meat on their arms and legs. Iden was not like that, which could have been one reason she was not married already. But Gaynor always made me think that she ought to lose about twenty pounds, only I could not decide what parts I would like smaller. So that was the way most people were in Celadon, which is where we were until we put out to sea, and it just made the Austerlings want to kill us that much more. But the fact was, I did not know this back then, that they would kill just about anything and eat it horses and dogs, rats and cats. The net I was talking about was made out of good-sized ropes, and it was there to keep people out. It was a good idea, because the ropes were hard to cut, and I could shoot arrows through the holes, which I did. But they could be cut after a while, which the Austerlings did, wanting to get at us, so chain would have been better. In my dream I could see the one who stabbed me, and see the dagger's blade coming at me and all that. After I was stabbed I lay on the deck of the Austerling ship and bled and bled, and after a long, long time our captain came, shuffling his feet, and when he was standing beside me he kicked me in the face. But I do not think that really happened. I woke up, and I had not been kicked. It was Pauk, and for a minute I did not know where I was. I thought I was back in my bedroom at home, or who Pauk was. You know how it is, sometimes, when somebody wakes you up from a dream. It's me, sir, Pauk Bad Eye. I got some water here, sir, thinking you might like it. I took it, the kind of wooden mug they call a cannikin. It ain't good water, sir, but you can drink it. I've been drinking it. They feedin' you, sir? It was hard to remember. Finally I said, I don't think so. I've been sleeping most of the time, dreaming. Back in a corner of my mind I was still trying to figure out how my bed had turned into a big coil of rope. I didn't think so. I'll try and get you something, sir. Cook will give me something if he knows it's for you. It was so dim in there that I could just barely make out Pauk's face. 
That was when I asked Pauk where I was, and he told me, Captain wanted to kill you, sir, only we wouldn't let him. We'd a mutinied, sir, if he'd tried it. He was going to, sir. He come up to where you was laying, and raised up his sword, sir, and I felt it go all though the ship, men standin' up that had been sittin', and feelin' for axes and knives and pikes. So he couldn't, sir, not then. He had some carry you down here, sir, with nar to watch him. Only I got to go, sir, for I missed. Pauk had become another dream. I heard him say, I'll bring you something. I will that. But the Austerlings were gaining on us, their thin black ship leaping across the sea, and the arrow was at my ear. A friend came and licked my face. Next time I woke up, I was myself again, weak and scared when I saw how weak I was. It was damp in the cable tier. My wound was hot, but I shivered there for hours. Here you are, Sir Abel, sir. Sprat dumplings, sir. I looked up at the sound of a stranger's voice. It was too dark to make out his face, but metal clinked on metal, and there was a good smell. In another second or so it was under my nose, crisp outside and soft inside, full of flavor, greasy and wonderful. I chewed and swallowed and had to fight to keep from swallowing without chewing. When I had finished, I asked who he was. Cook, sir, hordes vins me name, he gulped. But next to ya with me cleaver, sir Abel. Had me apron on, but warn't hog's blood on it. Me helper fought to, sir. Certs his name. He's watching out for me na. Had me big knife. A warm thing was pushed into my hand. I took it, bit off too much, and choked. Drink this, sir. Your man comes, Sir Abel, only he'd have edited himself, I was afeard. So I brung him, sir. They's me specialty, Sir Abel, sir. I'll leave the pan with the lid on, so the rats don't get em. After that I rationed them out to myself, and thought about what I would have to do. The next time Pauk came I told him, and he said, You can't fight him, sir. He'll kill you, and we'll kill him, but it won't do no good. So wait up, sir, till you're stronger. But if I'm weaker, I'll make peace if I can. But if I can't shake his hand, I'll break his neck. Did he really want to kill me? Aye, sir. Pauk's voice had become a shamed whisper. I should have killed him then, only I didn't. You'd have, and no count and costs. Only I'm not you, sir, and I know it. I'm not you either. I'm no seaman. Help me up. You're too weak, sir. I know. I felt like I ought to be angry, but I was not. That's why I wanted you to help me. He did, taking my hands and pulling me up. I'm a knight, I said. We fight when we're weak. Why is that, sir? Pouk sounded like he was a million miles away. I said I could not explain. There was not enough time. I tried to take a step and fell down. After that I was in bed, and a nurse came in and said I had fought the hijackers, and everybody was so proud of me they could bust. There was a dog in the hospital. That was why she was there. And had I seen it. Chapter 20 Swordbreaker There were shouts outside the cable tier. The door opened, and a seaman looked in. Captain, Sir Abel! No think to worry about, sir. We're watching and won't let him in. I said I wanted to talk to him, but the door had already closed. It got quiet again, just the creak of the timbers and the slap of the waves on the side of the ship, things I had been hearing so long I hardly heard them at all. I had a blanket and a bottle of brandy. The blanket had been one of mine, Pauk said, and he had pinched the brandy from the captain's private stock. I had drunk some. It made me terribly dizzy, and I swore I would not drink any more. I'm just a kid, I told Pauk between mouthfuls. He did not understand kid, so I said, A boy who's supposed to be a man after one night with a woman. Aye, sir, I felt the same many's a time. Right here, I want to stop everything and say something like this has happened to me a lot. I have tried to tell other men about desire and me and how I changed, and they have said the same thing happened to them. I do not think it did really, 
they felt like it did. I felt like it did, too, but I felt that way because it really did. Of course, they would say the same thing. Just a boy, I told Pauk. A boy who thought he was a brave knight. I ain't never seen no braver man, nor you, sir. Pauk sounded ready to fight anybody who contradicted him. Why, when them Osterlings got through the net, who was it went for em? I stopped eating to consider the question. The dog, I'm sure, the dog Magister Nur couldn't find. No, sir, it was you. The rest us come after, and if you hadn't gone, we wouldn't have gone at all, sir. The Osterlings, they didn't never think we'd have no night aboard. You had em beat for anybody caught breath. Time you went down, they was cuttin' free. It took a while, but I nodded. I remember, or any way I think I might, enemies in front of me and on both sides, striking them with the mace we bought from Mori. Where is that, by the way? Do you know what happened to it? Captain got it, probably, sir. Find out if you can. I'd like to get it back. I stopped talking for a while to eat and scratch my head. I need something for my left hand, Pauk, a shield, or at least a stick I could use to stop blows. I had to do it with the mace. Aye, aye, sir, I'll keep my eye out for something. Then look for my bow and quiver while you're at it, and for the dog. Is the dog still on board? White seen it last night, sir. Mighty thin it looked, White says, and slavered like to eat him. At least the captain hasn't got him. Pout coughed. Speaking of captain, as we was, sir, cause he's probably got em. Speaking of him, I've learnt what he's planning, sir. He told mate, and mate told second, and yours heard him and told me. When we get to port, sir, he'll pay off the crew and let him go ashore. He thinks everybody'll go, only I won't, sir. Him and mate'll come down here to do for you then, only I'll be with you. I said no. I won't wait for them. How long before we get to port? Pauk shrugged. I ain't no navigator, sir. Could be five days, could be ten. For Seti? No, sir, Yens, sir. That's what they say. If you're through eating, sir... No. I got to my feet without help and without a lot of trouble. Let me take that back. I'm through eating, but I'm not through with this stewed beef you brought me. I wouldn't talk quite so loud, sir. First might be around. I had not even noticed that I had raised my voice, but I raised it some more. I've been trying to keep quiet like you said, but what good is it? The captain's made his plans. I've got to stop him from following through. I want my bow as soon as you can get it. The bow and the bowstring. The string's very important. My quiver, too. And all the arrows you can find if you can find some. Aye, aye, sir. I opened the door of the cable tier. Gelf! I made it loud, but it had not been loud enough. Gelf! Here, Gelf! Sir, who's... My dog. He really is my dog, Pauk, until his old owner wants him back. I didn't want him because I was afraid of him. I tried to get rid of him before we forded the Uring. I made him go and told him never to come near me. I took a deep breath. It hurt bad, but I took it. Gelf! Come here, Gelf! I think Pauk would have run if I had not grabbed him. I thought I'd shaken him when you and I got on this ship. I stopped to whistle. It's night now, isn't it? That's why it's so dark in here. No sunlight leaking in. Aye, sir. I'll talk to the captain tomorrow, after he's had his breakfast. I owe him that much. You can tell him if you want to. I heard the scrabble of dull claws out in the hold, and I opened the pan Pauk had brought and put it on the floor for Gilf. I knew that cabin, and I knew there was no way to lock the door if you were not inside. If the captain had eaten in there, I was going to go in when Hordsvin's helper came in to clear away the dishes. But it did not happen like that. He ate on the roof of the stern castle, which was what I had been expecting, and Gilf and I just came up out of the hold and walked into the cabin like we belonged there, which we did. By the time he came in, I had found the foreign mace I had gotten in Uring's mouth and strapped it on. He opened the door and saw us, yelled for Curl, and then, I guess because I was sitting down and had not pulled out my mace, shut the door and barred it. His sword was under his mattress, like before. 
I had found it already and left it there. I could have stopped him from getting it, no problem, but I did not. When he had it, I said, Don't you trust Curl? The captain just looked at me, not saying anything. I told Gilf to let him see him then, and he did. He had been lying in a corner where it was dark, and he came up out of there like brown smoke, but all solid and snarling. I can kill you if I want to, I told the captain. I beat you before, and I can beat you again. Gilf could kill you too, and you won't stand the ghost of a chance against both of us. Do you own this ship? Some of the crew told me you did. Half. Fine. I don't want it. I never did. I don't want to kill you either. I stood up and held out my hand. Put that sword away. I don't think we can ever be friends, but we don't have to be enemies either. He stood there looking at us for maybe half a minute. Then he laid the sword down on his bed and sat down beside it. You don't object to my sitting in my own cabin? It's my cabin, I told him, but only until I get off at Forseti. I'm sitting, so you can sit down again. Go ahead. Your wound can't have healed already. I did. I want my bow and I want my money. Somebody told me you had them, but he was too scared of you to come in here and get them for me. So I'm here to get them myself. You've got that sword, which is yours, and you'll have some money of your own. Go get it and give me mine. All I want is what belongs to me. Give it to me with my bow, the case, and my quiver, and you can go away without fighting. He shook his head. I didn't think you would. All right, here's my last offer. Gilf and I will go out on deck. Before the next watch, you clear out of this cabin, leaving all my stuff, money, bow case, armor, and so forth, where I can find it. Twenty-two gold scepters, most of them new and all real gold, plus my other stuff. Will you do that? He stood up, and Gilf growled. I was afraid he was going to grow into the black thing that had killed the outlaws, and I told him not to. You'll return my ship and its cargo to me when we reach port? Sure, I said. But I don't want them in the first place. I don't... He was grabbing his sword. I got the mace out just in time to block the cut. It sounded like a big hammer hitting an anvil. The next cut would have lopped off my head, but I blocked it too. I never had stood up. I was on one knee in front of the chair. The third cut came very fast and broke his sword blade. That was when I decided to call my mace Swordbreaker. Gilf jumped on the captain as soon as his sword broke and pulled him down, and I hit him with Swordbreaker, thinking I would knock him out. I hit him too hard, though, and the diamond-shaped blade went deep into his head instead. It came out with blood and brains all over it. I just stood there looking at it and thinking of Desira and saying, Good Lord, good Lord, about twenty times. Then Gilf said, Shall I eat him? And I knew he was right, and we had to get rid of the captain. So I wiped Swordbreaker on his coat and pushed him out a window, and we cleaned up. After that, I went out on deck and talked to Curl. I told him he was captain now, and Nur was the first mate. I said that the captain had jumped me, and told him what had happened after that. I said if he wanted to tell somebody when we got to Forseti, that was all right, but they would probably keep the western trader there a long time for the trial and so on. He said it might be better if everybody just said the captain had died on the voyage, and we had buried him at sea. I said that was fine with me, and it really was the truth, or pretty close. So he got the crew together and told them, and nobody seemed to mind very much. After that, I thought maybe headbreaker or something, but somebody was sure to ask whose head it had been, so I stuck with Swordbreaker. Later I gave Swordbreaker to Taug, and he called her that too, because that was what I told him. Chapter 21 Seeing Them That night, Gilf and I talked things over in our cabin. He did not say much, not then and not ever. But he was a good listener, and when he did say something, it was a real good idea to listen close and think about it afterward. The thing was, I was afraid my wound was not getting any better, and I thought it might be getting worse. It felt as hot as fire, and when I pressed it, blood came out mixed with other stuff. I was scared. I know I have not said a lot about being scared, but I was scared pretty often the whole time I was in Mythgarther. 
I am not going to go back now and tell you about all the times. There would be no point in it. And besides, some of the worst times were times I have not told anything about, like when I was out hunting just after Bold Berthold took me in, and I shot the bear and it chased me up a tree. I had not thought a big bear like that could climb trees, and it was brown anyway and not black. I guess the bears in the forest of Celadon are different from the bears we have at home, because it could climb quicker than I could. When it got really close, I stuck an arrow down its throat, and it fell out of the tree and went away. I was so scared I could not climb down. I just held on and shook for a long time. I had dropped my bow when I ran, and the bear had just about bitten my hand off when it snapped down on the shaft. Anyway, I was scared, and Gilf and I talked about my being wounded and what might happen. He said those deep wounds were the worst because you could not lick them clean. I laughed because I could not have licked there. I would have washed it, only I thought about the kind of water we had on the ship, and he was right. Licking would have been better. After a while I remembered bold Bertold's telling me that the Bodachan would fix up sick animals sometimes, and they had helped him as much as they could. Then, too, Desiree was an elf, and I was sure she would help me if she knew I was hurt. So I said what we needed to do was get in touch with some elf that might help us. And were there some on this boat? Gilf put his head down between his paws, and I could see he was holding something back. So I said, Well, if you know where some are, how about if you try to get them to help me? If they won't, I won't be any worse off than I am right now. He just looked at me for a while, then he went to the door and scratched it, so I would let him out. I did. It was dark by then, and the moon and the stars were out, and we had just enough wind to fill the sails. That was my favorite time on the ship, every time I was on it. Then Gilf pushed past me, because the door was pretty small, and ran across the deck and jumped over the rail. When he came back and we had talked, I went out on deck again and asked Curl if he was afraid of the elf. He scratched his head the way I do sometimes. I dunno, Sir Abel. I never seen one. You will, I said. I pointed to the sailors who were on that watch. They were asleep on deck except for the helmsman and the lookout. I told Curl to wake them up and send them below, and said he could give them any reason he wanted to. He looked kind of surprised. Do I have to give them a reason, Sir Abel? I said no, and he started yelling at them to wake them up. I told one to find Pauk when he went below and sent him to me. We had him steer and sent the helmsman below. The way that wind and that sea were, I could have steered the ship myself, or we could have tied the wheel. Pauk had no idea what was going on then, and neither did Curl. Once the watch had gone below, Gilf jumped over the side again. After that there was nothing to do but wait, so I sat down in one of the crenels. Curl was scared. He came up to me very quiet. He's no ordinary dog, is he, sir? I said no. He's coming up to breathe, maybe? Where we don't see him, sir? I said yes, and pretty soon he went away. The moon was a narrow crescent, just beautiful. After a while I could see it was really a bow, and see the lady holding it. I did not know a thing about her then, but I saw her anyway. She is the Valfather's daughter, the most important one. Old Berthold had always said Sky was the third world, and the people up there were the overkinds. Seeing her like that, I wondered about number two and number one. I had asked him about those one time, but he only said nobody knew very much. I blinked, and the lady was gone. I remembered then that Bold Bertold had told me they went a lot faster up there, and what we saw was years to them. They get killed sometimes, I found that out later, but they never get old and die the way we do. Then I thought about the highest world, number one. It seemed to me for that living way up there and looking down on the rest of us would make him proud. After a while I saw where that was wrong, and under my breath I said, No, it wouldn't. It would make you kind instead, if there was any good in you at all. As soon as I had said it, I knew Pauk had heard me, but I do not know what he made of it. 
What I had thought was, what if it was me, and I was all alone up there with just rabbits and squirrels, or the only grown-up, and the rest were little kids? Sure, I could strut around and show off for them, but would I want to? If one was bad, I could smack him and make him cry, but I was a knight. What kind of victory would that be for a knight? I decided I would just take care of the kids as well as I could, and I would hope that some day they would get older and be people I could really talk to. Maybe I nodded off then, or maybe I had already. Anyway, I dreamed I was a kid again, myself, asleep on a hillside. In my dream, the flying castle crossed the sky over my head and made me remember how I used to live in a place where there were swords and no cars. I woke up because I had been about to fall, and went to stand by Pauk. There was a dark cloud way in the west, and I saw a man riding down it. He looked really small because he was so far away, but I saw him as clearly as I have ever seen anything. A man in black armor on a big white horse, the horse's neck stretched out, and its open mouth and wild eyes, its hooves just flying. Down the cloud and across the sea, lower and lower, until it seemed like it was running over the crests of the waves. Look, I yelled, a man on horseback, there in the lowest stars. See him? Pauk looked at me as if I had gone crazy. Curl sighted along my arm. The moon rider, Sir Abel, you seen him? I see him now. I never have. Curl squinted and peered. Some do, they say. Right there, two fingers above the water where the bright star is. Curl peered again, then shook his head. I can't, sir. I've had ner point like you and say he's seen him plain to stay. But I'm not one that has the second sight. I'm not either. From the wheel, Pauk said really soft. You are, sir, able, sir. I started to say how plain he was, and anybody could see him. But all of a sudden I could not see him myself. After that I kept looking and looking. The moon was still like a shining bow, but it was only like it. It was not one, not really. The stars were still there, reflected in the sea, and there were a few clouds, and it was really beautiful. I sort of thought I would say here that there was nobody there, that it was all just empty. That would not be true. I knew there was somebody there, maybe a lot of somebodies, only I could not see them. I must have looked for about an hour. And then the elf came. They were as solid and real as anybody there in the night, some with fish's scales and some with fish's tails. They were blue, dark blue, but it was not like a certain sky or anything. It was not navy blue or midnight blue or blue-black or anything like that. It was more like the color of deep, deep water than anything else. But that was not it either. It was their own color, and their eyes were like the yellow fire of the sun reflected in ice. They had lonely, lovely, piping voices, and they called out to each other, and to the sea and the ship. I knew most of the words they used, but I could not understand what they were saying, and I cannot write it down either. I stood up, balancing on a merlin, and waved to them, yelling, Over here! I'm able! They called to one another, pointing and swam over to the ship, diving in and out of the water and leaping free of it, sometimes as high as the mainmast, spreading fins like wings. I told Curl to hang a rope over the side or something, and he did, but not many of them used it. They just climbed up the sides, or else jumped up on the deck until there was a crowd of them there. I pulled off my shirt and the bandage so they could see my wound, and they came up on the stern castle deck to look at it, asking questions without waiting for answers. I had to guess at what to say, so I said I wanted to be cured and I would do anything for them if only they would do it, and if they could not, I would still do anything they wanted me to. No, they said, and no, no, and no, 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 brave Sir Knight, we could not ask you to fight Kulili for us until you were well and strong, Ill and weak, you would surely die. Another was almost like an echo. We'll surely die. Then an old elf came. He looked like a man of thin blue glass, with wild white hair and a tangled blue beard to his knees. All the others stood aside. You could tell he was somebody. He took my face between his hands and looked way down into my eyes. 
I could not help looking into his when he did that, and it was like looking into a storm at midnight. When he finally let my face go, it seemed like it had been a long, long time. Hours. Come with us to Eilfris, was what he said. The sea shall heal your wound and teach you to be the strongest of your kind, a knight against whom no knight can stand. Will you come? I could not talk, but I nodded. As soon as I did, there were eight or ten elf maidens tearing at my clothes. They took off my sword belt and sword breaker and everything else too, and as soon as they got down to bare skin they kissed it, giggling and elbowing each other and having a fine time. One grabbed my right hand and another one got my left, and one jumped up onto my shoulders. It seemed like she weighed no more than a few drops of water and the long, thin legs she wrapped around my neck were as cold as dew. All four of us jumped into the sea then. I did not mean to, but I did anyway. It was all really strange. There had been this greasy swell up where the ship was, but before we hit, the sea was tossing waves, and they looked as clear as crystal, chimerical, like ghosts in sheets of snow-white foam, ghosts spangled all over with moonlight and reflected stars. There was a shock, as if we were jumping into a cold shower, and a roar like a big wave hitting another head-on, and then we were down under all those waves. "'You will not drown,' the one on my left told me and giggled. I had not even been worrying, but I should have been. "'Not as long as we are with you, Sir Knight.' That was the right-hand elf maiden. She laughed, and the sound of it was like little naked kids playing in some pool the tide had left. But we will leave you, it was the one on my shoulders who said that, and she pulled my hair a little bit to get me to pay attention. It is what we do. All three of them laughed and laughed at that. There was nothing cruel about the way they laughed, but there was nothing kind about it either. Garseg will make us, they said. Strange fish swam all around us. Some of them looked dangerous, and some looked very dangerous. I did not know who they belonged to then. Deeper down we lost the moon and the starlight, and the whole world of suns and moons and winds seemed really, really far away. I guess it was the way an astronaut must feel. He was so used to those things that he never thought they could be taken away, and when they are he must wonder how he got into this. I know I did. Some of the fish down there had teeth like big needles, and a lot had spots or stripes on their sides that glowed red, yellow, or green. I saw an eel that looked like a rope on fire, and some other scary things, and finally I asked the elf maidens if this was where they lived, because it did not seem to me that anybody would if they could live anywhere else. We live wherever we are, they said, and Kelpie is our name. They lit up for me then, slender, pretty girls that seemed like they were made of blue light. They made me look at their gills and tails, and they had long curved claws that looked as sharp as the fish's teeth. Chapter 22 Garseg At the mouth of an underwater cave we found the old man who had promised to cure me. He made the Kelpies go away, and I was kind of glad. I wanted to know where we were, and he said it was Eofris. I am not the oldest of my kind, he told me, nor the wisest, yet I know many things. I am Garseg. Later I found out it was not his real name. But then I believed him, and I still think Garseg when I think of him. So it is what I am going to call him. I asked how he was going to cure me. I cannot. The sea will heal you. Come with me, and I will show you. He took my hand, and the two of us swam to a place where the sea bottom was as warm as water in a bathtub, and steam bubbles blew mud and sand out of crevices. You have a rent in your side, Garseg told me. Have you ever seen a rent in the sea? I said no. Watch. The bubbles came faster, and stones were thrown up, and there was a rumble underneath the stone like thunder, 
white-hot rock roared up from the seafloor so that great white clouds of steam belched up and all the fish and crabs and things ran away. Everything except us. That went on for a long time. Gradually all the noise trailed off into a sound like a giant asleep, like gilling, dying down there in a bed as big as a lot of people's houses. The rock stopped flowing up and got hard. We went up to look, and it was a whole island of rock with a sort of basin in the middle. Some seabirds had started nesting there, and the sea lapped at the gray rock beach all around it like a cat laps cream. Grass started growing there, then trees. The trees sent roots way down deep, looking for fresh water, following little cracks and splitting them. For maybe a second I saw Desiree running naked through the trees. I wanted to run after her, but Garseg held me and we sort of fought about it. That was the only time we ever fought. New birds, birds Desiree had brought, nested in her trees. Nuts fell off them, and crabs came ashore to eat the nuts. Garseg caught one and ate it the way you would eat a praline, but I was worried about their pinchers. The island got more and more beautiful and smaller and smaller until it sunk in the sea and the waves closed over it, and it was like it had never been there at all. Now you have seen a rent in the sea, Garseg told me. Have you seen a crag die? I said no, and we swam again. When we got to the crag that was going to die, we climbed up it, up the sheer rock, and stood on the top. There had been a wind the whole time, getting worse all the time. Pretty soon it roared so loud you could not hear yourself think. The waves got bigger and bigger until every wave that hit the crag was like a railroad train, and the spray hit us too, and sometimes the water at the top washed right over us. The crag shook, and there were boulders in those big waves, boulders that hit like hammers and then fell back into the sea for the next wave to pick up. Once on Halloween I had thrown gravel at windows, this made me think of that. But when I was doing it, I had never known how horrible it really was, and now I felt like I was out there under the sea, still a kid throwing rocks. It got so bad we had to back off the crag, way back onto solid land. Even there the wind made me think of a knight, a big knight on a big horse riding among little ordinary people like Garseg and me and slashing left and right. I know it sounds crazy, but that is the way I thought. The water came up, the same way it had a hundred times before. It covered the crag, but when it went away this time, the whole crag was gone. I went out to the edge and looked down. It was not easy to keep my balance in that wind, but I did it. I had to. And down at the bottom you could see what was left, a little less each time a wave smashed into the beach. Garseg came and stood beside me. After a minute, he held out his hand, cupped, so I could see what was in it. At first, I thought there was nothing. It was water. Just water. He asked if I understood. I said, I think so. He waited a long time before he said, The island? I have to be like the sea, isn't that right? It waits, it runs out the clock, and closes over the torn part? The crag? Water is nothing, but water with energy is stronger than stone. Is that the right answer? Garseg smiled. Come with me. We went back to the sea, swimming up at the top this time, jumping with its waves, or letting its currents carry us. Your blood is the sea, Garseg told me. I did not get that for a long while, but as we swam on and on, it began to make sense. First I thought it was crazy. Then I thought he might be right after all. Then I knew he was right. I could feel the sea inside of me exactly like I felt the sea outside of me. After that we kept on swimming until knowing that the sea and I made one thing became part of me. It is still part of me and still true. The Kelpies and the other sea elf say it is like that for them too, but they are lying. For me, it is really true, like it is for Kulili. I can be all sunny and smiles for a long, long time, but I can rise up like when we fought the Angerborn at the pass. Giants ran from me then, and the ones that did not died. 
Finally I said to myself, By the power of the sea, life left the sea. They were able to leave it because they took it with them. I was a sea creature in mother's womb, and she was a sea creature inside her mother, and I will be a sea creature as long as I live. The king must know exactly the way I do, because he put a niker on his shield. He is my brother, Garseg said. We were both swimming hard, but I looked around at him, surprised. Can you hear my thoughts? Sometimes. You're an elf. Isn't the king a human man? He is. I thought about that for a long time and got nowhere with it. Garseg must have been able to hear some of it, because he said, When a man of my kind takes a woman of your kind, she may bear a child. Still not understanding, I said, all right. Every child has something of its father and something of its mother as well. Say for monsters, every child is of the male kind or the female kind, nevertheless. We stopped to rest, floating on our backs in the clear sea. I said, I took an elf woman, a woman I really truly love like nobody else on earth. I know it. Will we have children? I cannot say. Suppose we do. These were things I had not thought about before. If it's a boy, will it grow up to be a human man? Or an elf man? Until the child is born, there is no knowing. What if it's a girl? The same. The king's royal father lay with a woman of my race, even as you with your elf maiden. I saw then that Garseg did not really know everything, and to tell the truth I felt good about it. Of their union three children were born, one of my kind, and two of yours. Three? Garseg nodded. Our sister's name is Morcain. When we started off again, I thought we were going to swim a long way like we had before. Now I can see Garseg wanted to rest before we got where we were going. He knew about the stairs, and he knew we might have to fight. The chimeras would not recognize him, and he would not be able to tell them who he was. Anyway, I was just getting warmed up again when he stopped and pointed. That is the isle your mariners call glass, he said, and pretty soon we were there and climbing over slick, sharp rocks that shone crimson, gold, and scarlet in the sunshine, with a lot of other colors, more beautiful than I could ever make you believe it was. Do they call it glass because it's made of glass? I asked him. He shook his head. It is not, but of fire opal. The dragonstone. He would not look at me. Who told you that? It had been bold Berthold and I called him my brother. He's dead now, I think. Wise Berthold, if you do not know him dead, let us hope that he lives. I told Garseg how I had searched for bald Berthold's body without finding it. Many have searched for this isle, but those who search for it never find it. More than a few have sighted it by chance, however, and a handful of mariners have landed here. I had the feeling Garseg knew more about that than he was telling, so I asked what happened to them. Various things. Some returned safely to their ships, some perished, some remain with us, and some went to other places. Do you see the tower? I did, and it was huge. Somebody had built a skyscraper all by itself way out on that little island, and at first I thought, why did they have to make it so high? Because there was nothing else out there to crowd it. Only there was. It was the sea. The island was not really very big, so if you wanted to put a big building on it, it had to go straight up. It did. It was round and only a little wider at the bottom, and it went up and up like a needle, taller than the tallest mountain. The Builder was of the Sixth World, which is Muspel, Garseg said. My people build nothing like it unless they must. Would that they did. From this tower Cetor sought to overawe this sphere, which you call the world below. 
I said we called it Aelfris, mostly. Garsig nodded. He built smaller towers as well, his strongholds on many coasts. My sister dwells in one when she chooses. But you don't? I could, if I wished. Garseg stood up on what I had thought was just another slick rock, and walked away. When I could not see him, I heard him say, How is your wound? I felt for it, but I couldn't find it. Healed? When I caught up with him, I said, There's a scar, but it's closed, and it's not sore. The scar will fade. For a time a gull might have seen rocks below the water. I get it. Am I really the strongest knight in the whole world now? That is for you to say. Then I am. I did not feel any stronger when I said it, but I knew I was very, very strong and very, very fast. Exactly how strong and how fast I did not know. I also knew that some of that was what Desiree had done, and some came from the sea, from learning how it was and that it was in me, tides of blood pounding the beaches of my ears. But some was just me, and in fact the part about the sea was just me too. That had been there all the time, although I had not known it. I stopped thinking about all that stuff because I had seen the stair. On that skyscraper it looked like a cobweb, stretching up and up to a sort of crevice way up high. The sun on that stair, and the wall, made them look like they were on fire. You wished you had really dark sunglasses, or maybe welding glasses. I squinted and shielded my eyes and all the rest, but it did not bother Garseg. Here Cetar gathered all the greatest weapons of our world, in order that we might not resist him. He who could sunder mountains would not permit us so much as a dagger. Yet in the end we drove him out. I wanted to know if Garseg thought he would come back. He does return at times, then flies again before we can muster our forces. Would you drive us from your middle world if you could, Sir Abel? I thought of Desiree, and I made my no as strong as I could get it. Many would. Many strive against us even now. Yet we would return some day. It is the same for Cetar. All those weapons you were talking about, are they still there? Garseg nodded. We have been pillaging his trove a thousand years, and the weapons we have taken from it are scattered throughout the worlds. Then they're gone. The next time Garseg said something, his voice was so low I could barely hear him. He said, The trove is hardly diminished. Chapter 23 On the Stair You will recall... Garseg said when we got to the base of the stair, that I told you truly that I could not heal your wound, but that the sea would heal it if only you would come to Aelfris with me. I nodded, feeling my wound again to see if it was still gone. I promised also that you would be the strongest of all your kind. You are, but it was not my doing, but yours and the sea's. I said, are you trying to get me to bitch about all this? I won't. I owe you. I'll owe you for the rest of my life. He shook his head. Am I not an honorable man? You owe me nothing whatsoever. I want to make that entirely clear. It was not easy to grin at Garseg, and that may have been the only time I pulled it off. I said, Okay, I don't owe you a thing. Only, I'd like for you to owe me, because I might want another favor from you sometime. What would you like me to do? Put your foot on the first step. I did. There you go. Now watch this. I ran up the next hundred or so, then stopped and turned around to look down at him. Aren't you coming with? I am, he called. But you must go first, and I must warn you that we go into danger. I said, sure, and climbed some more, and right here I had better stop and make a lot of things a lot clearer. First off, a couple of hundred steps was nothing on that stair. It went right straight at the skyscraper until it hit it about a quarter of the way up, and it just got steeper and steeper all the time. 
It was curved about the way a string with a little slack in it would be. There were thousands and thousands of steps. Second, nobody had to tell me it was dangerous. The steps were hard fire opal, polished like a jeweler would have polished them, and so slick you could see a reflection in them. They were about two and a half feet end to end, and there was no rail. The third one is really tough for me to get out, but here it is. I kept thinking that Garseg had really done me three big favors. I had promised Gilf I would never try to ditch him again. I had meant it, and I never did. But he still scared me. Pretty soon I will tell about Mani. He could be scary too. But no matter how scary he was, he was still a cat. A big cat and a tough cat, but just a cat that could talk. Gilf was plenty big enough to scare people the way he was regular, and I had already guessed that regular was just the way he looked so he would not scare us. The black thing with fangs like daggers, the thing as big as black mane, was the real Gilf. Okay, I had not tried to ditch him, but he had stayed on the boat, this was what I thought, when I went off with the Kelpies, and that was fine with me. Garseg caught up to me. I carried you to this isle, in order that you might choose some storied weapon for your own, before we asked service of you. You are still young, thus I hope your eagerness to blood your treasure would lead you to accept the challenge. I said sure, I would do it, whatever it was. I feared you might consider that trickery, and so I make haste to explain myself. I am glad you do not. Even so, you speak too quickly. No way, I said. Those Kelpies told me you wanted me to fight somebody called Kulili. I knew what I was getting myself into. I had tried looking over the side a while back, and I had not liked it. I was keeping my eyes straight to the front. Sort of under my breath, I said, Going down is going to be a lot worse. Garseg said, Going down may be infinitely easier, Sir Abel. Look above you. I did. The black birds? They are not birds. They are fire elf, or they were. These fire elf are chimeri now. Bad news? They serve cedar. We are shape-changers, we elf. I remembered Desiree and how she had been a bunch of different girls for me, and I said, Yeah, I know. Cedar cast those into the shape you see. He is a shape-changer himself, so potent that he can lend great strength to others. As they are, he made them. They cannot break his spell. High above a shrill voice screamed, Will not! They guard his tower still, Garseg told me, or try to. I was thinking it was like a big video game, except I was on the screen, or virtual reality maybe. I sort of felt my head for the gear, but there was not any, and just then a chimera swooped down at me, pulling up just before I could grab it, a little starved body, mostly black but red at the cracks, with claws and jaws and black bat wings. They hope to convince you that they pose no serious threat, Garseg muttered. Now that you have seen them, they fear you will turn back. I don't think so. When we have climbed higher... They will cast us from the stair. If we fight, we will surely fall. Shun them and climb as fast as you can. In the tower we will not be safe from them, yet the tower is to be preferred. I stopped and looked back at him, thinking about how old he was. Aren't they going to try to kill you too? These chimeri have sought my life before, he said. I went up about a hundred more steps, and one wished past so close I could smell it. Another went in back of me, and its wing brushed my head. Look about you, Garseg warned me. Yar! I looked back at him instead, only he was gone, and where he had been there was a kind of alligator with horns, as big as a cow, and ten or twelve legs. 
The legs had suckers, and all the suckers were grabbing onto the steps. It lashed its tail and raised its head and roared at the chimeras, snapping at any that came close. Just then one blindsided me. I fell and barely caught the edge of the stair with the fingers of one hand. They were slipping, and I knew I was going to die when a sucker closed around my wrist and heaved me back up onto the steps. I was still grabbing and shaking when the alligator's mouth opened and I saw Garseg's face inside it. He said, Recall the sea, and run! I was so scared I could hardly stand up, but as soon as I did, a big wave caught me from behind. Do you know what I mean? My legs ached, too, but that did not matter. I went up those stairs like I was flying, three steps at a time. They kept hitting me, or trying to, and once I stumbled. But I never stopped until one dropped down on the step ahead of me with a sword in each hand. It was black and all bones and wings, and its lips would not quite cover its teeth. But the eyes seemed wrong. They were those yellow fire eyes all the elf have, even the Kelpies and the ones who gave me gilf the same kind of eyes Desiree used to have, even when the rest looked just like a human girl. When I looked at them, all I could think of was her. It opened out its wings, when it saw I had stopped. With those big black wings open, it looked as big as a house. You must fight us. Its voice was mostly hiss, but you could understand. See? I have swords for us both. It held one out hilt first, but I did not take it. I hit the pommel with the flat of my hand instead, and drove the sword backward into the chimera's chest. Its eyes got big and scared then, and stuff that was not quite blood spurted out of the wound, and it fell off the stair. I thought that had been pretty easy, but before I could take another step, five hit me all at once, not to knock me off, but grabbing me and lifting. I had one on each leg and one on each arm, and one had its claws in my hair. They flew with me so fast it was like falling up in a hurricane. I saw there were windows and balconies and arches and torn places in the sides of the skyscraper, and way up above us, but getting closer and closer, was Mythgarther, trees and people, animals and mountains. About then, the one that had my left ankle yelled like it was scared and let go and peeled off, and I figured they were going to drop me, so I wrenched around and grabbed the wrists of the ones holding my arms. After that I kicked off the one that had my other leg. Their wings went even faster, but we started losing altitude. The one who had my hair said, We fall, and I told him to land me on the steps, but he let go instead. After that, the one that had been holding on to my left arm screamed we were going to die. I kept yelling, land on the steps, and we did, coming down too fast and crashing on them. It was not easy to keep hold of the chimeras the way I did, but I did, and as soon as I got my breath I banged the two of them together until they begged. I stopped. You guys work for Cedar? Cedar is sense. I banged them together some more. That's not what I asked you. Do you work for him? Yes. Okay, quit. From now on, you're going to work of me. We cannot renounce Cetar. They both said that. Then you're going to die. I'm going to break your wings and throw you off this thing. Garseg came up behind me, not being the alligator anymore. They are evil creatures, Sir Abel, but I ask you to spare them. That was crazy, and I said so. Yet I ask it, Sir Abel, for the sake of the good I have done you. I threw one down and got my foot on its neck, and I bent the other one backwards over my knee. I was still hurting from the fall and still scared silly, and I would have killed it then and there for two cents. I leaned down on it and heard its back creak like a gate in the wind. She cannot renounce Cedar, Garseg said to my back. I did not answer, just leaning down some more on the chimera. Do you owe me nothing? I owed him a lot, and I knew it, but he was beginning to bug me. I thought about things a little, and then I said, I owe this whatever you call it to. If it hadn't been for him, I'd be dead. So I'm going to take him away from Cedar so he doesn't have to look like this anymore. After that, I bent the chimera some more, and it said, 
I renounce him. I eased up a little. That's good. Say it again. I renounce him. Say the name. Who are you renouncing? Seater. I renounce Seater forever. I kind of looked over my shoulder at Garseg. What do you think of that? He shrugged. Are you pleased with a breath? You don't think it means it? I do not know. Nor does it matter. Anyone can say anything. She cannot renounce Cedar, as I told you. If a prisoner renounces his chains, do they fall from his wrists? What could she swear by that would make it real? Garseg shook his head. There is nothing. So I thought about that, and finally I said, How does Cedar make them do whatever he wants? Who knows? Well, she does. I put more pressure on the Chimera and said, You listen up. Tell me how he's got you, or I'll break your back this minute. Garseg said a lot more then, but I am not going to write it down here. He wanted me to let the Chimera go. Slay me, she said. End my life, and end my agony. I let her off my knee and grabbed her by the neck. You swore by Cedar, didn't you? Admit it. Yes. About twenty were buzzing us by then, and I decided we had better get inside quick. I let the other one up and grabbed her too. I made them fold their wings, tucked one under each arm, and ran for it. They did not weigh a lot, and the sea was surging all through me. Even so, it was tough going, and when we got inside I was ready to quit. I lifted them up and threw them down, and I made them shut up until Garseg got there and I caught my breath. It was a really big, huge room, pretty dark, that stunk of rotten meat and mold, and it was so quiet you could listen to your heartbeat. The throne at the far end must have been twenty-five feet high and fifty feet wide. Here, Cedar plans to judge our world, Garseg said when he got there, forcing us to live virtuous lives. I was still mad. I said it sounded like a tall order to me, that even though there were a lot of things I liked about the elf I had met, everybody said you could not trust them and they could lie birds out of the trees. I thought Garseg was going to climb all over me for that, but he looked kind of sad and nodded. I said, well, we're not exactly the most honest people in the whole world either. Then he said something that surprised the heck out of me. He said, yet you are the gods of Aelfris. I had never heard anything like that before. Okay, really, I had, but I did not remember it. I knew he was serious from the way he said it, and I did not know how to react. I did not want to show it, and I wanted time to think about it, so I grabbed one of the chimeras and asked again if she renounced Cedar, and when she said yes, I told her to go back to being a regular elf, because I liked that shape a lot better. She tried, but she could not. I told Garseg he had been right. You probably know Desiree, I said. I know her too, and she did some shape changes for me once. It didn't seem like it was hard at all for her. Was it hard when you turned into the alligator with all the legs? He shook his head. It is a matter of concentration, Sir Abel. Observe. Before he said that last word, he had started to melt and flow. I know you do not know what I mean, even if you think you do. But that is the only way I can describe it. You know about claymation? It was like that. Like somebody I could not see was molding him between shots. He started looking like me. I mean, the way I looked after Desiree got through with me. He looked more and more like me until he would have fooled everybody on the ship. There was no smoke, but I did not think about that. That was when I first noticed his eyes. I have probably said a couple dozen times that all the elf had those yellow fire eyes. Up until then it had not bothered me that Garseg did not. Before, he had bushy blue eyebrows, and the eyes deep in. The alligator's eyes had been really small, and I guess I had not paid a lot of attention. When he looked like me, his eyes were easier to see, and I looked at him harder. And he did not have elf eyes at all. 
He did not have human eyes either, or cat eyes or dog eyes or anything like that. His eyes were a high wind on a dark night. I had been scared plenty already, and that scared me a lot more. I pretended I had not noticed, but I was shaking inside. To cover up, I told the other chimera to renounce Cedar. She would not, and I said, Even if he made you look ugly and stay there? What did he ever do for you? We received nothing, the first one said, save these shapes. We were promised great benefits, always to be paid when the next task was done. The one I had been talking to nodded. Always another task. Garseg stepped between them and me. That being so as I know it is, why will you not renounce Cetar as your fellow did? That one stepped around him and knelt to me. Lord, I will serve you in all things whatsoever. Is that not enough? I saved you just as Bucky did. Ask what service you wish, and you shall receive it. I needed thinking time, so I said, What's your name? Your slave is Uri, Lord. Garseg was changing again, going back to the way he had usually looked. You must not suppose, Sir Abel, that those are their true names, of use in weaving spells. Yes, yes, they said, they are. Well, I had wanted to think, and sometimes I really do. I had been wondering about certain things, like why Garseg's eyes did not look right, and why he wanted me to let those two chimeras go. So I said, It's not always a real good thing to throw around real names, is it? Like, Abel's just what everybody calls me here. Is it all right if I use your real name, or should I just keep on saying Garseg? Garseg said, you are correct. Do not speak my true name, even when we are alone. Fine. I guess you know these two whatever you call them's just about killed me? He shook his head. I would have saved you. If he was lying, he was a good liar, which he was. I said I would not argue, but I felt like he owed me. I will repay you by letting you claim a storied weapon all the world will envy. Are you talking about Eterni? No, it is not here, and I am surprised you know of it. I sort of shrugged. That's the only one I want, and you are going to let me take something anyhow, so I could fight Kulili for you. I think I'll take these two instead. They're quitting Cedar, so they ought to take off his uniform. That's how it seems to me. One has renounced Cedar, as you say, and the other has sworn to serve you. Will you fight Kulili? I said I would. I don't go back on my word, Garseg. Then there is no reason you should not have these two to assist you. If you really want them, make no mistake. When a man owns a slave, the slave owns a master. I said I could live with that. Never say you were not warned. Their new uniform will be... Their natural shapes, I said. Their elf shapes. If they won't change for me here, I'm taking them to the top of the skyscraper. That ought to do it. Garseg did not like that at all. He wanted me to let them go, and go straight down to the armories with him like he had planned. I would not do it, and when he got us over to the inside stairs, the chimeras and I went up instead of down. Finally, he said all right, he would meet us up there. Chapter 24 Sunshine if I told everything that happened after that on the stairway that went up the inside of the skyscraper, and what I said to Uri and Baki, and what they told me in the way that they told it, it would use up a stack of paper as high as the stairway was, so I am not going to. Here are the main things. I wanted to know why the elf had driven Cedar out, and it was because he wanted to be king of all of them. 
Some of the kings and queens they had already had not liked that. Then I wanted to know why some of them were for him, Uri especially. It was because of Kulili. They hated her, and Cedar had been trying to kill her. He had raised a big army, all the sea elf, all the fire elf, and some others. They had tried to mob her, and she had killed about half of them and chased the rest. I tried to find out why they wanted her dead, too, but I never got to the bottom of that. It was the same when I asked what she looked like. She looked all kinds of different ways. So she was a shape-changer, too. She lived in the sea like the sea elf, but in deeper water. We did not get to the top that day, or even the day after. I probably ought to say that, too. Uri and Baki knew where food might be as you went up, so we would stop whenever we got near a place, rest and eat, if there was anything. Maybe we would find a room we could barricade. We did that both times when we slept. Only I sort of lost track of the days, and it was night when we finally got to the roof garden. There was no moon, but there was bright starlight, and it showed fruit trees with a lot of fruit on them. We were ready to eat anything, and that was great. Baki flew up a date palm and brought me a bunch of ripe dates. I had never eaten those before, and they are the best fruit in the world. There were oranges, too, not exactly like our oranges at home, but not exactly like tangerines either. Small and sweet. When we were full, I made Uri and Baki lie down and said I would keep watch. I did it because the closer to the top we got, the less they had wanted to come up here, and I was afraid they would run if I put one of them on watch. So they sacked out, and I sat up with my back against a tree and blinked and yawned and tried to stay awake. I got to looking at the stars, too, and thinking about the man that Curl called the Moon Rider. And pretty soon, sure enough, the moon came up. That was when it hit me. You could never see the moon or the stars or the sun or anything like that in Aelfris. I never had when Taug and I went there, and I never had either when Garseg and I were swimming all over, watching the island be born and live and die, and watching the crag die and all of that. If you were lucky, what you saw was the place I had come from, the place where the western trader was, and Uringsmouth, and a lot more. You saw Mythgarther, and people living their lives up there, kind of the way you see somebody's whole life in a movie. It was not really like a movie. It was longer and more detailed, and you lost sight of somebody and went to somebody else. But you know what I mean. So this was not Aelfris at all. The bottom was in Aelfris, all right, but the top was in Mythgarther, the same way that our moon and our stars were really in the sky. So I had been right, and if anything could have kept me awake, it was that. But it did not. Pretty soon I went to sleep anyhow. I could not help it. The moon climbed up the bowl of sky and got brighter and brighter, but that was not what woke me. What woke me was Garseg. He came flapping up like a big flying dinosaur, bigger than a plane. His wings fanned me and made as much noise as a storm, and I jerked awake. He was still shrinking back into Garseg when he said, This may kill them. He pointed to Uri and Baki. Do you know that? I was yawning. I said, I guess, only I don't much care. Maybe I ought to, but I don't. They would not obey you? I had to drag them a little, and a couple of times I had to smack them around some. I didn't like that, but I did it. I tried not to hurt them too bad. Garseg nodded, really looking like himself now. They know they may die. I don't think so, I said. What I think is that Cedar ordered them not to come up here, and they still can't do it even if they want to. He enchanted them, or put a spell on them, or whatever you want to call it. Garseg smiled. Why would he do that? Do you know? I think so, I said. Did you get a chance to rest? I have had far more rest than you, I am sure. Then stand watch for us. Wake me at dawn. Sun up? He was testing me to see if I knew where I was, but I did not care. I said, whatever, and went back to sleep.
It was the middle of morning when I woke up. I thought Garseg had gone, but after I had splashed in the little creek I saw him, like you would see a ghost, sitting in deep shade under a big tree. I sat down beside him, not sure if I ought to be mad at him for letting me sleep. This is a durian, he said, and held up a funky-looking fruit. Would you like it? I said sure, and took it, and he picked up another one for himself. The smell is unpleasant, he told me, but the flesh is wholesome and delicious. It had a thorny peel on it, and I could not get it open. You found no weapon on your climb? I told him no. They're all down below in the armories. That's what Uri said. By the way, what happened to getting me up at sunrise? You said you would. I did not. Garseg was peeling his durian. You suggested that I awaken you at the first light. I asked whether you intended the rising of the sun. You said you did and slept. Did you dream? I nodded. How do you peel that thing? This is a good place for dreaming. It may well be the best place. What dream had you? I had mail and a helmet, a shield and a sword. It was hard to remember already. I rode down out of the sky like the moon rider. I think I came to do justice on earth, only the earth swallowed me. What does it mean? I have no idea. Nothing, perhaps. You know. You know all about all that stuff. He shook his head. I do not, and resist disturbing you with my speculations. Like you resisted waking us up. Can I try a bite of yours? He passed it over. I sniffed it like Gelf would have, and it stunk. It made me think of stinky cheese, though, and I like stinky cheese. I bit into it. It's good, you're right. You will find that I generally am. What woke you? I gave him his durian back. The sun in my face? I take it that it has not touched your slaves. They aren't slaves. Not yet, or I don't think so. We will know when it does, I believe. I looked for them, and they were right where they had lain down. There was a big flower bush between them and the sun. I said, do you really think they'll die? They may. Garseg sat quiet, fingering his beard while I tried to open my durian with my nails. Finally, he said, Before that happens, or does not happen, there are a dozen things I ought to tell you. Let me get through a few of them. First, I let you sleep because you must fight Kulili. You would fight, I know, even if you were exhausted. But you would be killed and that would be of no help to me. I said, I'd like to think I'd win anyhow. Perhaps you do, but I cannot afford such follies. He waited for me to argue, but I did not. Second, I lied to you. I told you I knew no oath that would bind an elf. I looked over at him. What is it? The elf are bound when they swear by their old high gods. When he said that, I got a funny feeling that the flying castle was going over us. I looked up, but there was just a lot of blue, with a few big solid-looking clouds. You mean the sky people? The overkinds? Yes, Garseg said, and no. I don't get you. He nodded like he had known it. It is not likely that you would. The old high gods of the Elf were indeed their sky people. That is, they were the people seen in the sky of Elfris. You mean... Wait a minute. Gladly. Are you talking about... About Bold Berthold or Curl? About the guys on the ship? People like that? Garseg nodded. You're saying I'm a god, too. That's crazy. Not to yourself, but to the elf. If they swear by you, they are bound. I'm not a god. You own a dog, Garseg smiled. I have spoken to him. He differs from the elf in that they have rebelled against you, but not otherwise. 
That got me to thinking about Gilf, the way he had followed me from the ford and swum out to the ship and hidden there starving. I said, I guess you're right, but sometimes he scares me. The elf worship me now, Garseg smiled again. Many do, and all will. There have been many times when they have frightened me. I thought about that, too, and it seemed to me that it was one of those things that sound like they make sense, but really do not. After a while, I hit on it, and I said, The Overkinds are immortal, Garseg. They live faster than we do. That's what Bold Berthold said. Whole years of life in one of our days, only they never die. Garseg nodded. The old high gods of the Aelf are likewise immortal. What will become of your spirit when you die? I tried to remember. Will it die too? I don't think so. Mine will. Garseg pointed to the chimeras. So will theirs. You have been aboard a ship, Sir Abel. What becomes of the wind when the wind dies? Right then one of them screamed, and I got up and went to look. Behind me Garseg called, Was that Uri or Baki? I could not tell, but the second one screamed too as soon as the sunlight touched it, so it did not matter. They were shaking, and their jaws were working, and their eyes looked like they were going to pop right out of their heads. I watched them a little while, and called out to Garseg, Come look, their wings are getting smaller. He did not say anything, so I said, Aren't you going to come? One of the chimeras was trying to say something. Her tongue was hanging out to where it could have licked her belly, but she was trying to talk just the same. The black stuff was falling off, too, and under that she was red. She made me think of a log in a fire. You whack it with a fresh stick, and the old burned stuff falls off, and you see the fire that was inside. They've got tits, I called to Garseg. They did, and they did not have claws anymore, either. Their lips covered up their teeth, too. Finally, I went back to Garseg. This is really hurting them a lot, I said. Is it just about over? He shook his head. It has hardly begun. I've been thinking, he laughed. It is good for you, provided you do not carry it to extremes. I love Desiree. How can I, if I'm a god to her? By being yourself. She's never worshipped me, and I wouldn't want her to. I worship her. Garseg looked at me the way that Miss Collins used to sometimes. Would she say the same, Sir Abel? Before I could answer, one of the chimeras stood up, only she was not a chimera any more. She was red all over, and her hair floated up from her head like there was a wind blowing up, just for it. It waved and snapped. She looked right at us, but you could see she did not see us. Pretty soon she stumbled away. She will throw herself off any cliff she reaches, Garseg told me. She is trying to fly back to Elfris. Will you stop her? I got up and caught her, no problem, and carried her to the durian tree. Is it all right to lay her in the shade? Garseg nodded, so I laid her down where I thought she would be comfortable. She was the color of a new penny all over, very slender and good-looking. When I sat down next to Garseg again, I said, You know this was going to happen. I feared it would be worse, that she would die. I still fear they both will, though that seems less likely now. One time Desiree and I were playing in the water, I said. I was thinking how Desiree's foot changed when the sunlight hit it, but when I said water, Baki must have heard me because she started begging for water. The creek was right near there, so I carried her a little bit, cupping it in my hand. Garseg pointed. You'll find a better container over there if you want it. I started looking, and he said, Under the lime tree with some other things. That was farther away. I asked if he would take care of the red elf girls while I was gone, and he said he would. It seemed to me then... Like that garden up on the roof of the skyscraper was the most beautiful place I had ever been in. The jungle that had grown up on the new island had been pretty too, but this was better. 
and I was in it. There were fruit and flowers everywhere. At first it seemed like there was nothing but grass underneath that lime tree. When I did find something, it was a white bone. Pretty soon I saw more, ribs and leg bones, and little bones that might have come from hands or feet. When I saw the skull, I went over to pick it up, and I stepped on a tube that looked like thick green glass. My foot was bare, like the rest of me, and did not break it. I picked it up, and took out the cork, and there was a long sheet of paper rolled up inside. I carried it to a sunny spot to look at. Chapter 25 The First Item When I went back to the Durian, the elf maidens were lying side by side, so quiet except for their hair that I was afraid they were dead. I called them elf maidens instead of chimeras, because that was what they were. There was no chimera left in them. When I saw they were still breathing, I showed Garseg the goblet I had found under the lime tree, and asked if it was what he had meant. He said it was, and I said, Should I bring them some water now? It can do no harm, provided you rinse it well. When I got it to the creek, I took sand off the bottom and rubbed the inside with it. It had been sort of dull and stained looking, but pretty soon I had it shining. Then I washed it out good and filled it with clean cold water. I propped one of the elf girls up, Uri, I think, and held the goblet to her mouth. Garseg was watching, not smiling or frowning or anything, just watching. I said, When Desiree's foot got sunshine on it, it didn't seem to hurt her. He nodded. Thus you thought that it would do them no harm to bring them here. You would break Cedar's hold and restore them to their proper shapes. I understand all that. But how did you know that the summit of this tower reached into your Mythgarther? Well, when they grabbed me and flew away with me, I thought this was where they were going, I said. At first, I thought it was just to drop me and kill me, but they could have done that without taking me up any higher. So I figured the top was where they roosted, and when we got there and they tried to eat me, I might be able to outfight them. Only one got scared and let go of my leg, and when I got over being scared myself, I sort of wondered what had gotten into it. I remembered about sunlight, and I knew it would fall if it turned back into a regular elf. Only there isn't any sun in Aelfris, so if it thought we were getting too close to sunlight, it had to be because we were getting too close to Mythgarther. Baki sat up. Back then I was not too sure which was who, but now I know it was Baki. She said, It is wonderful to fly. Her voice was pretty weak, and she kept her hands pressed to her temples. Will I ever fly again? You may resume the chimera shape whenever you choose, Garseg promised her, and shed it too, when you choose. I could see she did not understand, so I said, You're free again, and let her hold the goblet of water. No, Lord. She tried to smile, and seeing it like that, I just about cried. Not free? Nor do I want to be. I have a new master. Your slave, Garseg explained, as I warned you. I don't believe you ever promised to work for me, I told her. Or if you did, it was just a promise. You never swore or anything. L Lord, you are wrong. I swore it in my heart, where you could not hear me. After that, I wanted to know about sailors, because I was still thinking about the bones I had found. I asked Garseg if they saw the island the same way he and I had, and if they climbed way up here. This is the island they see, he waved his hand to show me what he meant. Without sitting up, the other elf maiden said, You d did not see all when you were in a elfris lord? Okay, not the top or the other side, but I'm not sure that makes a lot of difference. Do you elf leave bones when you die the way we do? Both of them said no, and Garseg wanted to know why I was asking about it. When I carried Desiree, I thought she was just a regular human woman. Did I tell you about that? No, Garseg said. 
nor did your dog, who confided that you had spoken often of your love for her when I was loath to come and heal you. Did you think I'd be afraid of you? I asked him. No, I feared you would attack us, as so many of your kind do. Well, I didn't. Anyway, I never had carried a woman before, and I thought she'd weigh a lot more than she did. She wasn't much heavier than a little kid, even though she was... You know, I made curves with my hands. Gerseg smiled. You shape a viola d'amore, a ver. If you say so, the thing is, I liked it, and the real desire wasn't anywhere near as nice. I liked it a lot. You were intended to. I guess. Only just now I found bones over there where you sent me to get the cup, and I thought it must have been one of the sailors you'd talked about, because the ale for so light and change shape. But I wanted to make sure. Garseg said, I doubt it. Well, if they're human bones... They were the bones of a woman. Before you woke, I found the pelvis. The pelvis always settles that question. I wouldn't think you'd know about that. Because we see no human bones, I wish that you were correct. Do you also suppose that though your men sometimes enjoy elf maidens, we in Aelfris are never favored by human women? Baki wanted water too, and I brought her some. Her hands shook too bad for her to drink until I held the cup for her. I was thinking about Garseg and what he had said and how he had sounded while she was drinking, and when she was finished, I said it was none of my business, but maybe he had known some human girls. Yes, and seen their bones. I said, I'm sorry. I did not know what else to say. So am I. You are still young, Sir Abel. You'll find that life is a cruel business. Let's not make it any worse. Were you wanting to go down to those armories now? Garseg shook his head. That's good, because I'm not going to leave them until they feel better. When I said that, Baki whispered, I'll go with you. As far as the armories may be, I think that ought to be all right. Wherever you go, Lord. Baki's voice was so weak I could hardly hear her. A voice like that should not scare anybody, but it scared me. I said, Are you talking about going to fight Kulili? That's crazy. Wherever you go. Garseg said, Do not argue with her, Sir Abel. You'll tire her. All right. I had way too much to think about, but I was trying to think about it just the same. You said I was still young, and you're right. I'm younger than you probably think. I don't know if I told you I'd been to Aelfris twice before. Only one time I don't remember it. We're going to have lots of time now, it seems like, so I'd like to tell you. Then do so. Like I said, I don't remember it. It's not like I lost track of the time. I lost track of everything. I don't know who I talked to or what I did. I told a lady named Parka about it when I got back. It seemed like she was one of the overkinds or something. Do you know her? He shook his head. She said I was supposed to know about the wrongs of the elf, so I'd tell people up here. Did you know me when I was in Aelfris before? No. Do you think the elf stole your memories? I guess they must have. I cannot be certain, Garseg said thoughtfully. But it seems more probable this being you call Parka did it. Why should the elf complain to you and cause you to forget it? I told her I didn't like them. It didn't make her mad or anything. His eyebrows went up. Do you still feel that way? I shook my head. That is well. I was going to explain that it would be pointless of the elf to rob you of your memories when there was something they wished you to remember. Can you do it? Take memories away? I cannot. Some say I am wiser than any elf, but I do not know a way to do that. What memories would you like to discard? About America? My real name and living there? Uri said, Is America your real name? It's a place where I used to live. That was before I went to Aelfris the first time. 
Gorsag said, A bad place, since you would forget it if you could. Not really, only... Only what? Only, I'm like that girl in the movie. I can't get it out of my head. I'm not going back, not even if I find the ruby slippers, because Desiree's here and not there. But I wish I could just forget about it. Sometimes I think Bold Berthold was my real brother, you know? He wasn't, but I think he was. I love him like he was, but I know he wasn't. Which you would like to forget. Right. He used to be a big, strong man with a big black beard. He's told me about it, and he thinks I remember it. Then the giants came, the Angerborn. They hurt him, really, really bad, and I don't think he'll ever get over it. I used to think that when people got sick, someday they'd be well. I may just be a kid, but I know better now. You miss the man you never knew. Yeah, sure. He was strong and smart and brave. We used to sit in his little hut at night. This is before Desiree, and he'd talk about things that had happened before he got hurt, and I could see what he had been like. I kept thinking it would be wonderful to be like that. Only I never could be, not really. Baki sat up. She still looked pretty shaky. You could never be what you are now? I tried to smile. It was not easy, but I tried, and I guess I did it. Oh, I'm plenty strong. Garseg showed me all about the sea, so probably I'm stronger now than Bold Bertold ever was. But I'm not brave, and I'm not smart. Inside I'm still a kid. Outside I'm a man, I guess, or anyhow I look like one. But I was scared to death when we fought the Austerlings. Nobody said anything then, so I asked Garseg if I had told him about that. No, but your dog did. You fought like a hero, and received the wound that the sea has healed. But I was scared. I was scared to death. Our sailors were fighting them through the rope net we'd put up, and I shot through it until all my arrows were gone. Slaying many. I nodded. Then that was the best thing you could do. My sea elf do not use the bow, which is of no value under water. But your desiree's moss elf are expert with it, and I have seen what slaughter one fine archer can make among his foes. They cut through the net. I was remembering a lot more than I was listening. They were made of good tough ropes, thicker than my thumb, but they cut them and our men were running. There wasn't anything else I could do. Garseg smiled. It required no courage, I am sure. That's right, I had to. I had Swordbreaker, and I yelled and jumped off the castle, and one stabbed me, and I fell down. Thus your ship was taken, and is now in the hands of the dreaded Austerlings. Garseg shook his head like he felt sorry for me. I failed to notice any when I went aboard, but it was due to my inattention, I feel sure. No, we chased them back onto their own boat. They cut the ropes and left some hooks behind and... and went away. Uri rolled her head to look at me. Why, Lord? I guess they were afraid we'd take it and kill the rest of them. We might have, too, if they hadn't cut the ropes. Garseg said, Then... You have omitted something from your account. I suspected it all along. You spoke of your fear, Sir Abel of the High Heart. Yeah? And of leaping from the stern castle sword in hand. I explained about its not being a sword. Sword breaker in hand in that case. After that you spoke of being stabbed. Through your armor, as I understand it from your dog. You fell. I suppose, to the deck. I said yes. Yet your being stabbed and falling to the deck cannot have taken place immediately after your leap. What did? I said I had hurt some people, hitting them with swordbreaker and so on. Some Austerlings. This isn't what I wanted to talk about, I told him. This isn't it at all. I want to say how brave bold Berthold used to be and how strong— only when I knew him, he wasn't like that any more. He was bent over, and sometimes he didn't think quite right. His beard had white in it, and he didn't want to go back to Griffinsford to stay. Not ever. 
He just wanted to live in the forest where they couldn't find him. But they did. They found him, and now he's gone. I had to wipe my eyes with my fingers then, and after a while I said, I'm sorry. For mourning the loss of your brother, the strongest may weep at such a time. This is what I wanted to say. I think what Desiree did was to make me grow up the way I would have if I hadn't been in Aelfris. Garseg did not seem to want to say anything about that. It seems like ten years. I mean, thinking about how I was before that night when she made me grow and the way I am now? About ten years. Or less. Only bold Berthold. He's maybe thirty, forty years older. Or he said, I feel better now, Lord. I think I can stay up if you'll help me. I did, and she sort of snuggled. Baki said, You just wanted his arms around you. Or he grinned at her. They're very nice arms. Kind of under my breath, I told Garseg, Sometimes I dream about the Austerlings. So do I. They sacrificed to us while they held the mountain of fire. Do you want my opinion on these matters? I said yes, I would really like it. I do not believe you will, or at least I doubt that you will be willing to accept every side of it. For a minute a garseg seemed to be thinking about where to start. The first item, the Austerlings. You believe you lack courage because you feared them. Do you imagine that your brother would have felt no fear? He fought the giants. And you the Austerlings, Sir Abel. You were afraid, but you mastered your fear. Do you imagine they were not afraid of you? If you do, we will find a pool in which you can look at your reflection. You had armor, a mail shirt and a steel cap. I bought them before we went on the boat. And sword breaker in your hand. Besides all of which, you were the man who had laid waste to them with the bow. Believe me, Sir Abel, they feared you from the moment they laid eyes on you. Well, they sure didn't act like it. I found the durian I had been trying to eat and started all over again, trying to get it open with my fingernails. It was just as bad as it had been the first time. Did you act as though you feared them? There did not seem to be anything I could say to that. I was not present, yet I know the answer. So do you, who were present. You mastered your fear until you fell wounded. They mastered theirs for a time. When a knight is on a ship, that ship flies his pennant from its foremast. Did yours do that? I shook my head. I don't have one, and I didn't know about it anyway. Maybe that's why the captain didn't think I was a real knight. In most cases the Austerlings will not attack such a ship. They must have been surprised and frightened when they found you were on board. I said, all right, what about the rest? Chapter 26, The Second Item, and The Third Very well. Let us move on to the next item. You brought a glass tube, as well as the goblet back from the lime tree. Certainly it must have struck you that I would see it sooner or later. Are you going to let me examine it? I said, after we had talked about the other things, I thought, it had been pretty well hidden in the long grass, and it was green anyway, but I picked it up and passed it to Garseg. There's a paper rolled up inside. He nodded. Did you break the seal? I told him there had not been any, and Uri leaned over to look. Baki came over so she could see better. They did not have anything on, then or after, and it was hard for me not to look at certain places, but I did it. Garseg pulled out the stopper and took out the paper. It's a scroll, he told us, a kind of book. He was untying the strings. I untied them too, I said. But they were tied just like that. Did you read it? I shook my head. I looked at it, but I can't read that kind of writing. Nor can I. This is the script of Celadon, presumably. He handed the scroll to Baki, who said, 
Uh-uh. I can read our writing, but not this stuff. Uri snuggled closer. If Baki cannot, I cannot. Garseg took the scroll from Baki, rolled it up again and tied it, and put it back into the tube. This may be the testament of the woman whose bones we found, but I have no way of knowing. You may keep it if you like, Sir Abel, or return it to its place. After I had put it back under the tree, I asked if he thought she knew she was going to die. Garseg pointed to the goblet. When one finds a cup beside a body, one assumes poison. That was why I advised you to rinse it thoroughly, although it has certainly been weathering here for a long time. If she was poisoned, she may have poisoned herself, and grasped her testament until she died. I tried to imagine why a woman would kill herself in such a beautiful place. You may have more questions about this. Ask them if you like, but I confess I have no more answers. You said you'd seen the bones, I reminded him. Did you see that glass tube, too? He shook his head. I looked around, but the sun was only just coming up. I did not see it. You were talking about a big war when the elf drove out Cedar. I said it like that because I thought Garseg did not want Uri and Baki to know who he really was. So I felt like I was being smart, but Uri started shaking, and I had to promise her I would not say the name any more. We were supposed to die, she told me. If we came up here, we were supposed to die. Baki said that, too. He forgives you, Garseg told them. I could see they did not understand, but the way he said it made them believe it, or almost. A thousand of your years have passed since that war, Garseg told me. I can give you a wealth of detail if you want it, but do you? I guess not. Only I was thinking about that woman. Those bones can't have been here that long, can they? In this well-watered place, certainly not. Then the person who built this skyscraper we're on didn't put her up here? Who can say? A thousand years here might be a hundred in Aelfris, or even less. Baki said, Besides, he comes back. Let's not talk about him at all. I was thinking hard. For one thing, it seemed to me like the woman might have been shipwrecked, but if she had been, why did she kill herself? I asked Garseg again about the top of the skyscraper being an island in Mythgarther, and he said again that it was. Then I said, All right, if it's an island, why don't I hear the sea? I haven't heard the sea the whole time we've been up here. When it is calm as it often is, it makes no great noise. Well, I'm going to look. You stay here with these sick girls. Really humbly, Baki said, Uri and Baki, Lord, I am Baki. That was when I got them straight. I never did get them mixed up again after that. Garseg shook his head, meaning he was not going to stay, but I did not pay any attention. The sun was still only halfway up the sky, so to keep it out of my eyes, I turned my back to it and went west. I broke twigs and let them hang every hundred steps or so, and after a while I heard Garseg behind me. He said, Why do you do that? I did not look. So I can find my way back, of course. And why do you want to go back? Because those girls are sick and we ought to be taking care of them. I was hoping you'd stay with them and do it. The Elf have struggled to free themselves from the monster called Kulili throughout their history. You are their last hope, and their best. I am not letting you out of my sight. No, not for ten thousand puking maidens. I had stopped to look at a tree of a shade of green I had never seen before. I am sure it came from Aelfris, but it was so fresh and new-looking that it seemed like God had just made it, like he had planted it a minute before I got there. It had blue and purple flowers, and the long feelers, or whatever you call them, inside the flowers were bright red. I have never seen another one like it, and I have remembered it all this time. Anyway, I heard Garseg laugh behind me, but I still did not look at him. But when I started walking again, I asked if we were going the right way. I have no means of knowing, 
Or, say rather, that I know that any direction will prove right if we cleave to it long enough. This may be the shortest way, it may be the longest, in any event. It will take us to the sea in the end. I still don't hear any waves, nor do I. But if we continue as we have begun, we will hear them if there are any. I thought about that, and the weather. There was hardly any wind, and so I said, That's right, it's pretty calm. It is, and it is in just such weather as this that this isle is most often sighted by seamen. It is a thing of heat and calm, most often seen at twilight. If it's too calm to sail, couldn't they row here? They could, and some do. I had been pretty mad at Garseg because he had gone away and left Uri and Baki to take care of themselves. But I got to thinking about all the things he had done for me, and how I had left them just as much as he had. So I stopped and motioned for him to catch up to me, and we walked together a little. We were in the shade of the trees all that time. Before long we came to where the shade was only spotty, sunshine coming through the leaves in bright patches, sort of dappled. Then it seemed like something a whole lot bigger than Garseg was walking beside me. Only it was not. It was not really like a snake, and it was not really like a bird either. But I have to write those because they are as close as I can get. It was beautiful and terribly scary. I do not remember all the colors, and they changed anyway, but the thing was that whatever colors there were were the darkest those colors could ever be. The blue was darker than black usually is, and so was the gold, a sort of brown gold with a deep, deep luster you felt like you could fall into. And dark, like you had seen something gold in the middle of a storm, but nowhere near as real as smoke. I could hardly see Garseg at all right then, but he looked like he was about to laugh. I told him I liked him better when he was Garseg. I know. That's what you really are, isn't it? You're Cedar. Are you really from the world under Aelfris? I am. Will you turn aside for a step or two now, Sir Abel? There is something to be seen here more important than any view of the sea, and if you will consent I will show it to you. I felt like I had already seen something important, but I said I would. Chapter 27. Kulili There was not any path, just soft grass and ferns underneath the big trees, down, around, and down again until it brought us to a little toy valley that could not have been more than a hundred yards long and wide. It was so pretty down there it took your breath away. There were tiny little waterfalls coming out of the rocks, and a pool in the middle with white lilies growing all around it, and some other kind of white flower that was prettier than the lilies, more ferns, too. The ones I had seen before had been little, but there they were huge, like the ferns were in Aelfris. They arched up over my head so high I could have ridden a horse under them and never taken my helm off. It was dark shade there, and Garseg looked completely real, so real I knew if I touched him I would not feel the thing he really was at all. Where the shade was thickest, there was a white statue. It was a naked woman, but where it was in that dark shade, it sort of loomed out at me like a ghost. One hand looked like she wanted to cover up her breasts, and the other hand looked like she was begging for something. I was naked myself, as I guess I have already said, and when I saw that statue, something happened that had happened at school when I watched the girls play volleyball. I did not want Garseg to see it, so what I did was to jump right into the pool. It worked, too, because the water was good and cold. When I came up I tossed my hair out of my eyes, the way you do, and tried to grin. Garseg bent over to look at me. Why did you do that? To cool off and wash away my sweat. Aren't you hot after all that walking? I was. He gave me his hand and I swam over and climbed out. Look, wait until the ripples die, and look carefully. You said you wanted to show me my reflection, I said, so I'd know why the Austerlings were scared of me, only I don't think they were. Is that all this is? No, 
Look deeply into the pool, Sir Abel. I did. It looked like that pool went down forever, but kind of crooked and off to the side, and I said so. Like many such waters, it is a gate to Elfris, Garseg told me. I am showing it to you, so that you will know how such gates look. Could you not tell, when the Kelpies carried you to me, that you were entering Elfris? I shook my head. Does it not seem to you that you should be peering down into the topmost story of the Tower of Glass? It had not hit me before, but he was right. The dirt on the island could not have been more than ten or twelve feet deep. I really stared after that, and I remembered that even though I had sunk down quite away when I jumped in, I had never touched bottom. Here one may stand in Mythgarther and scrutinize the gate, Garseg said. Remember what you are seeing, fix it in your mind. In times to come, what you learn may be of value to you. I could not believe that pool went down to Aelfris, and I said so. It did look funny, very funny, down there. But I had jumped in already, and the only thing that happened was what I had wanted to happen. I still could not look at the statue. It made Uri and Baki look like boys. I said... Are you telling me I could get to Aelfris like that, if you were with me so I wouldn't drown? You will never drown, Garseg told me. You are one with the sea, more than you know. The way he said it, I knew he meant it. And all I could think about then was that Desiree was an Aelfris. I want her more than I have ever wanted anything in my life, and I dove right in. I would do it again. It did not even feel very cold the second time. And as soon as I started to slow down, I began swimming hard. I had been a pretty good swimmer even back in America, and while I had been with Garseg, I had gotten so good, you would think I was putting you on if I told you how good I was. I went down and down. It should have gotten darker and darker, only it did not. There was beautiful blue light, like I had seen under the sea before, and seeing it before did not make it any less beautiful. Now... After a while I decided I could use a little rest, and I just let myself float in it while I tried to figure out which way was up. It probably seems to you like that ought to be pretty easy, and the fish always know, but when there are no fish in sight and you cannot see anything but that beautiful blue haze, you have to think about it. I floated there a long time, or anyhow it seemed long to me. There was a little current that turned me slowly around and around and carried me along, and that felt great. I was thinking about Desiree and the statue, and they got mixed up in my mind, and I started wondering if I was really real at all. It seemed to me this might be what it was like when you were just a memory, and maybe Desiree was remembering me, and would always remember me, would always love me like I would always love her, and this was me in her mind. I am Kulili. It was not really a sound in my ear at all. It was more like a sound in the bones of my skull. Down, come down. I did, and I knew which way down was, because that was where her voice was coming from. The blue light went purple, then everything went black. Fingers touched my face, only I knew they were not really fingers at all. It seemed sort of not fair, and I said, I can't see you. You shall, by my will. Who are you? I said. All of a sudden it seemed to me I did not even know who I was. Was I really just a kid from America? A knight? Bold Berthold's brother? I am Kulili. You are the man who has sworn to fight Kulili. Abel, I told her. My name's Abel. Will you fight me? I don't know. It did not seem to matter much either way. I suppose I'll have to try, I promised. So I judge. Your honor is sacred to you. You're a monster. That's what Garseg said. It had been really, really dark up until then, but when I said that, there was a green light off in the distance. I thought, what the heck is that? A luminous fish. They come here sometimes. It's hard to think. I don't know why I said that, but it was true. Why is it so hard to think here? My water is cold. Why did you bring me here? She did not answer. Is it okay if I swim back up? 
I'd like to get warm again. Before you kill me? She was laughing at me, but it did not make me mad at all. I kind of liked it. You could kill me real easy down here if you wanted to. I will not. You killed the elf when they came to kill you. That's another thing Garseg said. This world was mine. Mine in a time when there were no elf. They drove me from the land into the water and from the water into these depths. I can be driven no farther. Would you see me? Like somebody had just dropped it there, there was a clear picture in my mind. It was the statue, only alive. You looked into the pool. What you saw was yourself as you are to others, what you see now I am, in the eyes of others. I could not imagine anybody hating anybody so beautiful. I asked why the elf hated her. Ask them. Well, why do you hate them? I do not. But I must fear them, as long as they fear me. The beautiful woman was gone. Instead I saw a strange forest. There were trees like phone poles, with a few big leaves at the top. There were pools of water all over, and down where the roots were, something really big was getting bigger and sending out feelers every place. The trees talked to this woman under them, and the little plants did too. She answered all of them, one at a time, and was great. She saw them all, and she saw their souls, because each of them was wrapped in a soul like a man would wear a cloak. Their souls were beautiful colors, and no matter what color they were, they sort of glowed. Insects ate the leaves and spilled their sap, and there were all sorts of animals that would eat the bark and kill the trees. So the woman underneath them made protectors for them, taking little bits of their souls and little pieces of herself, pale gray wisdom that gleamed like pearls. Sticks, leaves, and mud, too, and fire and smoke and water and moss, all sorts of stuff. At first the protectors were sort of like animals, too, but the big woman under the roots looked up into the sky and saw Mithgarther, and people up there plowing and planting flowers and tending orchards. So she made the protectors more like them. They were a lot like scarecrows, but they got better and better, and got so they could change their shapes to make themselves better yet. Some still protect, even from me. Do you know them? I saw Desiree, and it choked me up. I felt like I was going to die if I could not touch her and talk to her, and I said, Yes, I love her. Kulili said, So do I. Then Desiree was gone. Would you see me now, with your eyes of flesh? I think I said yes. We waited then. It was not like ten minutes or ten seconds. It was the time they had before somebody built the first clock. I hung there in the cold seawater, turning and waiting, and that was all I did. White, yellow, and green lights went around and around me and hay-colored lights, and sky-colored. Our lamp. They came together, and I saw they were really fish. There were little orange fish that glowed like the flames of candles, black fish with huge heads and bad dream teeth that hung red and blue bait in front of their own mouths, long silvery fish with gills and tails like light bulbs and big blue fish with rows of blue lights down their sides, and a lot more kinds that I forget. All sorts of reds and yellows and pinks, and every kind of color. Only they were not important. What was important was down under them, and it was white thread, a big, big tangle of white thread, all of it alive and sort of groping. When I first saw it, I thought it did not have any shape, but as soon as I thought that, it did. There was a mouth that could have swallowed the western trader, and a nose like a hill. Only it was a beautiful nose, and a beautiful mouth, too. Pretty soon there were eyes, white eyes, that looked blind. They blinked, and they had pupils I could have dived into. And they were blue eyes, and there was color in the cheeks just like roses were blooming there. It was the woman the statue had been made like, only the statue was usually bigger than the person. 
Way down in the dark sea water was the real person, and she could have worn the statue around her neck on a chain. Will you kill me? Still? In the first place, I did not want to. In the second place, I did not think I could. I said, I'll have to try, Kurlili. I'll have to try my best, because I promised I would. But I hope you get away. I hope I won't be able to do it. Now? No. These fish of yours could kill me pretty easy, and I haven't even got a sword. May it be long before we meet again. Chapter 28 Three Years It was a long swim to the surface. It is funny, but when you have been way deep down, it always seems like you are closer to the top than you really are. It is black down where you are, darker than any real night ever gets. You swim up quite a way, and it gets light. You can see things, and you think you're only ten or twelve feet down. So you keep swimming up, maybe twenty-five feet, maybe fifty or a hundred. And you do not get to the top, and nothing much changes. I felt like I was almost there half a dozen times, probably, before I really got there. When I did, it was sort of a shock. For one thing, I had not been breathing, and I was used to it. My head came out in the trough between two waves. I breathed out hard, and water ran out of my nose and mouth and down my chin. And then a big wave hit me in the face. I choked, and when I got my head into the air again, I was making noises like a coffee pot. When I could breathe, I started to laugh. After that, I swam in and out of the waves and had a big time. Probably I played like that for half an hour. I could see the sun, so I knew I was back in Mithgarther again, and not in Aelfris. I also knew that when I had been way deep down with Kulili, that had been Aelfris. I figured I was pretty close to the island, and whenever I wanted to, I could swim over that way and see about the two elf girls and Garseg, and tell Garseg it was going to take a whole lot more than a spear or a battle-axe for me to kill Kulili and I really did not want to anyway. When I thought about it, I started hoping that I could trade him another favor for that one. Maybe a couple of them. Or three. Pretty soon I decided that was enough fun, and anyway it might be a long swim to the island, so I had better get started. I jumped up out of the water the way that fish do sometimes and had a look around. After the first one, I did it again, and again after that. The island was nowhere in sight. In fact, there was no land anywhere. The only thing I could see was a ship about a mile away. I decided to swim for that because it would at least get me up higher. There was quite a bit of wind then, but the ship was headed toward me on a slant, so all I had to do was cut across to where it would be and wait. I could swim faster than it was sailing anyhow, so catching it was bound to be pretty easy. I did not recognize it until it was close. A lot of paint had flaked off the forecastle, and some of the gold was missing from the wooden woman with the basket in front, but it was the western trader just the same. I could not believe it, even when I climbed up the side. The lookout yelled something, I do not know what, and slid down the forestay, dropping off it in front of me. He sort of goggled at me, then he got down on his knees. Sir Abel, I didn't know twas you, sir. I didn't know what twas, sir. I'm sorry, sir, I never meant no offense, sir. By wind and water I never done. Nor gave any, I told him. No sweat. If... Wait a minute, you're Pauk. Aye, sir. You've changed. It's the beard. How long have I been gone, Pauk? Three years, sir. We... I thought you wasn't never coming back, sir. Captain didn't neither. Nobody done. The captain, I thought I killed him. Captain Curl, sir, what was mate? I, I signed papers, sir, cause they wouldn't feed me less than I done it, and, and I've been here ever since, sir, top man of the main now, sir, and I've had worse births. I shook his hand and told him I was proud of him. Only I won't be no more, sir, if you'll have Captain strike me off article, sir. Your man again, sir, Abel, same as before, if there's no feeling about me doing something else while you was gone. Pauk paused and gulped. Or even if there is, sir. 
if you'll have me just the same. I did not know what to think of him, and I said, You've got a good job here. You just said so. I, sir. I can't pay you or feed you. Look at me. I don't even have a pair of pants. I'll lend you one of mine, sir. Only they'll be too small, maybe. Thanks. But you're right. I'd be sure to split them. Probably I couldn't even get them on. We'll have to talk to the captain. Captain Curl? Aye, sir. Pauk nodded. I know that you can't take yourself off duty, and you shouldn't even be talking to me, but before I go looking for Curl, I want to know why you'd quit your job to work for me when you know I haven't got any money. Selfishness is all it is, sir. Pauk would not look me in the face. What do you mean, selfishness? Crew's got to stick together, sir. You're supposed to stick to your shipmates, see? But, but it's my big chance, sir. Likely the only one I'll ever get. I'm going. He turned away so I could not see his face. I patted his shoulder and went to look for Curl. There was a little runway of deck alongside the forecastle, and as I walked along that I wondered what the rest of the crew would make of me. As soon as I rounded the corner I found out. I had not taken two more steps before I was surrounded by cheering men. Hello there, a new mate shouted from the sterncastle deck. What's that gabble? Stations, all of you, stations! A sailor I did not remember yelled, It's Sir Abel, sir! He's back! Somebody else yelled, Give a cheer, men! They did it, and all the noise brought Curl out of his cabin. He started asking questions, then he saw me in the middle of a bunch of sailors, and he just gaped. It was not real easy to push through all of them without hurting anybody, but I did it. I got to him and told him we needed to talk, and the two of us went into the cabin. By Rand's ropes, he said, by sky, wind, and rain. Then he hugged me. I have been really, really surprised a lot in the time I have been in Mithgarther and Eofris, but I do not know if I have ever been any more surprised than I was when Curl hugged me unless it was by that one night with the skull for a crest I fought up in the mountains of the mice. I do not believe there has ever been a human man that could squeeze me hard enough to break my ribs, not even Hela's brother Hymir, and Hymir was not strictly human. A lot of people would say he was not human at all, and as soon as it got to be hot summer he would sweat like a horse even sitting under a tree. Only Curl came pretty close. I could hear them creak. I've been in Aelfris, I told him when he finally let me go. I don't know for how long. I mean, I don't know how many of their days. Sit down, sit down! Crow got out a bottle and pulled the cork and found glasses for us. I was thinking about the island that had come up out of the tear in the sea, the one where I had seen Desiree and how I had watched the trees grow on it. So I said, maybe it was years there, too. I don't know if they have years, really. They talk about them, but maybe it's just because we do. Drink up, Curl shoved a glass at me. This calls for a celebration. I shook my head, because I was still thinking about Garseg, and that had reminded me of Uri and Baki and the whole thing with the Isle of Glass. I sipped the wine, though, and it was really good wine, the best I had ever tasted up to then, and I told Curl so. Gave somebody that needed him a couple casks of water, he grinned. He gave me five bottles of this. Hard not to have three or four glasses with my dinner every night, but I don't let myself do it. This is different. It's a special occasion, and I wouldn't want to die and leave one of those bottles wet. I'm lucky you feel like that. I drank some more. Can you take me to Forsetti? Will you? Aye. We're way down south here and heading back. We can stop off there. Curl's grin faded. I'm going to have to make some stops on the way, though, sir. That all right? I said okay. I had been going to Forsetti because Duke Martyr would probably need another night, and sitting there naked in that cabin, it hit me that if he had needed somebody to take Rov's place, he probably had him already, and I was going to need a lot of stuff when I got there, like clothes. So I asked Curl if they had anything on the ship that I could wear. That brought the grin back. We kept yours for you, he told me. 
He opened a chest and held up Swordbreaker, still in her scabbard, and the scabbard still on my old sword belt. I don't guess you've forgotten this. That made me smile. I remember it pretty well. Clothes, too? Curl lifted out a double armful. Saved them all for you, put cedar shavings on them to keep the moths off, and they ought to be good as new. He put them on the bed for me to look at. I thanked him and told him how much I meant it, and I really did, and said I would sleep on deck and do whatever work I could to pay for my food. You'll sleep right here, sir? Curl sounded like he meant that, too. This here's your cabin just like these here are your boots, sir. Your cabin till you get off at Forsetti, sir, and I'm proud to give it to you. I can't pay. Wait just a minute. I left money here when I went away with the elf. If you kept it for me, too, Curl could not meet my eyes. I spent it, Sir Abel. I had to. We was stove off Needham, and laid up seven weeks for repairs, sir. I'll pay it all back, I swear, only I can't pay you back but a little right now. He opened his strong box for me and showed me what he had, and there was so little in there, just copper and brass and four pieces of silver, that I almost let him keep all of it. Only I knew I was going to have to have something, and I took half. A couple of days after that, we came in sight of the mountain of fire. I was curious about it because of what Garseg had said, and I asked Curl and some people in the little port nearby, where we sold some cloth Curl had not been able to sell farther south. It had belonged to the Austerlings, and they had pushed people into the opening at the top because it bypassed Aelfris and went straight to Muspel where the dragons are. If it had just been their own people, we probably would not have cared, but they raided, and ate people they captured the way they do, and pushed in the ones they would have liked to eat most, so the dragons would help them. King Arnthor had taken the mountain of fire, fortified it, and left a garrison there. Some of the men-at-arms were in the town when we were, drinking and trying to pick up girls. They were the first men-at-arms I had seen, and I was anxious to see knights. There were donkeys for rent at the stable, but I had very little money, and Pauk had none. So we decided to walk. Chapter 29 My Bet if I had known what was in store for us, I would never have gone, and if I had gone anyway, there is no way I would have let Pauk come with me. As it was, we had a nice time of it, setting out early in the morning before the sun was hot, and holding walking races for forfeits. It got warmer, and we slowed down a lot, basically walking from shade to shade, if you know what I mean. We were lucky because there was a lot of shade, but we were unlucky too because there were a lot of bugs. The bugs were not so lucky themselves, though. We must have swatted about a hundred, and I got to wishing I could put them all together in one big bug and shoot arrows at it. I was trying to figure out some way to do that when a farmer came along with a cart full of fruit he was taking to the mountain of fire. He gave us a ride and let us eat mangoes as we rode along. We promised to help him unload when he got to the mountain, but when he found out I was a knight he would not let me. When we got there, Pauk had to unload for both of us. While he was doing that, I was talking to some of the men-at-arms there about the walls and towers and so on, and who was there. Lord Thunrolf was in charge of everything. We were already inside the first wall, a kind of little one, but long, that walled off the whole side where the mountain could be climbed. I told them I was a knight, which I was, and said I wanted to go on up the road and see the big walls and towers up higher, and maybe even climb on up to the place where the smoke was coming out. Curl had said the smoke came from Muspel, and I thought that was pretty tough to believe, and it was probably just a story somebody had told him, so I wanted to see for myself. They said I could not go up unless Lord Thunrolf said it was all right. I said, fine, where is he? Of course, he was up quite a ways in the castle they called the Round Tower, so I got to see a lot while they were taking me up to him. It was beautiful and scary, both at once. You looked up and up, and what you mostly saw was towers and more towers, and walls, one on top of the other, and big spaces of bare rock. There were flags on the tallest towers, the king's flag, 
and Lord Thunralf's, and the banners of some of the knights that were knights banneret, and the pennants of the other knights. There were shields hung on the battlements of the towers too, with each knight's arms on them. The stone everything was built of had been quarried right there in the mountain, and it was of all sorts of colors, mostly red and black and gray. And up above everything was the top of the mountain, with snow on it and smoke coming up out of the snow. Black smoke that drifted up and up into sky, as if the dragons of Muspel were trying to smoke out the Valfather and the other overkinds. I will never forget it. It was a steep climb, but after a while it got cooler and there was a lot more wind, and before we had gone halfway I felt like I understood why Thunrolf bunked up there where he did, instead of down in the lowlands. There were no more bugs, either. With only one road going up to the top, it was pretty clear the Austerlings could not take back the mountain unless they took all the fortifications along that road, one after another, or starved out the garrison. I never even tried to find out how much food and water they had up there, but Thunrolf told me there were big cisterns cut into the rock, and since it rained a lot, they were generally full. But storming the walls and towers looked about as bad to me as storming the Tower of Glass. Back then I did not know that the Austerlings were going to take it away from us, or that we were going to take it back. If you had told me I was going to be the one that gave the order to give it up and retreat south, I would have said you were crazy. Building more walls and more towers was the main thing Thunrolf and his men did there when Pauk and I were there the first time. They built up all the walls more and built new ones. The men-at-arms had to work on them some, and they had hired local people too. The knights bossed the job, and Thunrolf bossed the knights. Knights are not supposed to work with their hands, just fight and train to fight. I thought I knew about that from certain things I had picked up on in Erring's mouth, but I never really knew how strong it was until we got to Forsetti. Anyway, they were taking every place where the road was narrow and the mountainside was really rough, and building walls with gates for the road, and towers so archers could shoot down on everybody. They had started at the bottom, and they were working their way up. We got to the big tower and climbed four or five flights of stairs to get to the floor where Thunrolf was. Then we had to wait and wait. We had eaten a couple of mangoes each on the cart, but that seemed like it had been years ago. We were both hungry and really thirsty. Every so often somebody would come and talk to one or the other of us, asking who we were and what we wanted. I was tired and did not pay a whole lot of attention when they were talking to Pauk, and maybe that was a mistake. Finally I told him to go off and find us some food and something to drink, and after that I waited by myself. It got later and later, and I wondered whether Thunrolf or somebody would let us stay overnight and give us a place to sleep. I was about to try leaving to see if anybody would stop me, when a serving man came out and told me to come in. I had seen him before. He had been in and out of that room where Thunrolf was half a dozen times, but this time he had a kind of smirk when he looked at me. I did not like it, but I could not do anything about it, so I followed him inside. Thunrolf was sitting at a table with a bottle of wine and some glasses on it. I had told the serving man my name, and he told Thunrolf. Thunrolf told me to sit down and motioned to the serving man to pour me some wine, which I thought was nice of him. He was a tall man with long legs. Most men his age have beards or mustaches, but he did not, and looking at him I decided he probably drank too much and did not eat enough. So, you're a knight, I said yes. Here in a ship bound for Forseti. You've come a long way out of your way. I tried to make a joke out of that. I generally try to go straight to the place I'd like to get to, but I don't seem to be good at it. He frowned. Has no one taught you to say my lord when you speak to a baron? I'm sorry, my lord. I guess I haven't been around barons very much. He waved his hand like it did not matter and drank some wine, which gave me the chance to drink a lot of mine. My mouth felt like the inside of an old shoe, and the wine was cool and tasted great. 
You wish to go to the summit of my mountain and look over the countryside. I said, Yes, my lord, if it doesn't put you to a lot of trouble. It might be arranged, sir. The serving man had told him, but I said, Sir Abel of the High Heart. So now you want to carry your high heart and the rest of you too, Dunroff laughed at his own joke. His laugh did not make me like him better, but pretty soon he said, Have you supped? No, my lord. You're hungry? You and the man with you? We sure are. I see. You might sup with us, Sir Abel, but if you do, two points must be settled before supper. The first is the rank of your companion. You told Master Egorn that he was a friend. I nodded. Not another knight? No, my lord, just a friend. Knights can have friends that aren't knights, can't they? Not a man-at-arms? No, my lord, Pauk's a sailor. I see. Thunrolf drank some more wine. I did too, but then I decided I had better stop. My lips felt funny. Say rather that I don't see. Your friend told Ottil he was your servant. I sent Master Oud to speak with him, and he told Master Oud the same thing. One of you is lying. I tried to smooth it over. Pauk is afraid people won't think I'm very important, my lord, and of course I'm not. He wants them to think I am, so he says that. Maybe it would be true if I could afford to pay him, but I can't. You're poor? Very, my lord. I thought as much. Here is the other difficulty I mentioned. We have a custom here. I ought to say my knights do. Barbaric, if you ask me, but the custom is the custom, Thunrolf belched. A new knight. You are a knight? Yes, my lord, as I told you. I know you did. I hadn't forgotten that. A new knight must fight their champion with blunted swords on the table before supper. He must fight him, excuse it, for a wager of one scepter. You look stricken, Sir Abel. Are you afraid to fight? No, my lord, but... But what? From the way he was looking at me, I knew he thought I was scared, and I did not like that, but there was not a lot I could do about it. I said, Well, for one thing, I don't have a scepter, my lord. He opened a drawer on the table and rummaged around in there and pulled one out. I do, he said. He held it up. Should I lend it to you? Yes, my lord, please. I'll pay back if I win, I promise. And if you lose. He was looking at me with his eyes almost closed. Because you will lose, Sir Abel. Never doubt it. I won't be able to. Talking about bets like that, I remember the forfeits Pauk and I had paid with when we raced. I said, Maybe I could do you a favor instead, my lord. I'd do just about anything you wanted. Anything, Sir Abel? I was pretty sure I was getting into trouble, but right then I did not care much. Yes, my lord, anything. Well and good. He tossed me the scepter. I have been nurturing a little notion. We will have to go to the top of my mountain, which should suit you very well. A good plan, you see. Good plans fit together like, oh, stones in a wall. That sort of thing. So you will get to go to the top of my mountain as you wish, and I will have my plan as I wish. He poured me some more wine and made me clink glasses with him. I drank a little bit more. There's another problem, my lord, only I don't think it's as bad. You said blunted swords, and I won't use a sword. Can I use this instead? I took out Swordbreaker then and showed her to him. He held it for a minute and sort of waved it around the way you do and gave it back. I am afraid not, Sir Abel, it's a mace. You said so yourself. I said okay. Which makes it much too dangerous. I don't want to see anyone killed. I will find something else for you. Have you got a shield, by the way? I said no, and he said he would see about that too. It was already time for supper, so we went down to the hall. There were a lot of people there, already, and a lot more coming in, and we were standing there watching them when Pauk found us. He said he had not found anything for us to eat or drink, either, but maybe somebody there would let us have something, 
so I explained that we could eat with the others as soon as I fought up on the table like Thunrolf wanted. Thunrolf pointed to a place and made Pauk sit down. Then we went up to the head of the table, and he explained to me that knights sat up front close to him at the high table. A knight's friend, that was not a knight himself, ought to sit at the far end of the high table with the men-at-arms. So that was where he had put Pauk. Servants sat at the low table that was close to the door. And did I want to change anything? I said no. Somebody, I guess Master Oud, brought us the blunted swords. They were just regular old swords, pretty plain, with the points and edges ground flat. The knight that was going to fight me took one, and I explained again about how I was not going to use a sword, even one like that, that was not sharp. So Thunrolf sent somebody for the chief cook, and he came, and Thunrolf explained and told him to bring me a shield and something I could use that was not a sword. That was when they took Swordbreaker and my bow. The chief cook came back pretty quick, and for a shield he had one of those pewter covers they put over a dish, and for a sword a long iron spoon. I did not like it, but I had to get up on the table and take them. Everybody was telling me to by then, and yelling and laughing, and to tell the truth they picked me up and set me up there. I thought, all right, I am bigger and stronger than this guy, and I am going to show them. Right here let me get rid of the excuses. I had drunk too much wine with Thunrolf, and I was none too steady. That is the plain truth. Also, they were grabbing my ankles and trying to trip me. That is the truth, too. Only neither one of those was what really did it. He was a swordsman, a good one, and I was not. Until I tried to fight him, I did not even know what a good swordsman was, or what one could do. I hit his shield hard enough to bend my spoon, and so what? He never hit my serving dish cover at all. He had around it, and he could make me move it whenever he wanted, and wherever he wanted. He was probably a pretty nice guy, because I could see he felt sorry for me. He hit me three or four times, not too hard, and then he knocked me right off the table. I got up and gave him the scepter I had borrowed, and that was the end of our bet. Thunrolf was laughing, everybody was, and he slapped my back and made me sit by him. There was beer and more wine and soup, meat, and bread. There was a kind of salad, too, that had cut up roots in it or something crunchy like that, and oil and salt fish. That was pretty good, and so was the meat and bread. Afterward there was fruit, I think the same mangoes we had ridden on that morning. I ate a lot, but Thunrolf did not eat much at all. He just kept drinking, but he never seemed really drunk. Later I got to know more Cain, and she was like that, too. She drank brandy instead of wine and she drank quite a bit of it. It put a lot of color in her face, and she swayed sometimes when she walked, but she never sang or got silly or passed out. I never understood why she drank so much, or why Thunrolf did either. Chapter 30 The Mountain of Fire When supper was about over, Thunrolf stood up and banged on the table with one of those silver glasses until everybody quieted down. "'Friends,' he said, "'true knights, brave men-at-arms, bold archers,' he sort of stopped and looked hard at them before he said, "'loyal servants.' He kicked over his chair and went down to the servant's table, and his voice got slow and serious. "'I have reason to believe that offence has been given, given to us all, but to you loyal servants most of all.' He spun around after he said that, and came close to falling down, and pointed to Pauk. "'Aren't you a servant, Sir Abel's serving-man?' Pauk jumped up. "'Aye, sir!' The other servants sort of growled at that, and so did the men-at-arms Pauk had been eating with. "'You have pushed in among your betters,' Thunrolf told him, "'and turned your back on your comrades. "'If I left your punishment to them, "'you would get such a beating as would cripple you for life.' Would you like that? No, sir, Pout said. I just... Silence. I will spare you the beating. Is the smith here? He was with the men-at-arms, too, and stood up. Thunrolf whispered to him, and he went out. I want six intrepid knights, six in addition to Sir Abel there, he named the ones, 
and said that anybody else could come who wanted to see it. Thunrolf had a horse, and so did his knights, but Pauk and I had to walk, and so did most of the ones that came with us. The road got steeper and steeper, and finally there was a long flight of stairs where the ones that had horses had to leave them, and then more road, and then more stairs with snow and ice on them clear to the top. Some people stopped there and went back, but there were men-at-arms watching us, and we did not try. I told Pauk it was not much to somebody who had climbed to the top of the Tower of Glass, and he told me it was not much to somebody who had climbed to the top of the mainmast as often as he had. We cheered each other up like that, but the truth was that it was a stiff climb, and when I had gone up the stairs in the Tower of Glass with Uri and Baki, we had stopped to rest every so often. Going up the mountain of fire, nobody stopped at all. We got to the top, and it was beautiful, just beautiful. Down in the lowlands, it was already night, and you could see lights in the towers along the bottom wall, and here and there out past it, out in the jungle, where somebody had a little house or maybe just a campfire. Up where we were, there was a fresh, cool wind, and it was still sunset. The clouds over the sea were gold and gray, and I looked at some and thought, you know, a bunch of knights might ride down that valley any minute. And when the sun got just a little lower, some knights did. They were tiny and way far away, but I could see their flags and the gleam of their armor, and it was just beautiful. I will never forget it. Only I never got to see where they were going, because I heard a hammer and looked around to see what it was. The smith had locked a jive, a kind of iron ring, around Pauk's ankle, and he was pounding a staple into a big rock so that Pauk would be chained to the rock. When he was through, Thunrolf told Pauk to pick the rock up and carry it. Pauk tried, but it was so heavy he had to drop it after a couple steps. Finally, one of the servants who had come along to watch helped him carry it, and we all went up to the very top. There was a sort of stone terrace there, shaped like a fingernail cutting, that the Austerlings had built. When you stood on the edge, you could look down into the mountain of fire. It was not straight down, but a steep slope with rocks jutting out of it in places. It went down and down. You could see way down deep, because it was lit up by fire at the bottom. The opening up where we were standing was a long bow shot across, or a little more but it got narrower as it went down. Thunrolf made Pauk come over to the edge, and I kept telling myself he was not going to throw him in, because that was what the Austerlings did. I believed it, too. Then the servant who had been helping Carrie let go, and Thunrolf gave Pauk a little push, and he went over the edge. He rolled and banged around down the slope and tried to grab onto things and hold on, but the rock always pulled him loose. That was when I went for Thunrolf. The men-at-arms would have killed me then if he had let them, but he made them stop. I had knocked down one and broken the arm of another, but the other knights were holding on to me so I could not fight, and there were too many men-at-arms between me and him. They had the points of their pikes and halberds up against my face and my chest. The knights were holding me, and all they had to do was shove them in. Thunrolf got the smith to put a jive on my right hand. There was another jive on the other end of the chain, and he held it up and showed it to the knights. Now then, bold Sir Abel, he said, do you still maintain that man is your friend and not your servant? I said, yes, I told you the truth. My lord, Thunrolf sort of smirked when he said that. The knights that had my arms were trying to twist them, but the strength of the sea was building in me like a storm. I could hear the surf and feel the pounding of the waves. I did not want them to find out they could not twist them, not even with three holding each arm, so I said, My lord, very quick. I told you the truth, my lord, he's my friend. That's better. Dunrolf smiled at me. He was still holding up the empty jive, and he was having a good time. If he is really your friend, he has been wrongly accused, accused by his own tongue, but wrongly still. Look down. Can you see him? The knights let go so I could go over to the edge and look. I could not see Pauk at first, but pretty soon I did. 
The rock he was chained to had gotten stuck on an outcrop, and he was trying to get it loose. I yelled to him to stay where he was, that I would climb down and get him out. Dunrolf said, Ah, you could tell he liked that a lot. You will, if I permit it, not otherwise. I was about ready to rush him again, just trying to get a clear shot at him, but I said, Please, my lord, please let me. He hasn't done anything wrong. Let me go down and bring him back up. Dunrolf nodded. I will, Sir Abel, if you mean it. You are willing to risk your life in my mountain of fire to save your friend. I said, I sure am, my lord, and started to climb over the edge. He motioned to the other knights, and they stopped me. I felt like pushing them in, and I could have done it, too. You may go, Thunrolf told me, but not alone. You shall have a companion, another bold knight, to help you with your friend in the stone. Who will volunteer? He held up the jive again. Nobody said a thing. Let me have a volunteer, any knight present, Thunrolf waved the jive. I was like him. I thought that two or three would, and maybe all of them, and he would have to choose. But none of them did, and you could see some of them backing away a little bit. I did not say anything, but I knew Sir Rovd would have volunteered, and I wanted to tell them. Thunrolf got mad then. He called them poltroons and cowards, and I could see they wanted to kill him for it. But even so, there was no one who would let him put the other jive on him. About then I looked down again, and Pauk was gone. I could not see him at all, and I knew he had gotten his rock loose and tried to climb up holding on to it, and had fallen down deeper than ever. I grabbed on to Thunrolf's arm then. I'm going, I told him. You can put the other one on me. No, he said. One of these cravens must go with you. I want to see, and I want them to see who turns back first. They would not even start, and I told him so and climbed over the edge. He still had the other end of my chain, and one of the men-at-arms grabbed it too, and they stopped me. It was going to be a tough climb with two hands, and I knew that if I tried to pull them in, more would grab hold. This is your last chance, Thunrolf told his knights. Your final opportunity. Speak now. I stuck my head up over the edge and yelled, Put it on my other hand, I'll go. I have been awfully surprised here, and more than just once or twice. I know I have said that already, and it is the truth. That was one of them, because Thunrolf put that jive on his own wrist and snapped it shut, gave his knights one last look, and climbed down with me. As we went deeper and deeper, the air got hotter and hotter, and it was harder and harder to breathe. There was smoke in it, and we coughed a lot. I knew there was a good chance we would both die, and I did not want to. This is one of those places where it is hard to tell the truth. It may be the hardest of all. I think it is. I went outside and walked around and looked at the sea and the mountains and the beautiful place where we live. If Desiree or Michael had been there, I would have talked to them about it, but they were not, and I had to decide for myself. I have and this is the truth. If the mountain of fire had been a volcano like we have back home, I would never have done it. I knew it was not, and that was one thing that kept me going. I knew that there was another world under Aelfris, and that it was the sixth world, and was called Muspel. I knew that the hole in the middle of the mountain of fire went there. And that was where the fire we saw was, and where the smoke was coming from. So that was one thing. The other one was that I did not think we would have to go clear down to Muspel. Pauk had stopped part way the first time, so I thought he had probably stopped part way again, which was wrong. When Thunrolf got to coughing bad and wanted to go back up, I kept hustling him along. I knew he was trying to tell me that he would have me killed and sometimes he was able to get most of it out. But I pretended I could not understand and kept pulling the chain on our wrists and telling him to keep moving. After a while, the hole started opening out again, and we were not climbing down the inside of a mountain anymore. We were climbing down a cliff. Thunrol fell again, 
He had fallen a dozen times, but that was the worst. I caught the chain and he was hanging by it. While I was trying to work him over where he could find a toehold, I saw Pauk far below us, with one of the dragons of Muspel coming for him. I do not believe any two men ever went down a cliff any faster than Thunrolf and I did after that. We got to the bottom, and I yelled to Pauk, and I yelled at the dragon, and that was when Thunrolf drew his sword and tried to kill me. I caught his wrist and bent his arm back, and he dropped the sword. This is hard to put down on paper because it happened so quickly. I could not watch the dragon while I was wrestling Thunrolf, but I knew it was coming for Pauk and coming fast. I wanted that sword. I knew I had been saying I would never use one until I got the one Desiree was going to find for me, but I wanted it anyway. That sword seemed to be our only hope, and if Thunrolf had it instead of me, he was going to kill me with it and not the dragon. He dropped it, as I said, and it fell into a crevice in the rock. There was fire coming out of that crevice, and it had fallen so far in I could not see it. I turned as quickly as I could, and the dragon had Pauk pinned under one of its forefeet. Think of a big snake, a crocodile as big as a boat, and one of those flying dinosaurs. Mix all the worst parts together, and that is the way a dragon looks. It is worse than any of them, and worse than all of them at once. I picked up a stone. It was almost too hot to hold, but I threw it. The dragon hissed like a steam pipe and opened its mouth wide, and Garseg's face was in there instead of a tongue. He said, Sir Abel, why war you against me? It was still his voice, but it sounded like a whole rock band. I explained that Pauk was my friend, and said that if he killed Pauk, he was going to have to kill me too. If I do not, Garseg smiled there in the dragon's mouth. His face was three times the size that it had been. Then I'll be alive to keep my promise. I said I would fight Kulili for you, and I will. At that, he opened his wings. I had thought that he was big before, but with his wings open, he was bigger than any airplane I have ever seen. He took off, and the wind was a hurricane. It blew sand and rocks and fire and us, knocking us down so that we were rolling across level ground as if we were falling down the inside of the mountain of fire. Then he was gone. I looked up, and I could see him high in the sky, and his wings were so big that he looked big even up there. It was a terrible sky, red with dust and lit by the fires below. But up above it, where we see the highest clouds, you could see Alfris, beautiful trees and mountains and snow and flowers, and Kulili, deep in the cool blue sea. I could not break the chain that held Pauk to the rock, but I stood on it with both feet and pulled the staple out. If I had not, I do not think that Thunrolf and I could ever have carried him up the cliff and up the inside of the mountain of fire. We almost failed anyway. Sometimes we stopped to rest a little, coughing and choking. We were both so thirsty that we could hardly talk, but I tried to explain to him that the time we had been in the mountain of fire might seem like just a few days to us, but it was going to be a lot longer when we got out of it. If we get out, Sir Abel, he said, and he picked up Pauk and slung him over his shoulders, the way I had carried him, and started climbing again. Pauk's legs were broken, and sometimes he was conscious and sometimes he was not. Thunrolf could carry him a little, then he would get shaky and I would have to carry him again. But Thunrolf never once asked me to, not once. After a while I noticed that. We climbed and climbed. It seemed something was wrong. We could not have climbed down as far as we had climbed up already, and we were no place near the top. We were no longer in Muspel, but in another world of rock and stone and heat and smoke. One bent around us. I knew that we were going to die and I could drop Pauk, and dying would be faster for him and easier for me. I was too stubborn to do it. That went on so long it seemed like forever. It seemed to me that I had never been anybody's kid brother in America then, that I had never gone looking for a tree, or lived in a hut in the woods with bold Berthold. 
that there had never been anything for me really but climbing and choking and weariness. I felt a cool wind. It smelled wrong, and tasted wrong, but it was cool, and I had burns everywhere, and I had been hot so long I did not notice any more. I looked up, trying to see where it was coming from and how tough the slope was going to be up above, and I saw stars. I will never forget that, and I can shut my eyes right now and see them again. You do not know what stars are, or how beautiful they can be, but I do. Chapter 31 Back to Sea A brighter, nearer star burned some distance below us, a campfire where the lower stair began. We made our way down to it, moving very slowly and snatching mouthfuls of snow, I carrying Pauk and supporting Thunrolf when he needed it. We were not far from the lowest step when Thunrolf said, Oud! The men sitting around the fire sprang up, and Thunrolf stumbled down the last few steps to hug them and cried. I laid Pauk near the fire and cut away his breeches, and was very happy to see the broken bones had not poked through the skin. Bold Berthold had warned me about that when I fell out of a tree, saying that when it happened the person generally died. This is Oud, my steward, Thunrolf told me, and this is Vix, my body servant. Tears were running down his face. I have never been happier to see two rogues in my life. They had wine and water, and we sat with them, drinking it and coaxing Pauk to drink. He was dizzy and sick, and seemed not to know where he was or who we were. It was a year ago this day, your lordship, Oud told Thunrolf, that you went into the mountain of fire. We came tonight to remember. Vic said, We were going back to Seagirt, your lordship, leaving tomorrow. Lord Olaf would give us places, but we didn't want them. So there's a new lord in the round tower, Thunrolf seemed to speak only to himself. I don't care. I don't care at all. I am out. The king sent him, your lordship, Oud said. Then I can go home. We'll go home, he shook himself and drained his cup. I'm so tired. You'll have to help me up. Able to, Sir Abel, help him too. Wilt journey to Seagirt with me, Sir Abel? You shall be my chief knight and my heir. I'll adopt you. I thanked him, but explained that Pauk and I had been on our way to Forseti to take service with Duke Martyr. I'm going to sleep here. Cover us, Vix. With that, Thunrolf lay down and shut his eyes, and Vix covered him with his cloak. They had come on donkeys, and Oud rode to the round tower to fetch a leech. I was asleep myself before he came, and it was one of the few sleeps I had in Mythgarther in which my dreams were not troubled by the people whose lives wove the bowstring park a bit through for me. Nor did Cedar trouble me, though he troubled many dreams of mine afterward. I have never been less willing to wake, or less willing to rise, than I was the next morning. The sun was high when I sat up, for the leech had covered our faces with muslin. Your friend has been carried to the round tower, the leech told me. I've done what I can for him, splinted his legs and his arm, and salved his burns. I've salved yours, too, and of course, Lord Thunrolf's. I had not even known that Pauk's arm was broken. Lord Olaf agrees that you should not be moved until you're ready. Probably our voices awakened Thunrolf. He pulled the muslin off his face and tried to sit up. Vix and Oud ran to help him. I don't know whether I can walk, he told the leech, but if you can get me on a horse I think I might ride. That won't be necessary, your lordship. We have litters for you, and for Sir Abel as well. In which I will not ride, Thunrolf declared. No, not if I must die here. Help me up, Oud. Where's my horse? There was no horse but the leeches. Oud and I helped Thunrolf mount, and I walked next to him holding his stirrup strap. I was afraid he would fall off, 
and I think he was afraid that I would fall down. When we were nearly there, he said softly, A boon, Sir Abel. You owe me none I know. I crave one anyway, and you'll not find me a worthless friend. I explained that I did owe him one. I had borrowed a scepter and lost it, and promised any service I could perform. I'd forgotten that. Very well. I ask that you forgive me. Will you? I looked up at him. Yes, my lord, but that's no boon. I'd done it already. It is the boon you owed. Now, I ask another Sir Abel, may I have it? Sure. Let me speak when we reach the round tower. Agree with what I say, and say nothing that will disgrace me. I was still trying to think of something polite, when half a dozen knights met us. Some were his, and some were Olaf's, but they had all caught on that something was going on and come out to see what it was. Thunrolfs could not believe their eyes. We encountered a dragon, he told them, and I lost my sword. I would like to get that back, but not at the cost of another dragon. Had you seen a dragon before, Sir Abel? I had seen them pictured, but the pictures are nothing. I said, Once before, my lord, but that didn't help. I don't think anybody ever gets used to them. He smiled. It was a twisted smile because of the burns, but a smile just the same. I will not, if I have anything to say about it. Then we got the chain taken off. There was a lot more after that, but I am going to cut it short. He left pretty soon, going down to the port and getting a ship home. Nearly all his men had left already, going overland because of their horses. Pauk and I stayed until Pauk could walk, and Olaf was very nice to us. He had Swordbreaker and my bow and quiver, and gave them back along with a lot of presents. When we left, he loaned us horses, and sent some of his men with us to bring them back. We stayed in an inn for three nights, I think it was, and did not like it much. After that, Pauk found an old man and his wife, who had put us up cheaper than the inn, and better too. The old man had been captain of a ship, but he had to quit when his eyes got bad. He knew a lot of stories, they were all worth listening to, and lots of them were worth remembering. We stayed with those people for over a month. During the day I would practice with my bow, or with Swordbreaker, or I would go to the stable and get a horse. It was all day for a copper bit, or two for a better horse. I would ride around the country and gallop and trot and so forth. I thought I was getting to be a good rider, too, but I was just getting started. Pauk would go down to the docks and watch for a ship for us and talk to the sailors and longshoremen. One day I came back and he was at the house all smiles. He said there was a ship in port that was going to Forseti, and it would take us there. I said, Fine, let's go and see how much they want. You think it's a good one? Aye, sir, that I do, only I already booked, sir, by your leave. A snug cabin, sir, and straight up the coast to Forseti. I wanted to know how much. Thunrolf had given me a lot of money, but I knew there were a lot of things I would have to get in Forseti. A knight's mail is not cheap, and a horse like Blackmane, that was Sir Rovd's, costs the world. You'll like the price, sir, Pauk was grinning like a monkey. You mean you paid it yourself? I was going to pay for us both. He laughed a little. Aye, sir, I did. Then I'll pay you back. Oh, that's all right, sir. I paid with what the dragon give me. I knew perfectly well that Cedar had given him nothing but bruises. It was the western trader, and I know you guessed it a lot quicker than I did. It did not look much better than it had a year ago, but it did not look much worse either, and when we went on board and had a chance to look around, I saw that most of the sails were new. Curl and I hugged, and he told me how he had gone to the round tower looking for Pauk and me. That had been a week after we had gone down inside the mountain of fire, and he had been told we were dead, and Thunrolf was dead, too. So I told him most of what had happened, just saying that Thunrolf had wanted to shame his knights, which was true, and leaving out his trying to kill me when he saw Cedar and I would not run. 
I got the old woman to sew a pennant for me while we were waiting for the western trader to unload and load and get ready for sea again. It was silk and made of scraps left over from when she had made a gown for the daughter of the captain of the port. It was made of green silk, and she cut hearts out of red silk and sewed one on each side. Curl flew it on the foremast for as long as I was on board. Later I put it away and sort of forgot it until I made a lance out of spiny orange. Then I remembered it and got it out and put it on that lance. It was on there when that lance was hewn through. Pauk and I stayed on shore with the old captain and his wife until the ship was ready. First, because we had gotten very comfortable there, and second, because I wanted to let Curl keep his cabin for as long as I could. He was not going to charge me anything and would not hear of our paying, but I had decided that when we got to Forsetti, I would leave behind the Osterling knife Olaf had given me. It had a silver hilt and a silver scabbard, both set with corals, and so it was pretty valuable but it was too close to being a sword for me to like it. I did that, too. It seemed like we were never going to sail. The big spar broke, and Curl had to find a long piece of good wood so the carpenter could make a new one, and he had to make it, and after that they had to load the rest and get everything stowed. Back when I was living with you, I read stories about sailing ships and pirates and fighting Napoleon and all that, but it had never really gotten through to me how slow everything was, how long everything took. There are about a thousand things that have to be ready all at once, and when everything else is set, you load the water, because the water starts going bad the minute it gets in the casks. Small beer is nicer, like Pauk said, because it keeps better, but it costs, and water is free. Pauk and I had small beer in our cabin, wine too. The wine there is not real wine, because they cannot grow grapes. But they make other stuff out of fruits they can grow, the same way we do cider. It had been cheap there in the little port town where the mountain of fire is, and we had gotten used to it. We had ship's bread, too, and cheese and jam, and three different kinds of salt meat, two kinds of smoked fish, and a lot of other stuff. The old woman had fixed a basket for the first day, sandwiches and fruit and all kinds of pickles. There was so much in it, we ate it for the first three days. The old captain gave me his brass marlin spike that he had in the sea bag he carried onto his first ship. He said I ought to learn to splice rope while I had the chance. It was a handy thing to know, and I might need it sometime, so I did. Because we finally did put to sea. When it happened, we had been waiting so long it did not seem possible. Most people here have never been on a ship, and some of them have never seen the sea. Desira had not. People in America are the same way, and it does not bother them. So there are some things I ought to explain, and one is about bread and cooking and so on. There is a stove in the galley, and the cook bakes bread for the crew when he can. But he never lights his stove in bad weather, because some coals could spill out and burn the whole ship. In bad weather, you get ship's bread and cold meat. Everybody does, even the captain. In good weather, the cook boils your meat in seawater to get some salt out. But any cooking he does costs firewood, and there is only so much of that. In cold weather, there is no heat except for the galley stove. None. It got colder and colder as we went north up the coast. Winter was about over, but it was still cold north of Kingsdoom. I had been gone about three years with Garseg and Aelfris, and one year exactly with Thunrolf and Muspel. Time always runs slower in the worlds underneath Mythgarther, but you can never be sure how much. Sometimes it is just a little slower, but sometimes it is a lot. When I think back on those days, all the days and weeks and months after we got out of the Mountain of Fire, there are two things I remember more than any of the rest. One is how bad Pauk looked after we got him out. When he was lying on the rock waiting for the leech, and later in his bed in the round tower, he was not what anyone would call handsome, besides being pretty small. He had a big hook nose and a big lantern jaw. His blind eye looked terrible, and his good eye was little and squinty. But he looked so pitiful when he was hurt so bad, and he was so brave about it. 
when Thunrolf told him he would never do anything like that to him again, he just said, Thank you, sir, thank you, and shut his eyes. I never knew how much I liked him until I saw him suffering like that, hurt so bad and trying to smile. He drank too much sometimes, but I could never get mad about it like I should have. He was with me on and off, until Desiree and I went away. After we had gone, I saw what he had meant about my being his big chance. He was important, and Ulfa was too, just because he had been with me so much. He was Master Pauk then, and worked for the king. The other thing that I will never forget is seeing the Isle of Glass. The sun was almost down, and I was up on the stern castle deck talking to Curl. I thought I saw something and borrowed his big brass telescope. And there it was. The tall, proud trees and the waves lapping a beach of blood-colored sand. I looked and looked, and pretty soon I started to cry. If I could tell you why, I would, but I cannot. Tears ran down my face, and I could not breathe right. I took the telescope down and wiped my eyes and blew my nose. And when I looked again, it was gone. I never saw it again until I went into Theazi's room of lost loves. So those are the things. But I ought to say right here that I did not know Uri and Baki were looking for me. I had no idea, and of course my going to Muspel had made it really hard for them. They had searched the western trader three or four times, and had given up on it a long time before Pauk and I boarded it again. Chapter 32 The Marshal's Tower Keep your hand from your sword the man-at-arms behind me whispered, and none of your cheek. More loudly he said, This here is Abel, Master Augur. I said, Sir Abel, sir. He says he's a knight, Master. He wanted his grace, so I thought I'd better let you see him. That was what I got for not buying a proper warhorse in Forseti. I had planned to get one and Pauk and I had looked at a few that they had for sale. None of them had really suited me, and even though Thunrolf had given me a lot, I could not have bought one of the pretty good ones. The thin man behind the big table nodded and stroked his little mustache. He looked smart. He also looked like he did not like what he was seeing very much, meaning me. It always seemed to me that people ought to see right away that I was not really a man, just a boy that Desiree had made look like one. Only they could not. Pauk had not been able to, and neither had Curl, neither had Thunrolf. Now it seemed to me I had stumbled into somebody that would. I am the Duke's Marshal, he said. He did not give a damn what I thought about him, and the way he talked showed it. He was telling me the facts. I keep order among his horses, among his knights, among his servants, and among any others who happen to be here in Shearwall. It did not seem like a good time to talk, so I just nodded. If it is needful that you speak to the Duke, I will see that you gain audience. If it is not, you may speak with me, or I will direct you to the correct person. Have you a wrong to lay before the Duke's court? I said, I seek service with Duke Martyr. As a knight. Yes, that's what I am. Really? He smiled, and it was not a very nice smile. From whom did you receive the accolade? From the Queen of the Moss Elf, from Queen Desiree. Make your japes over wine, Abel. Sir Abel, sir, and I'm not joking. You're a knight. We can leave the Elf Queen out of it for the time being. That's right. You have the build for it, at least. As a knight, you are an expert rider. It's the management of the charger that distinguishes a knight from other men. I'm sure you know that. It's his honor that distinguishes a knight, I said. Augur sighed. But the management of the charger is the fundamental skill of knighthood. Have you a charger? I started to explain, but he cut me off. Have you funds to buy one? Not enough for one I'd want. I see. He smoothed his mustache again. He probably did not know he was doing it. Have you a manner from which you draw support? 
Where is it? I said I did not have one. I thought not. Augur stood up and went over to his window to look out. His grace has need of fighting men, Sir Abel. On what terms would you serve him? I had not even thought about that, or how to explain how I felt about it. After about a minute, I said, I want to be his knight, or one of them anyway. I didn't come to ask him for money. I could hear steel hitting steel outside, and Augur leaned out his window so he could see what was happening. When he turned around again, he said, No monthly stipend? Merely to cover your expenses? I shook my head. I've got a servant, Master Augur. Pauk is his name. When I had told Thunrolf about Pauk, I called him my friend and got us in trouble. I was not going to do that again. I don't pay Pauk, and sometimes I can't even feed him or get him a place to sleep. He looks out for himself, then. I thought about when I had been hurt so bad and lying in the cable locker, how little bits of light came in through cracks, and how the rats came smelling my blood. Sometimes Pauk looks out for me, too, when I can't look out for myself, I said. If I were one of Duke Martyr's knights, I would be ashamed to treat him worse than Pauk treats me. If he wanted to give me something, I'd take it and say thank you. If he didn't, I'd try to serve him better. That was the first time Augur looked at me like I was a real human being. He said, That was well spoken, Sir Abel. There's a baron with the king who prattles of the elf in his cups. I think he's as mad as a hare in spring, and I think you are too, but I cannot help wishing you were sane. With a little training you might make a first-rate man-at-arms. Can you use that bow? I said, Yes, sir, I can. There's another master out there in the practice yard. His name is Master Thopi. He's master of arms, and if you address him as sir, as you have been addressing me, he'll break yours. Do you know what a master of arms is? I said, No, sir, I don't. He trains our squires and men-at-arms in the use of weapons and the management of horses. I provide him with horses for that purpose. They are not good enough for a knight to ride in war, you understand, but an inferior horse can actually be better training for a rider than a good one, as well as making a young man appreciate a good one more. I want you to joust with Master Thopi. He saw that I did not understand, because he added, To ride against him with a practice lance. I'll lend you a horse, a shield, and so forth. If you do well, we'll see how well you can shoot that bow, and what you know of swordcraft. After that, the man-at-arms, who had brought me to Master Augur, took me down to Master Thopi. He was as big as I am, but going gray. I told him who I was and why I was there, and explained that I was supposed to joust with him. He squeezed my arms. He had pretty big hands, and they were strong. That's muscle, he muttered, not fat. Can you use a lance, young'un? I can try, I said. All anybody can do. He got me a practice shield. They are a lot heavier than the real ones, because they are a lot stronger, too. I'll aim for that, he told me while I was adjusting the strap. And you aim for mine, nothing tricky. I said, okay. My horse was a fat chestnut gelding that was sweating already. It knew all about jousting, and it did not want to do that any more. I did not have any spurs, and I had the shield on one arm and my practice lance in my other hand, so it was not very easy to get into position. That would not have been so bad, but one of the other knights that were watching called, Prick him with your lance! And I looked at the end of it before I remembered it was not sharp. They thought that was really funny, and I started getting mad. The place where you joust is called the lists. It is not really a list of anything. Those are thin wooden things that make the fence for it. Each jouster rides with those lists to his left side, so that the two will meet shield to shield. It is like football. You are not supposed to want to hurt anybody. Jousting is about as dangerous as tackle, and the person you are jousting with will be on your side in a real battle. Like I said, I had quite a bit of trouble with my horse, and once I got him into position, he knew exactly what was up. He was scared and trying to be brave, just like me. I tried to say something that would make him feel better, 
none of it was his fault, but he was the one who had to run and carry me in the big jousting saddle, and he knew he could get hurt. I was not feeling any too sure myself, and while I was talking to him I said, I wish you'd paw the ground a little like black mane. Talking to a horse like that, a horse that did not understand me or care what I said, made me think of Gilf and how much I missed him. He had never come back to the western trader, and nobody seemed to know where he was. I would have liked to go back to Aelfris to look for him and Desiree, but I did not know how to get there. There was a boy with a trumpet pretty close to the place where we would hit. He blew on it, my horse trotted for a minute, then cantered, and Master Thopey's lance hit my shield hard and drove it back into me. I remember turning over in the air and hitting the ground really hard. I also remember lying there hurting and all the other knights yelling, Try again! So I jumped up, even though I did not feel like jumping, and I found my lance and picked it up, and caught my horse and got back in the saddle. That was when Master Augur came to talk to me. Up until then I had not known that he had come down to watch. Quiet, so the others would not hear, he said, You don't have to go again. You're no knight. I had been spitting blood because I had hurt my lip, but I grinned at him anyway. I am still proud of it. I said, I am a knight, just one who's not real good with a lance. I want to. Master Thopey did not have on a helm or helmet any more than I did, but he must have heard us. He made a motion like pushing up a visor and sort of smiled. We did it again, and it went exactly like the first one. I had thought that I would at least hit his shield with my lance, but I did not. That really bothered me, and when I got up I was yelling at myself inside, only I tried not to let it show, and thanked Master Augur for helping me up. I would do the same for anyone. He had one of those hard, cold faces, and it did not look any different when he said, It's good training, I know, but I'm sorry I got you into this. I said, Well, I've got to learn. That was when one of the other knights called, You're no knight, boy. I looked at him for a minute, then I said, I am a knight, but you aren't. It sort of shut him up. I had been watching Master Thopey when he rode at me. So that third time I bent down in the saddle the way he did, and I concentrated on hitting his shield with my lance. Before I had been worrying about his lance hitting me. Now I put that clear out of my mind. I had to hit that shield. It was the only thing that counted. I did, too. I hit it, and my lance broke. And his lance hit my shield the way it had before and knocked me right out of the saddle like I was a doll or something. And down I went. Hard. Only this time it was one of the knights who had been laughing that helped me up, and when I was on my feet again, he hit me in the mouth. Up until then, I had not been able to feel the sea in me. It rose all at once, as fast as the fastest storm, breaking bones like spars and tossing men around like the timbers from wrecks. That first one I hit may have been the one whose jaw I broke. I do not know. I think I hit him more on the side of the neck. But wherever it was, it knocked him kicking, and the whole bunch jumped on me. Fights usually do not take as long as it takes to tell about them, but it seemed like they always had four or five new men. Chapter 33 Drink! Drink! I thought I was in the cable locker. Not that I had been put back in there, really, but that I had never left it. It was dark, and I hurt bad and I was not really thinking at all. After a while, it got through to me that I was in a bed instead of lying on rope, but for a while I thought the bed was in a hospital. The moonlight came through the window, and I saw it was a window shaped like the point of a sword, and it seemed like I was not in the cable locker or the hospital at all, but I did not know where I was or care. A long time after that I tried to get out of bed, I was going to look out and see whatever there was to see, I think. But I fell down. Then I was back in the bed, and it seemed like the room was full of sunshine. It was really a pretty dark room, like all of them were. But the sun was coming in right through the window, and it seemed bright to me. There was a little table next to the bed and a goblet on it, and I remembered the one I found on the Isle of Glass. 
that had been poisoned once, and I was afraid to drink out of this one. After a while I could smell the ale, but it was a long time yet before I sat up and drank it. It was not cold or even cool, but I liked it, and there was a trencher there, too. It means a wooden plate, with bread and meat and cheese. I could not even think about eating, but I drank the rest of the ale and lay back down and went to sleep. When I woke up I felt like I had been sleeping a long time, but I did not know how long. It was pretty dark again. By and by a woman in an apron came in and talked. I could not understand her or even pay attention. She got to taking bandages off me and putting new ones on, and she said, I've got food for you too, sir, if you want it. Think you might eat a little now? I said there was some there already. Really, I whispered it. I had not meant to whisper, but I did. That? Oh, that's all dried up now, sir. I'll give it to the dogs. I brought you some fresh, some nice hot broth. She wanted to sit me up, but I would not let her. I got myself up instead, and it hurt. I took the spoon away from her, too, but I let her hold the bowl while I ate. Well, you're doing wonderful, sir. Poor Sir Hermod's like to die, they say, with every rib broke. And Sir Lud's puking blood, she tittered. He'll die, too, some says. They're taking wagers in the kitchen, sir. Sir Abel's my name. If you really care about me, call me Sir Abel. She stood up fast and bent her knee the way women do here. Yes, Sir Abel, I didn't mean no harm, Sir Abel. Just hearing the words made me feel better. I said, Of course you didn't. Sit down again. What's your name? I'm Modguda, Sir Abel. Am I still in Duke Martyr's castle, Modguda? Yes, sir, in Shearwall, Sir Abel. Except you're in Master Augur's tower of it. Master Augur's the only one has a whole tower of it, except her grace. She's got one, too. The Duchess's tower is what we call it, Sir Abel. Except that's not where you are. You can't even see it from your window. This is the Marshal's tower we're in, because Master Augur had his men take you, "'cause they'd beat you with the lance you broke, is how I heard it. "'So this is where you are.' "'I nodded and found out that my head did not want me to do that. "'If we're in Master Augur's tower, he must be your boss.' "'She did not understand, and I had to explain. "'Then she said, "'That's right, Sir Abel, sir.' "'I smiled, and that did not hurt at all. "'Hey, out with it. What are you scared to say?' Well, you're a knight, sir. Right, I told her. And you knights don't much care for my master, sir, cause you've to do what he says, except he's not one of you like, or not a baron or something neither, sir Abel, except the duke, he's behind him. He's the duke's man, sir. So you knights got to? You're dead wrong about that, I told her. I'm not down on Master Augur, not a bit. Well, anyhow, that's what I was getting myself set to say, sir. You shouldn't be, cause they had knocked you flat and their swords was out ready to kill you, except Sir Waddit didn't want to, sir. And Squire Yond, he's Sir Waddit Squire, sir. Squire Yond, he throwed himself right down over you, sir, and that's when my master's guards come, that he'd called when him and Master Thopey couldn't stop the fight, and they stabbed Master Thopey, sir. That's when his guards come, and then— Wait a minute. Did you say Master Thopey got stabbed? By Master Augur's guards? Oh, no, Sir Abel. She looked shocked. Master Augur wouldn't never tell them to do that, sir. It was one of the knights, maybe, or one of those squires. Then some varlets come to fight, too. So it could have been one of them. Anyway, Master Augur and Master Thopey were trying to get between you and the knights, sort of like what Squire Yond did. That's when Master Thopey got stabbed, Sir Abel, trying to help you like Master Augur. The guards finally got you out, sir. My head was whirling. Is Master Thopey dead? No, sir. Only he's hurt bad, Sir Abel. That's what they say. I ought to go see him, Modguda, since he got hurt trying to help me. Yes, sir, only you're not going to do much walking for a while, Sir Abel. She got up and bent her knee as before. He'll be pleasured to see your face, sir, I'm sure. 
And I'll show you where when you're ready, sir. I was thinking, and one thing I was thinking about was what she had said, that it might be a while before I was up and around. Can you take a message into town? I'll try, sir, or send a boy. Good. I've got a servant named Pauk. We were staying at an inn in Forsetti. It had a bottle and seashell on the sign. Do you know where that is? Yes, sir, Sir Abel. That's the dollop and scallop, sir. Thanks. Tell Pauk I've been hurt, please, and where I am. Yes, sir. Is that all, Sir Abel? They'll be wondering where I've got to. I waved my hand, and she hurried out. After that I ate some bread and a bite of cheese, not sure whether eating was a big mistake or not. I drank all the ale and lay down to sleep again, pretty dizzy. In my dream, Garseg and I were in the throne room in the Tower of Glass. There was a big blue dragon on the throne, and it hissed at us and opened its mouth just like Cedar had down in Muspel, and Garseg's face was in the dragon's mouth. So I looked over at Garseg to see if he had seen it too, and it was not Garseg at all. It was Bold Berthold. I woke up feeling cold, and this time I was able to get to the window. There was no way to close it. It was just a hole in the wall, really. Bats were flying around outside, bigger ones than we have at home. They were after bugs, the way bats do, diving and zooming and all that, and yelling and yelping so high you could only just hear it. Way up toward the moon I thought I saw chimeras, just for a minute. On the other side of my bed was a little fireplace, only there was no wood, and I did not have any way to start a fire anyhow. I decided I would have to ask Maud Gouda about that, or get Pauk to get me something when he came. After that I got back into bed and hunkered down under the blankets, hoping I would not have any more dreams like that last one. Lord? Lord? This time I was back on the aisle. I looked around and saw a lot of trees and flowers and birds. Lord? There were no spiny oranges, though. I wanted to find one and let it thank me for planting it, but I knew it could not hear me, and there were not anyway. What there was was big red snakes. They were wrapping themselves around my legs, but that was good because my legs were cold and they felt hot. Bite me, Lord. Bite me and kiss the bite, and your kiss will make you strong again. That woke me up fast. The room was as dark as it could be. There was a really skinny woman in bed with me, sort of tangled up with me and holding on to a part of me that other people were not even supposed to see. Her hands were holding my head, too, and pushing my mouth against her neck. Drink! 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 The other hand sort of squeezed and slid around. That was when I caught on that there were two of them. I really did not mean to bite her. That is the truth, and I will swear to it any time, only something way down deep inside me took over, and I did. It was like I was starving hungry, and here was a roast about one minute out of the oven. What I got in my mouth was steaming hot and sizzling, greasy and dirty and hot as hell. It tasted wonderful. Enough? One was pulling and one pushing to get my mouth away. Pretty soon they did it, and I just lay there panting and thinking how good it had tasted. When I got my breath, I hit the blankets with my hand and said, Stop that, you! What she had been doing felt wonderful, but it felt too wonderful, if you know what I mean. Under my blankets, where I had hit her, there was somebody a lot warmer than I was. She said, I am Uri, Lord. I meant no harm. It was dark in there, like I said, so that when the other one stuck her head up beside mine and kissed my cheek, I could not even see her face. She said, You have drunk of Baki, Lord. And like she had just won the game, who can take you from me now? Drink of me, too? Uri came up then, squirming in between us. I have found you at last. I said, Ash, elf in the dark. Bold Berthold talked about this sometimes. Fire elf, one laughed. 
Did he tell you how lovely we are? Or how lovely you are? Your skin has taken on all sorts of beautiful colors. Those are bruises, I said. If there's some way you can see them down there in the dark, isn't there some way I can see you? They glowed then. It was like they were copper, or maybe brass, with a fire inside. They were not hot enough to burn me, but they were plenty hot. Uri jumped out of bed and sort of posed. Look at me! Am I not beautiful? He prefers me, Bucky told her. Bucky still had me wrapped up. I guess I did, because I went to touch her face, and she licked the tips of my fingers. I have sacrificed myself to you, she explained when she was through licking, to make you stronger and my lord forever. Sit up and you'll see. I will too, Uri told me. Bite me, anywhere. I sat up and found out Baki was right. I also found out I was sweating and the room was freezing or anyway it felt like it was freezing. It was still spring, and pretty early spring too, and the nights were cold. So I asked them to bring some firewood and tinder, and when they said they would, I said to bring my clothes, and swordbreaker, and my bow and quiver too. After I told them what swordbreaker was, they promised to look. For just a minute it seemed like the room was full of bats. Then the door opened. I saw a little red light out there, and the door closed again pretty hard, and I got up out of bed and wrapped a blanket around me. I did not feel good, but I did not feel that bad either, except that I sort of felt like I had gone crazy. I opened the door, and the red light that I had seen had come from what they call a cresset. I did not know the word then, but it means an iron basket you can burn whatever you have in for light. There was one next to my door, and I found out later that they were all over the castle. I was glad to see it, because it meant I could light my wood there if I got any. So I went looking and found a room that had a wood box next to the fireplace. I picked up the whole thing and carried it back to my room, and by the time Uri and Baki got back I had a nice fire going. Chapter 34 Being a Knight When I woke up next morning, Uri and Baki had gone. That was generally the way it was any time that they were with me, so I might as well explain it now, and later I will not say much about it. They did not like our sun. Sunlight hurt them, and if they stood in it you could hardly see them. So they went back to Elfris mostly when it got light, unless it was a dark day with lots of clouds. If they had to stay, they stood in the shadows, or tried to. I did not understand that then, and thought I might have dreamed them. I was going to get out of bed to see if Swordbreaker and my bow were really under it, when there was a knock at the door. I said, come in. He was bigger than I am, really huge and blonde, with a thick mustache that was not a lot darker than his hair. I liked him right away because I could see he wanted to be friends, but he was not too sure how to go about it. I am like that pretty often myself. He said, I didn't wake you, I hope. I was not sure whether he had or not because he might have knocked before, but I said no. Looking at how bright my room was and sort of smelling the air, I decided it was the middle of the morning. I'm Sir Waddit of East Hall. He held out his hand. I sat up and took it. Sir Abel. I'm not supposed to be here. He looked around and found a little stool. All right if I sit? I said sure. No visitors by order of his hungry hunks, but that's because he's afraid somebody will kill you. Waddit shoved out his lower lip and pulled his mustache, something I saw a lot of afterward. Someone might, too. Not me. Someone else. About then I woke up enough to remember what Maud Gouda had said. You saved me. I, I tried to. So did some others. Your squire threw himself on top of me so they wouldn't hit me. That's what somebody said. I don't remember it. You were down by that time. Waddit pulled at his mustache some more. That's the trouble with a fight like that. No gentle right. Not that they'd have accorded it to you, I'm afraid. I did not know what he was talking about, but I said, I guess not. I was fighting you too. You got me right here, he pointed. Knocked the wind out. By the time I could stand straight again, they were going for you with swords. I shouted stop, 
and that's when Yond threw himself on you. I said, I owe you. I owe my life. No, you don't. He shook his head. He was really big, and all that tau-colored hair made his head look about a size eleven. Master Thopi and Master Augur were trying to protect you, too. Some wretch put his blade into Thopi's back for striving to preserve the honor of his grace's household. Yeah, I heard about that. I'm going to pay him a visit today. Waddit looked surprised. Glad to hear you're up to it. I never wanted to kill you, just thrash you, and I tried. You are a man of your hands, Sir Abel. Only not of the lance, Waddit grinned. No. Not yet, but I will be. Why do you want to thrash me? He looked at me, trying to size me up. Are you of gentle blood? Is that like noble? No. He shook his head. Noble blood means an inherited title and lands. Knighthood's not inheritable. Gentle blood simply means your ancestors were never in trade or worked with their hands. I explained that our grandparents had been farmers, and our dad had run a store. I'd really like to tell you I'm some king's lost kid, I said, but there wouldn't be a word of truth in it. He had trouble looking at me. Well, you see, Abel, when someone is of gentle blood... Sir Abel, I told him. All right. But when someone is of gentle blood, as I am and the others, and someone else who isn't claims it, or claims to be a knight when he is not, for instance... For instance what? Well, we're supposed to beat him. Not kill him. Thrash him. Or if he says someone who is of gentle blood hasn't got it, that's the same thing. Okay. There was somebody there that said I wasn't a real knight, and I said I was, but he wasn't. What it nodded. We couldn't be certain you weren't a knight yourself, though none of us believed you. But when you said Sir Hermod wasn't, that loosed the string. I see. I really am a knight. If you don't believe me, we'll fight. Waddit smiled. With lances? Here, right now, you've got a sword. Are you too scared to use it? Not I. He drew his sword faster than he stood up, and he stood up fast. It was just a blur of steel, and the point was pricking my throat. He said, You declare yourself a knight, however. I can't kill an unarmed knight. Gentle right. I told you about my folks. I haven't got gentle blood. But I do. Wadit sheathed his sword almost as quickly as he had gotten it out. He was trying not to grin. I'll have to ask his grace's herald. I said I would rather we were friends. I've given you my hand, he shrugged. Still, I wish you had ancestors, Sir Abel. It would make everything much easier for both of us. I'm an ancestor, I told him. I went to see Master Thopi after that, like I had said I would. I was nearly back to my room when I ran into Master Augur and a tall man with a white beard and a red velvet cloak. Master Augur was surprised to see me up and around and said, Here he is, Your Grace. I knew then that the other man was martyr, so I bowed. I would probably have guessed it from his clothes anyway. I had learned enough about clothes by then to know that they had cost a lot of money. Martyr smiled at me. I'd heard you were bedridden, young man. I said, I was, Your Grace. I'm better today. Much better. Yes, Your Grace. Augur said, We came looking for you and found an empty bed. I was afraid someone had killed you and made off with the body. Where have you been? I explained that I had gone to thank Master Thopi. I wanted to thank you too, Master Augur, only your man said you were with his grace. I... You did me a big favor. Any time you want one from me, a boon or anything, just let me know. I'll probably never be able to pay you back, but I'll try. Martyr cleared his throat. You know who I am, young man. I know only what Master Augur has told me concerning you, and I'd like to hear what you say about yourself. Who are you? I'm Sir Abel of the High Heart, Your Grace, a knight who will serve you gladly and loyally. Moneyless, too, Augur added under his breath. Not exactly, but I haven't got a whole lot. Martyr nodded. He looked serious. You have no land and very little money. What have you got? These clothes and some others, if my servant hasn't run off with them. 
some presents Lord Olaf and Lord Thunrolf gave me. As soon as I said that about Pauk, my conscience started hurting me, so I said, I'm wronging my servant, Your Grace. He wouldn't do that, and I ought to learn to keep my mouth shut. Nothing else. A shirt of rings, only it's torn, Your Grace. We left it at a place in Forsetti to be fixed. A steel cap, sword breaker, my bow and some arrows. I have his weapons locked away, Augur told Martyr. Return them to him whenever he asks, Master Augur. I shall, Your Grace. Martyr had been studying me. Should I accept you, you will have no easy time of it, Sir Abel. I didn't come here looking for a bed, Your Grace. You will be sent against my foes. When you return, you will be sent against others. Do you understand me? I nodded. I know what you mean, Your Grace. I was a friend of Sir Roth's. I saw Martyr's eyes open just a little bit wider. Were you with him at the end? No, Your Grace. I was just a boy then, but I would have fought for him. I guess I would have died with him, too. Martyr started to say something else, then bit it back, and I noticed Augur was looking pretty uncomfortable. I said, He died fighting for you, Your Grace. Augur cleared his throat. Martyr said, It has been four years, a long time I realize for a man your age. Yesterday you were struck down with the butt of a lance, so I hear. I got knocked in the head, Your Grace, that's all I know. Sir Ravd was my most trustworthy knight, Sir Abel. I thought of him as a son. I said that was no surprise to me. His squire reported that he himself had his head broken on the field. When he came to himself, he said wolves were tearing the corpses. Now you say you were a friend of Sir Ravd's. Yes, I was, Your Grace. I was Sir Ravd's guide in the forest. When I had said that... I thought that there probably were other forests, so I added, Northeast of Uring's mouth. You were not with him when he died? No, Your Grace. I was doing something else. In that case, you must have spoken with someone who informed you of his death. Who was that? No one. All of a sudden, I felt like something had me by the neck. I found his sword, Your Grace. That's all. It was broken. We killed some bandits, Your Grace. My dog and I did, and a man named Taug. The broken sword was in with their loot. I saw it and picked it up. I understand. There were only two of you. You and the man-at-arms that you mentioned. Taug isn't a man-at-arms, Your Grace, just a peasant. How many outlaws did you say there were? I had not said, and when he asked, I was not sure I could remember. I told him that, and I said, Ulfa counted them, Your Grace, counted their bodies. She's Taug's daughter. I think she said twenty-three. Augur snapped. You expect his grace to credit that? I'm a knight, I said. I wouldn't lie, not to him. Ha! Huh. Martyr motioned for him to shut up. I hoped you might be able to tell me something about Sir Rod's death. I've told you everything I know, your grace. About his squire's account, too, Martyr said. He is of an age to be knighted. I said... I think he's probably telling the truth, Your Grace, but I don't know. He is Sir Hermod's squire now. Sir Hermod, I believe, is disabled. When he said that, Martyr looked over at Augur. Augur nodded, looking pretty gloomy. Well then, he can see to his master for a time. It will give him occupation. Since you guided Sir Ravd in the forests of the north, Sir Abel, you must have guided Squire Svon likewise. I said I had. You have no more than that to tell me. You can guess what I was tempted to tell, then. Only I did not. Nothing I haven't said already, Your Grace. You yourself were stunned in the lists. No one told me about the incident. Marty gave Augur a quick hard glance. Until I noticed blackened eyes and missing teeth. Not to mention Sir Vidare's broken nose. I made inquiries. Nothing I could think of seemed safe to say. You wish to serve me, Sir Abel? Yes, Your Grace. That one was easy. Without payment, though you have scarcely a seal. I've got some, Your Grace. It isn't like I don't have anything. You mentioned a manservant. How will you recompense him? Yes, Your Grace, I did. His name is Pauk. He serves me without payment, Your Grace. I see. Though he may not. 
Is he blind, crippled, lame, a skin disorder, perhaps? Blind in one eye, your grace, Augur muttered, and cannot see with the other, I'll wager. No, sir, Pauk has sharp eyes, a sharp eye, I mean. You and his grace want to know why he serves me when I can't pay him, and I'd tell you if I knew, but I don't. In that case, there can be small profit in discussing it. Has Master Augur explained my policy to you, my policy regarding taking knights into my service? No, your grace. If the knight is of high repute, I admit him to my service at once. He must swear fealty to me. There is a ceremony. I'll gladly take that oath, your grace. No doubt. When a knight of less reputation offers his fealty, I either reject him outright or accept him informally and provisionally, until he has had a chance to prove himself. I will accept you now on those terms if you wish it. I said, I do, your grace. Thank you very much. Kneel, Augur whispered. One knee. I dropped to one knee and bowed my head. It was sort of like being knighted. You accept me just to try out your grace, but I accept you as my lord. My lord? What threw me off was either Uri or Baki. One of the two was watching us and laughing. Martyr and Augur could not hear her, but I could. My lord and master even unto death. That was how I finished it, but it was pretty weak. That is well. You have small equipage, Sir Abel. I got up. I'm afraid that's the truth, Your Grace. I intend to send you against my foes, so that you may prove yourself, as I feel sure you will. But for my own honor, I cannot and will not send you unarmed. I have heard, Your Grace, that it used to be customary for knights to wait at a bridge and challenge any knight who wanted to get across. If I could do that, I could get armor, a lance, and a good horse. All I need. Augur snorted. Without horse, lance, or shield, you'd be killed. I raised my shoulders and let them drop. Just the same, I'd like to try it. Martyr said slowly, I tried it in my youth, Sir Abel. I suppose I was about your age. It is no tournament with blunted weapons. I could show you the scars. Well, I haven't, Your Grace, but I've got a scar to show anyway, and a bunch of bruises. I had them, too, in my time. I said, I'm sure you did, Your Grace. That was your time, like you just said. Now it's my turn, and I'd like to try it. For a second, Martyr frowned at me. The frown faded, and he roared with laughter. From a raw stripling with a broken head, he nudged Augur. Want to send those shoulders against the Angerborn? He'd go, I swear. Augur nodded gloomily. He would, Your Grace, if you'd give him a horse. I said, On foot, Your Grace, if you will not. Now hear my judgment. Martyr had stopped laughing. This was dead serious. For a fortnight you are to remain here at Shearwall to mend. When that time is done, Master Augur will furnish you with whatever you may require. Go to some remote bridge, ford, or mountain pass, as you have suggested, and take your stand. Remain at your post until winter, until there is ice in the harbor. When winter has set in, return to tell us how you fared. Augur said, Suppose that he loses his first combat, Your Grace. Everything I give him will be lost as well. Look at his smile, Augur. Augur did although he did not like it much. He will be risking his life. We can risk a few horses, some lances, and a hauberk. Pauk came that afternoon, finding me in the practice yard watching mock fights with quarterstaffs. He had brought clean clothes. Tried to fetch along everything, sir. Only landlord won't let me till he's paid. Couple of nights and tuck. We'll see about that this afternoon, I told him. It's just out the gate and down the hill. Bit farther nor that, sir. Not much. Before we go, though, I want to get in a bit of jousting practice. Watch, and tell me if it seems to you that I'm doing anything wrong. He did, and that afternoon, as we were riding back to Forsetti on borrowed horses, he said, That's what knights do, ain't it? The way you and Sir What's-His-Name was riding at each other. Sir Want it, I nodded. Yes, it is. Well, it looks grand, sir, but I don't see the sense of any of it. I started to explain, but he interrupted at once. Say I was on foot. When I seen you coming with your long spear? It's a lance, I told him. 
and your big horse? I'd jump out of the way, wouldn't I? I don't like horses no how. He looked down at his own with marked disfavor. And if I was on a good one myself, I'd ride around behind. I'm not yet skilled with the lance, I told him, but a knight who is will put the point through a swinging ring no bigger than the palm of your hand while riding at full gallop. So if you jump, you'd better jump far. Pauk looked dubious. As for circling around behind, a well-mounted knight would catch you in the side ten times out of ten. You'd have no chance to defend yourself before you were spitted on his lance, that is, if you and he were alone. I suppose. In battle, there would be a long line of knights riding at you with another line in back of theirs, if it were King Arnthor's army. Light horse made up of squires and men-at-arms would guard their flanks, and there would be footmen and archers to guard the wagon fort. I know all this, you see, because I asked Master Thopi the same questions. Knights can be beaten, of course, particularly in the mountains where the enemy can get above them to throw spears and roll down logs. But it's never easy. Pauk nodded slowly. Aye, sir, I hope you never are, sir. So do I. But I know that there are no safe battles. I hope for honor from Duke Martyr Pauk. Honor and good horses and much more. A manner of my own. Although I can never come to Queen Desiree as an equal, I'd like to narrow the distance between us. Lord Olaf told me that queens have wed knights more than once. It's not unheard of. Pauk shook his head. I hope you don't get yourself killed, sir, that's all. Thank you, I said, and for a while we rode through the hot spring sunshine in silence. My conscience was bothering me, however, and eventually it made me speak. Remember what I said about the footmen back at the wagon fort, Pauk? If you stay with me, you'll be one of them. You'll have an axe, a coat of boiled leather, and a steel cap, I hope. More if I can afford it. No worse than fighting them Austerlands at sea, sir. We were topping a rise just then. Shading my eyes with my hand, I saw a farmhouse in the valley below, a prosperous-looking place I remembered passing on my way to Shearwall. I said, There's a farm with a good well down there, Pauk. We can water the horses and get a drink ourselves. 